introduction of the science history of the universe volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by larry wilson the science history of the universe volume one edited by francis rolt wheeler astronomy introduction in the present volume there have been covered in a comprehensive and popular manner the various departments of astronomy owing to its treatment in a definitely historical and descriptive manner however it may be possible to supplement the general review by a few brief statements of some of the results and problems that confront us in the actual work of the observational astronomy of today there is frequently brought before the astronomer the fact that certain subjects that were apparently exhausted have proved through the more advanced methods of today or perhaps by chance to be veritable mines of discovery richer by far than had been anticipated in all the previous investigations a remarkable illustration of this fact is the splendid work of professor hale at the solar observatory of the carnegie institution at mount wilson california the sun had almost been relegated to that limbo from which nothing new can ever come with the exception of hale's development of the spectral heliograph which made possible the continuous photographic study of the surface of the sun and of the solar prominences but little advance had been made in solar research for a very long period of time even with a new instrument the work seemed to be confined to the photography of the prominences and a few other features of the sun that were already observable visually with the spectroscope before this the sun was somewhat of a curiosity and but little new information was had concerning it it only became really interesting when a total eclipse was imminent at which time the corona could be seen and studied the spectral heliograph was the first great step in the study of the sun even though this made possible a continuous photographic record of the prominences and kindred features it could not record the more attenuated and delicate corona indeed we seem today as far as ever from any sight of this mysterious object without the aid of the friendly moon which for a few minutes at long intervals hides the sun and gives us our only view of the corona but the great work done by professor hale and his associates at mount wilson which was foreshadowed by his work at yerkes observatory in the discovery of the solar vortices and magnetic fields of sunspots has revolutionized the study of that body and opened up new fields of investigation in this direction that are almost unlimited mr abbott of the smithsonian institution has also established a permanent station at mount wilson for the investigation of the solar constant and a general study of the heat of the sun the solar investigations therefore that are going on at mount wilson are among the most important that have ever been undertaken they are not only of the highest interest but may ultimately lead to important results bearing upon the commercial life of the world by revealing to us some possible means of forecasting conditions upon the earth any vagaries in the sun must have more or less direct influence on the conditions of the earth which owes its very throb of life to the mighty influence of the sun much of the ordinary spectroscopic work may be said to be in its infancy because of the vast fields of research that are open to it it is already laying the foundation for a very accurate determination of the distance of the visible binary stars where both stars can be observed with the spectroscope an accuracy that can never be obtained by the ordinary methods of parallax work already this has given results of precision in the case of alpha centauri whose distance has been determined by professor wright of the lick observatory from spectroscopic observations combined with the known orbit of the star time however is an element in this work and after a sufficiently long interval a valuable harvest of knowledge of star distances will result the spectroscopic material for such investigations 
is being specially obtained by Professor Frost and his associates at the Yerkes Observatory, as well as by others elsewhere, where spectrograms of the various visual binaries that are bright enough to give a measurable spectrum are being carefully and accurately accumulated. A possible improvement of the spectroscope, whereby a larger percentage of the light can be utilized, will make possible the extension of this class of work, for at least 90% of the available light cannot at present be utilized. If this can be done, the efficiency of the spectroscope will be vastly increased, and a great number of objects at present beyond the reach of accurate spectroscopic study will be investigated and their nature and physical conditions become known. A step in this direction is the intended erection on Mount Wilson of a reflecting telescope 100 inches in diameter. The great light-grasping power of this instrument will enable much fainter objects to be studied than can be observed with the present means. Only a few years ago our knowledge of comets seemed to be satisfactory. What we could see with the naked eye or with the telescope apparently readily agreed with certain theories that were formulated to explain them. The tails of various comets were sorted out and assigned to different classes. This one was a hydrocarbon tail, and that a hydrogen tail, etc. The spectroscope had shown that comets in general consisted of some form of hydrocarbon gas, such as cyanogen. Such gas or gases are evidently mixed up with the minutely divided matter which is disrupted and expelled from the comet's head and thrown out backward from the comet away from the sun. This was shown later by the experiments of Lebedeau, Nichols, and Hull to be due to the pressure of the sun's light upon the smaller particles of the comet, which drove them away into space with increasing velocity to form the tail. The simple phenomena thus seen by the eye were rather easy of explanation. Photography, however, has revealed such a mass of strange phenomena in these bodies that the theories which seemed so satisfactory before are now seriously questioned, and some of them appear to be entirely inadequate to explain some of the phenomena shown by the photographic plates. But little indication of many of the most extraordinary changes and peculiarities of comets' tails is seen by the eye. In part, this is due to the fact that much of the light of a comet is of a nature that has but little effect on the human eye, though it is peculiarly strong in its action on the photographic plate. The first of these bodies to exhibit these peculiarities was Comet 4, 1893, Brooks. Some of the phenomena of its tail, as revealed by the photographs, appear to defy the ordinary theories and seem to show that an influence outside that of the direct action of the sun upon the comet had manifested itself in the distortion and breaking of the tail. The scarcity of active comets in the succeeding years left this question in abeyance. Comet C, 1903, Borelli, however, gave us much information as to the actual velocity of the outgoing particles of the tail, some of which receded from the comet at the rate of 29 miles a second. This object also quite clearly showed that a seat of force of great activity existed in the comet itself, which enabled it to shoot out streams of matter at large angles to the main direction of the tail, which were apparently not bent or affected by the pressure of the sun's light. The phenomena of Comet 4, 1893, were repeated in Comet C, 1908, Morehouse. But a great amount of the new phenomena was also shown by the last body which demands still greater changes in our ideas of comets and their tails. This object is so recent and its phenomena so startling that astronomers have not yet had time to thoroughly discuss the vast amount of material that exists for its study. Briefly, added to the already known rapid changes in the tail of a comet, this object exhibited the most extraordinary freaks. Tails were repeatedly formed and discarded to drift out bodily in space until they finally melted away. In several cases, the tail was twisted or corkscrew-shaped, as if it had gone out in a more or less spiral form. Areas of material connected with the tail 
would become visible at some distance from the head where apparently no supply had reached it from the nucleus several times the matter of the tail was accelerated perpendicularly to its length at one time the entire tail was thrown forward and violently curved perpendicularly to the radius vector in the general direction of the sweep of the tail through space this peculiarity is opposed to the laws of gravitation there is no known cause for this freak of the tail evidently we have here and in many other of the phenomena of this body some unknown influence at work in the planetary spaces what this is is one of the great problems for the future to solve it has been suggested that many of the unaccountable phenomena of this comet are electrical and can be attributed to the same influence that produces our magnetic storms and auroras on earth and these are believed to be due to abnormal disturbances on the sun it is to be hoped that the present return of halley's comet will add much to a solution of this problem the study of the dark or apparently vacant regions of the sky especially in the milky way is of paramount importance the photographic plate has shown that the dark regions the so-called coal sacks are generally connected with masses of nebulosity or gaseous matter these are especially remarkable in the regions of the stars theta ophiuchi and rho ophiuchi in the latter case we find a magnificent nebula in a rich region of the milky way occupying a hole that is apparently devoid of stars some astronomers have attributed the general absence of stars here to absorbing matter to an opacity and partial dying out of the nebula that cuts off the light of the stars which are beyond it what these apparent vacant regions really are is therefore an unsolved problem at present some of them are evidently due to the thinning out and actual absence of stars in those parts of the sky but the others which are connected with nebulosities seemingly must have some other explanation one fact that appears to be brought out by the great nebula of rho ophiuchi is that the groundwork of the milky way in this region and by inference elsewhere may be made up of stars actually much smaller than the average of those seen in the general sky if this were so it would materially change our ideas of the milky way this supposition comes from the fact that the great nebula is connected with some of the brighter stars in this region while at the same time there is apparently evidence that it is connected with the faint stars that form the groundwork of the milky way here if however the dark regions about and near the nebula are due to the absorption of light by an opacity of the nebula the supposition as to the relative sizes would not hold for the nebula in that case might be very much nearer to us than the milky way it will be evident that an understanding of the nature of the dark regions of the milky way is of the utmost importance to a proper knowledge of our stellar universe the great nebulous regions of the sky that photography has revealed to us are intimately connected with the milky way they cover very large regions of the heavens and must be almost inconceivably great in no case has it been possible to determine the exact dimensions of these wonderful objects because we do not know their distances it is possible however by assumptions that are justified by facts to arrive at some idea of their minimum extent if they are no further away than the nearest fixed stars and from their evident connection with certain stars we know that they must be much further away we can form some idea of their vastness our own sun if removed to the distance of the nearest fixed stars would present an apparent diameter of about the hundredth part of a second arc its known diameter is something like a million miles accurately eight hundred sixty seven thousand miles some of these nebulous regions are many degrees in diameter the one connected with the pleiades is ten degrees in diameter it is certainly connected with the cluster whose distance is much beyond the nearest fixed stars from this it will be readily seen that this great nebulous region must be at least some four million times greater in diameter than our sun or over one hundred thousand times greater 
than the entire diameter of our known solar system. These are figures that appear to be appallingly great, but they are only relatively so, and only shock us because the facts are new and we are not used to them. What is the ultimate function of these enormous masses of gaseous matter that we find lying in space? Are we sure that they are the primitive matter from which worlds and systems are finally to be evolved? These, very briefly, are a few of the problems that we encounter in astronomy as developed by the subtle means of research in use at the present time. E. E. Barnard End of Introduction Section 1 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in July 2015. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. Edited by Francis Rold Wheeler. Astronomy Chapter 1 The Evolution of Astronomical Ideas Herbert Spencer has stated that evolution is a change from the indefinite to the definite, from the incoherent to the coherent. If any proof of that doctrine were required, it would assuredly be found in the development of astronomical conceptions. In this chapter, an attempt will be made to outline in a general way the manner in which the present theories were evolved from the mysticism of folklore and religion. Some of the matter herein presented is drawn from Arrhenius, Die Vorstellung vom Weltgebäude im Wandel der Zeiten. The astronomical beliefs of prehistoric men were no doubt similar to those entertained by the Eskimo of the Arctic regions and the untutored tribes of Argentine Republic, South Africa and Australia, tribes who, living only for the day, concern themselves but little with tomorrow and yesterday and care nothing about the universe. Somewhat more cultured than these Eskimo and South American and South African tribes are primitive nations who have endeavored to account for the origin of the earth and the heavens by anthropomorphic theories. The universe must have been created by some personal being who had at his disposal something to mold. The idea that the universe was made out of nothing is a philosophical assumption which was introduced by the highly cultured philosophers of the East. The something out of which the universe was created is usually regarded as water, an element which to the eye at least is perfectly homogeneous, shapeless, and chaotic. That the fertilizing mud was deposited by floods must have attracted the attention of ancient primitive races, for which reason they may have assumed that all the earth was slowly and gradually deposited from water. Thus we find that Thales, 550 BC, argued that all things were created from water. Yet other substances were assumed as primordial matter, and later Anaximenes of Miletus, who also flourished in the 6th century, called the generative principle of things air or breath, while Heraclitus, who flourished at Ephesus near the end of the 6th century, believed that all bodies were transformation of one and the same element, which he called fire. The belief that primordial water is the origin of all things was deeply rooted in Asiatic races, for it occurs over and over again in many creation myths, among others in the Chaldean and in the Hebrew. Instead of water, we sometimes find that an egg may be taken as the primal unit, no doubt because every organism springs from an apparently lifeless seed. Thus we find that the egg plays a most important part in the creation myths of the Japanese, as well as in narratives from India, China, Polynesia, Finland, Egypt and Phoenicia. 
In many of these creation myths, of which I Reem has collected no fewer than sixty-eight, more or less independent of one another, deluges are prominent features. In nearly all of them it is supposed that after the water subsided, the land was exposed, fertilized, and made to bring forth. All of these creation myths are interwoven and interconnected with religious belief. To the savage mind everything that moves is endowed with a spirit. Accordingly, primitive man endeavors to propitiate the spirit by magic, knowledge of which art is given only to the medicine man or to the priest. In a certain sense, therefore, magic is the precursor of natural science, and the myths and lore upon which the practice of magic is based are remotely antecedent to our scientific theories. According to Andrew Lang, myths are based as much upon primitive science, resting upon superstition, as upon primitive religious conceptions. In Maspero's Histoire ancienne des peuples de l'Orient classique, we find an account of the Chaldean conception of the universe. Surrounded on all sides by the ocean, the earth rises in the middle like a high mountain whose summit is covered with snow from which the Euphrates springs. The earth is encircled by a high wall, and the abyss between the earth and the wall is filled by the ocean. Beyond it is the abode of the immortals. The wall supports the vault of the firmament, shaped by Marduk, the sun-god, out of a hard metal, which shines in the daytime, but which at night is like a blue bell set with stars. In the morning the sun enters the vault by an eastern entrance, and at night makes its exit by a western outlet. Marduk arranged the year according to the course of the sun, and divided it into twelve months, each of which counted three periods of ten days. The year, therefore, numbered three hundred and sixty days. Every sixth year a special year was intercalated, so that the year had on an average three hundred and sixty-five days. As the lives of the Chaldeans were to a high degree influenced by a change in the seasons, they laid great stress upon division of time. In the beginning they probably based their chronology upon the movements of the moon, like many another race. Soon they recognized that the sun exerted a stronger influence, and accordingly they introduced the solar year, whose divisions they ascribed to Marduk. The stars were observed because their positions determined the seasons. Since the seasons govern organic life, a pernicious belief in the influence of the stars took root, a belief which prevailed for twenty centuries and which crippled the advance of science up to the time of Galileo. Diodorus Siculus, a contemporary of Julius Caesar, describes this astrology in the following words, as given in a translation by Philemon Holland, 1700. Quote, Therefore, from a long observation of the stars, and an exact knowledge of the motions and influences of every one of them, wherein they excel all others, they, the Chaldean astrologers, foretell many things that are to come to pass. They say that the five stars, which some call planets, but they, interpreters, are most worthy of consideration, both for their motions and their remarkable influences, especially that which the Grecians call Saturn. The brightest of them all, and which often portends many and great events, they call Sol, the other four they name Mars, Venus, Mercury, and Jupiter, with our own country astrologers. They give the name of interpreters to these stars, because these only by a peculiar motion do portend things to come, and instead of Jupiters do declare to men beforehand the good will of the gods, whereas the other stars, not being of the number of the planets, have a constant ordinary motion. Future events, they say, are pointed at sometimes by their rising, and sometimes by their setting, and at other times by their colour, as may be experienced by those that will diligently observe it. 
sometimes for showing hurricanes, at other times tempestuous rains, and then again exceeding droughts. By these, they say, are often portended the appearance of comets, eclipses of the sun and moon, earthquakes, and all other the various changes and remarkable effects in the air, boding good and bad, not only to nations in general, but to kings and private persons in particular. Under the course of these planets, they say, are thirty stars, which they call counselling gods, half of whom observe what is done under the earth, and the other half take notice of the actions of man upon the earth, and what is transacted in the heavens. Once every ten days space, they say, one of the highest order of these stars descends to them that are of the lowest, like a messenger sent from them above, and then again another ascends from those below to them above, and that this is their constant natural motion to continue forever. The chief of these gods, they say, are twelve in number, to each of which they attribute a month, and one sign of the twelfth in the zodiac. Through these twelve signs the sun, moon, and the other five planets run their course. End quote. The Chaldean priests developed the most perfect astrology. They mapped out the positions of the stars for every day with such care that they could tell their true positions for some time in advance. The different stars either represented deities or were directly identified with them. If, therefore, a Chaldean king wished to know which gods ruled over his destiny, he consulted the priests as to the position of the stars on his birthday, and was informed of the chief events of his career. This Chaldean belief that the celestial bodies were gods transformed astronomy into a religion. Hence, astronomical theories were promulgated only by the ruling priest caste. To doubt the tenets of that caste was to expose oneself to merciless persecution, an oriental trait that passed over to the nations of classic antiquity and to the semi-barbarous nations of the Middle Ages. The Jews appropriated the Chaldean conception of the universe, but modified it, so that it was transformed from a polytheistic to a monotheistic conception. No doubt the Chaldaic accounts of the beginning of the world influenced Egyptian thought. According to Maspero, the Egyptians believed that matter without form was shaped by a deity, always a different person in different parts of the land, and by different methods, into the world as we see it. The classic nations borrowed much of Egyptian civilization, and with it Egyptian religion and science. For the Greek creation myth, like all the others, assumes that chaos once existed, and that out of it, Ga, the mother of all things, and her son, Uranos, the god of heaven, were created. The Greek cosmogony was adopted by the Romans without noteworthy development. Hence it is that Ovid wrote on the origin of the universe much as Hesiod had done seven hundred years before. In that long interval of seven centuries the study of nature had advanced but little. Indeed, it was not until the invention of the telescope that astronomy was lifted entirely out of the hands of the priesthood and placed upon a sure scientific footing. Before the invention of the telescope, therefore, Astronomy appears merely in the garb of a myth. At its best it was metaphysical. The rudiments of astronomical science are to be found in the efforts of the Chaldeans, Egyptians and Greeks to devise calendars and to mark time. That effort necessitated a study of the motions of the celestial bodies. Moreover, Exigencies of husbandry rendered necessary some method of keeping track of the seasons so that seed time and harvest could be ascertained. The regular occurrence of such events as the Nile flood made requisite suitable preparations. Hence, the early Egyptians so built their temples that they might know the time of the summer solstice, 
and hence the time when the flood might be expected. This was a matter of practical importance, not merely connected with religion or priestcraft, but on which the lives and the happiness of the people of Egypt depended, and might be compared with the modern time observations made at the great national observatories. The observation of the stars was carried on with at least this object in view, and gradually with the development of civilization, time reckoning from the stars became an important consideration closely connected with the lives of the people. With the study of the stars for such a purpose, naturally an amount of information as to their positions and motions was accumulated, and for centuries the practical side of astronomy was the study of the position of the stars and the motion of the planets. The astrology of the Chaldeans spreading westward increased rather than diminished the interest in the stars, for not only was the connection of the planets with natural phenomena and the mere reckoning of time studied, but the mystical element involving prophecy of future events attracted attention. In other words, astrology was a pseudo-science for which reason it is difficult to estimate its benefits or to exaggerate its evil. In its scientific aspect it involved the observation and record of the position of the heavenly bodies with all the exactness that the mathematical and observational methods of the time could achieve. It enabled the motions of the planets to be studied, as well as the positions of the fixed stars and the course of the sun as it passed through them. But, on the other hand, when the interpretation of the appearance of the skies was involved, superstition and poetic fancy had full sway, in which no doubt certain elements of self-interest and deception on the part of the priests or astrologers were not lacking. Hence these men did not study the sky to interpret phenomena on a scientific basis. Confined in the narrow limits of superstition, they not only made no progress, but actually held back astronomy as they did other sciences. That the work of the astrologer was mysterious there can be no doubt, and as no reason was assigned for the movement of the planets or the position of the stars, it was a natural assumption on the part of the people that some supernatural agency was at work, which also was connected with their lives and their future. With the beginning of the development of scientific astronomical theory proper, the power and position of the astrologers began to wane. Slowly, it is true, for when Tycho Brahe was invited to deliver lectures on astronomy at the University of Copenhagen, the first dealt very largely with astrology. Cardan and Kepler among the distinguished astronomers of the Middle Ages, Roger Bacon, Burton and Sir Thomas Brown were among the men of mind who were interested, at least in part, in the teachings of the underlying basis of the cult. As explanations of the motions of the heavenly bodies on a rational basis were forthcoming, the doom of the astrologer, so far as participation in the scientific creed of the day was concerned, was sealed. If there was a natural explanation that could be accepted, how could supernatural influences condition the movements of the planets or the positions of the stars? If then these movements were natural and made in obedience to natural laws, how could they affect the future course of life and future occurrences that obviously had no connection with natural phenomena. The law of gravitation which explained the solar system and the movement of the planets corroborated this view and left only the comets as striking natural phenomena which could not be explained in a way that the popular mind could grasp. With the rise of learning and the growth of observation, the explanations of natural phenomena by astronomers secured acceptance by the people. Finally, when Halley's prediction of the return of his comet, first made in 1705, was verified in 1758, the reign of natural law in the world of the heavens became an accepted fact from which only the ignorant or superstitious could dissent. Distinctly different and apart from astrological influence was the work of Copernicus, 
whose researches mark the beginning of the new and philosophical science of astronomy, in which the element of mysticism was gradually displaced and observation and reasoning were depended on. Copernicus, as will be seen when the development of theories of the solar system is considered in an early chapter, returned to many of the fundamental ideas of Pythagoras and the early Greek philosophers, especially that the sun was the center of the universe. He was a thoughtful student not only of Greek philosophy, but of the work of such later astronomers as Ptolemy and his successors, so that when he announced a theory of the solar system in which the earth and other planets revolved around the sun as a center, it was based upon the fullest knowledge of previous reasoning and theory. Nevertheless, he was casting to one side the tradition and the science of the day as it was then understood, and presenting what was a conception of the heavenly world no less daring than original. His theory was a natural outcome of the revival of learning in the Renaissance, foreshadowed by the work of such men as Leonardo da Vinci and others in whom the scientific spark had been awakened. With Copernicus, the evolution of his heliocentric theory was a matter of scientific reasoning rather than of direct observation. But it marked the beginning of a series of epoch-making discoveries presented in a clear and positive form, so that the theory of the revolution of the planets around the sun became one of the fundamental canons of astronomy. Thus, as will appear in the course of our history, the Copernican theory in which the revolution of the planets around the sun is made clear, Kepler's theory of planetary motion in which laws are stated to account for this motion, and finally Newton's announcement of the great universal law of gravitation are the foundation stones on which modern astronomical science firmly rests. The invention of the telescope established the similarity in the bodies of the solar system and revealed facts that previously had been hidden from observers of the heavens. Indeed, with the invention of the telescope and the growth of mathematical science, there began an era of descriptional astronomy in which exact observation was combined with careful computation and mathematical analysis an era which continued into the 19th century with undiminished vigor. Brilliant discoveries were made possible by improved and powerful instruments, accompanied by theoretical work of even greater value. In the middle of the 19th century, new instruments were put at the command of the scientist, which had a remarkable effect in extending the boundaries of the science. The telescope had facilitated merely the observation of the stars. The spectroscope, on the other hand, enabled the astronomer to ascertain their composition. With the application of the spectroscope to astronomy began the welding of physics and chemistry with astronomy and the birth of that modern science of astrophysics which has afforded data for the study of the serious problems connected with the evolution of the universe. From the soothsaying stargazer of Chaldean times to the modern astrophysicist, who works in a laboratory as well as in an observatory, we have a development that is responsible for the aggregation of knowledge, which we now possess of the vast universe with its suns, planets, stars and nebulae. The spectra of distant celestial bodies recorded on the photographic plate by the spectrographs of large telescopes are now studied in comparison with the spectra of terrestrial substances produced in the physical laboratory. Not only the nature and composition of the stars can be ascertained, but also their motion in space, which are beyond the range of any telescope. The new astronomy has become on its astrophysical side almost an experimental science with the methods and accuracy of the chemical or physical laboratory. It is from this modern astronomy, with its breadth and resourcefulness, that modern science looks not only for advances in its own particular field, 
but in the broader and ever interesting problems of cosmogony as concerned in the evolution of the stars and other bodies making up the universe. End of section 1section two of the science history of the universe volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by avai in july two thousand fifteen the science history of the universe volume one edited by francis rolt wheeler astronomy Chapter 2. The Evolution of Astronomical Methods of Observation. Part 1. The history of astronomical observation is the history of man's attempt to bring the stars nearer to him. His own senses are so feeble and so very subject to error that he has been constrained to devise subtle artificial senses which take the place of eyes and hands. Thus, early he invented position finders, which enabled him to determine with more or less precision a star's direction or position at a given time, and not merely to guess at their position. Great eyes, called telescopes, that see what his eyes can never see, and also determine positions with greater accuracy. Wonderful spectroscopes that analyze a star's composition as nicely as if it were a stone picked up in the road, and photographic devices that reveal secrets of star structure that otherwise would never be disclosed by his unaided senses. For determining the position of the heavenly bodies, the instruments used have always been comparatively simple. All are based on certain rudimentary geometric principles. As geometry was a science fairly well developed among the ancients, it is not difficult to realize that they had various means of measuring angles, both vertical and horizontal. In most ancient cases, however, the observers have failed to hand down their methods, merely recording the results without indicating the circumstances in which they were obtained, so that it is impossible to discuss the values of the observations and correct them in the light of recent discoveries. It is evident that the instruments of the ancients were simple, but their precise nature is altogether uncertain. The earliest astronomical observations of which there is record were made by the Chinese. The Shu King, the oldest known scientific work, states that two thousand years before the present era the chinese determined the seasons that is to say the positions of the sun at the equinoxes and solstices by means of four stars which have since been identified and found to be so suitable that a modern astronomer could not have made a better choice the chinese also determined eleven hundred years before the present era the obliquity of the ecliptic which they found equal to 23 degrees 54 minutes. The obliquity, which varies, is now 23 degrees 37 minutes, and calculation shows that at the epoch of the Chinese observations it must have been 23 degrees 51 minutes. Hence the error of the Chinese determination was only three minutes of arc. Among the few astronomical values which have remained constant during the history of man are the times of revolution of the planets. The Hindus determined the revolution of Mercury with an error of 4 over 10,000 of a day. For Venus the error was 25 over 10,000 of a day. For Mars 3 over 1,000 of a day. In the case of Jupiter the error amounts to one quarter of a day but it is to be remembered that the period of revolution of this planet exceeds eleven years, so that the same observer could not observe many returns of the planet to the same point of its orbit. This comment applies with still greater force to Saturn, the revolution of which occupies twenty-nine years. Hence it is not astonishing that in this case the Hindus were six days in error. Among the ancient Greeks is a measurement of a terrestrial meridian made about 200 BC by Eratosthenes, 
276 BC to 195 or 196 BC, who found the circumference of the Earth equal to 250,000 stadia by measuring the angular distance of the Sun from the zenith at the summer solstice both at Alexandria and at Syene in Upper Egypt, by means of the length of shadow cast by a vertical pillar at noon at each place. According to the researches of Tannery, the stadium as an astronomical unit equals 157.5 meters, 516.7 feet, which gives for the Earth's circumference a length of 39,690 kilometers, 24,662 miles, instead of 40,000 kilometers, 24,855 miles, as we know it. Here the precision is remarkable, especially when it is remembered that the measurement was effected by counting the paces contained in an arc of the meridian and by multiplying the number so found by the length of a pace. The instruments most frequently employed by early astronomers were divided circles and compasses with simple sights, which allowed the line of vision to be directed to the star under observation and its direction as compared with some other line of sight to be measured. Ptolemy's ring or astrolabe, for example, described in the fifth book of his Almagest and used to identify the relative positions of the stars and planets, was composed of two concentric vertical circles. The outer circle, about 16 inches in diameter, was fixed and graduated. It supported the interior ring, which was movable, and carried the two sides. There was also a geometric square, which was used in a manner analogous to that of a table of logarithms. Various forms of apparatus for the measurement of horizontal and vertical angles were early developed, and as the study of the heavenly bodies developed to a point where it was useful in navigation, the cross staff or back staff was invented consisting of simple sighting bars with cross pieces suitable for the calculation and measurement of such angles as the heights of the heavenly bodies above the horizon and their distance from one another. Quadrants of one form or another, with a sighting bar and divided circular scale, and astrolabes or celestial circles, also for the direct measurements of angles, were employed. Many of these, by the Middle Ages, were examples of accuracy of division. A quadrant designed by Tycho Brahe, 1546 through 1601, for example, was of 19 feet radius and had its circumference graduated to single minutes. Various forms of armillary spheres were constructed in which the stars were placed in their relative positions on great circles of the celestial sphere. Such devices served for much of the early astronomical work, taking the place of modern star charts. Tycho Brahe, like his predecessors, employed wooden instruments. One of these was a large Ptolemy's ring, surmounted by a post carrying horizontal arms, by which it was turned in bearings like a capstan, so that the ring could be brought into any vertical plane. Tycho Brahe also constructed a mural circle, by means of which vertical angles could be measured. Hence it was by using the naked eye and rudimentary instruments that he accumulated observations of such precision that they served Kepler as the basis of the researches which led to the discovery of the laws of planetary movement. The eye can distinguish an object whose diameter is equal to about 1 over 3,000 of its distance, which corresponds with an angular diameter of about one minute of arc. This was the measure of the precision of early observations. Its value may be appreciated by stating that it corresponds with the diameter of a lead pencil seen at a distance of 70 feet. The telescope, by increasing the distance at which objects can be distinguished, therefore has been and is now the chief reliance of the astronomer in determining position. While the naked eye today may be said to have been very largely supplanted by spectroscopic and photographic observation, 
yet the telescope has constantly met the demands of astronomers as its power has increased and its scope widened by chance or otherwise it was found by a dutch spectacle maker Lippershey, about sixteen o eight that two lenses when placed at some distance apart would act to magnify distant objects just as a single lens would enlarge the image of a nearby object this action of the lens can be explained by considering the effect on a prism of transparent material placed in the path of a beam of light when a beam of light falls on one of the angular faces of the prism at a direction other than perpendicular to the face it is forced to change its direction on account of refraction due to the change in medium that is a ray of light passing obliquely through air into a denser medium such as glass is bent toward the perpendicular and in passing out from a denser to a rarer medium is bent away from the perpendicular a lens may be considered as a collection of prisms of constantly changing angles so that the effect would be to bend parallel rays coming from a point at infinite distance in such a way that they would all be brought to a single point known as the focus consequently a telescope may be regarded as a light gatherer the importance to astronomy of lippers hayes invention can be appreciated from the fact that as soon as galileo heard of it he constructed such an instrument which hardly the size of a small toy spyglass magnified three times or brought the heavenly bodies three times as near he applied it to celestial observation in sixteen o nine the value of the telescope as an astronomical instrument became apparent immediately it was from the use of his optic tube as he called it that galileo arrived at the conclusion that ptolemy was wrong and copernicus right how will become apparent from a consideration of the discoveries made by galileo he did more than this however for by the application of the telescope to the observation of the stars he became in truth the founder of our modern science of astrophysics galileo saw hosts of stars never before revealed to the unaided eye the six stars in the pleiades now appeared as thirty-six and various nebulous objects of light such as the milky way were found to consist of multitudes of fine stars clustered together but his crowning achievement occurred on january seventh sixteen ten when in turning his telescope toward jupiter he discovered four satellites of that planet and determined that their periods of revolution around jupiter ranged from about forty-two hours to seventeen days here was a miniature system similar to that conceived by copernicus was it any wonder that galileo abandoned the ptolemaic teaching thus galileo was able to strike a serious blow at the infallibility of aristotle and ptolemy by whom no mention had been made of the existence of such extra bodies at this time however others besides galileo were working with the telescope among them thomas harriot fifteen sixty through sixteen twenty one in england simon marius fifteen seventy through sixteen twenty four and christopher scheiner fifteen seventy five through sixteen fifty in germany thenceforth observational astronomy with the telescope was anchored on a firm basis as was quite natural telescopes eventually formed an important part of the equipment of the observatory of tycho brahe and of john kepler fifteen seventy one through sixteen thirty in one of kepler's works on optics is contained a suggestion for the use of a convex lens for an eyepiece in the construction of the telescope galileo's instrument consisted of a lead tube containing a large double convex lens which served as an objective and a small double concave lens at the eye end in order to give an erect image an arrangement which finds its counterpart in the modern opera glass kepler's suggested improvement provided a more efficient and fairly modern astronomical telescope the actual construction of an instrument of this type however 
is credited to Shiner rather than Kepler, who was notably deficient in mechanical skill. After considerable experimenting by various astronomers and instrument makers, it was found that a comparatively small objective with a considerable focal length was more useful and effective. In 1672, Capani of Bologna constructed an instrument of this kind 136 feet long, while Ozu actually made a telescope 600 feet in length, which, however, failed to work. These, of course, were skeleton structures not mounted in tubes. Perhaps the best of them were those of Huygens, 1629 through 1695, whose skill in grinding lenses stood him in such good stead that he was able to construct a telescope with which he determined the ring of Saturn. Huygens' telescope had considerable focal length. He placed the object glass on a tall vertical pole or staff, so balanced that it could be moved in any direction by means of a cord. The observer on the surface of the earth was supplied with an eyepiece, which he maintained in a straight line with the star he was observing by means of a cord. All these telescopes were refractors. They were subject to certain inherent defects, chief among which was the difficulty of bringing to a single focus all the rays of different colors. The 17th century philosophers believed it impossible to overcome the unequal refrangibility of the different colored rays of light which produced chromatic aberration and resulted in an image indistinct for the blurring of various colors. Accordingly, they gave up the idea of perfecting the refracting telescope and directed their attention to constructing an instrument on a different principle, using a concave mirror to form the image of the object observed. Mersenne, in 1639, suggested the employment of a spherical mirror, but the idea appears to have been dropped. Quite independently, James Gregory, in 1663, proposed a similar arrangement, using, however, a parabolic in place of a spherical mirror. At that time, he could not find a workman able to construct such a mirror. In the Gregorian instruments, the parabolic reflector is placed at the lower end of the tube, while on its axis and a short distance beyond its focus is placed a small concave reflector. The light from the distant object falls upon the large mirror, from which it is reflected back to the small one, which throws it back through a hole in the centre of the large reflector. It then passes into the eyepiece, which, indeed, in Gregory's time had been much improved by Huygens. Gregory's efforts turned Newton's attention to reflecting telescopes. In 1669 he cast his first disc and began to grind it, but it was not until 1672 that he had real success. Then he made two small instruments, one of which was only about an inch in diameter, with a magnifying power of about 38. The principle of Newton's telescope differed from that of Gregory's in that it had a small plane mirror placed in the cone of light from the reflector at an angle of 45 degrees. Being placed inside the focus, this mirror brought the light cone at right angles to its original direction, thus forming the image outside the tube and obviating the necessity of a hole in the parabolic reflector. About the same time that Newton completed his instrument, the Casgrain construction was proposed, which was similar in construction to the Gregorian telescope, except for the small mirror. In the Gregorian, this mirror was concave. Casgrain, 1672, proposed the use of a concave mirror inside the focus. It brought the light from the object to a focus through a hole in the center of the large parabolic mirror. Owing to the difficulty in obtaining a suitable mirror alloy, little progress was made for some time in constructing reflecting telescopes. In 1718, however, Hadley, the inventor of the sextant, constructed one on the Newtonian principle, five feet in length. 
the instrument magnified over 200 times and revealed as much as the old refracting telescopes. Perfect as this Newtonian telescope seemed to be, the Gregorian type held the field until 1774. End of section 2 Section 3 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in July 2015. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler astronomy chapter two the evolution of astronomical methods of observation part two by using a small gregorian telescope herschel had his attention directed to the wonders of astronomy his income being too limited to purchase an instrument he set about making one for himself during his life he is said to have made upward of four hundred telescopes mostly of the Newtonian type. Among his earliest efforts was the construction of a five-foot reflector, which was a wonderful success. Then came one seven feet in length. The largest of his instruments was completed under George III in 1789. This telescope surpassed all his previous efforts, for it was actually forty feet long and had a reflecting mirror four feet in diameter. The story of Herschel's work with this great telescope would fill a volume. The largest telescope of the reflecting type was constructed by Lord Ross, an Irish peer, and used at Parsonstown. It had a mirror of 54 feet focus and a diameter of 6 feet, but it could be used only for observations on or near the meridian. While out of use for many years, it long held the record for size, which, however, is now taken by the 100-inch reflector recently completed for the Mount Wilson Solar Observatory, California. The case of the reflecting telescope, which, as we have seen, had been all but abandoned on account of its chromatic aberration by the 17th century astronomers and physicists, was not as hopeless as they believed. Notwithstanding Newton's dictum that it was useless to try to improve it, owing to the impossibility of producing refraction without dispersion, Euler read a paper before the Berlin Academy in 1746, proving mathematically the possibility of correcting both the spherical and chromatic aberration of an object class. Upon reading Klingenstierner's paper corroborating Euler's views, John Dolland made a series of most valuable experiments which led him to the solution of the problem of the achromatic object glass, namely, that by properly combining two kinds of glass, flint and crown, he could unite the colored rays fairly well and still have refraction to unite the incident rays to form an image. Dolland's discovery occurred in 1758. His work soon became famous. He was surely master of his subject and had a clear field for many years. Like other opticians, he labored under great difficulties in securing glass suitable for telescopes of any diameter. Fortunately, a genius had taken hold of this problem in the person of Guinon, a Swiss watchmaker, who, after long experimenting, solved the problem of making fine disks of optical glass. He associated himself with the celebrated Fraunhofer in 1805, and they successfully made optical glass discs up to 15 inches aperture. To Fraunhofer are due many of the most important discoveries in the theory of the achromatic objective. With proper optical glass and methods of correction, the refracting telescope soon came into its own. The size of the objectives was increased so that sufficient amounts of light were gathered to form a distinct image. The best makers of Europe gradually developed both lenses and mountings, so that precision of measurement and ease of adjustment were secured. 
it was in the United States that the best work in this field began to be carried on. The lenses of Alvin Clark gained an international reputation. An objective 30 inches in diameter was made by him for the Russian observatory at Pulkova soon after a 26-inch telescope had been completed for the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington. These were succeeded by the 36-inch instrument of the Lick Observatory and the 40-inch telescope of the Yerkes Observatory, with both of which results in proportion to their increased size have been obtained. The 17th century really marks the beginning of instrumental work and accurate measurements in astronomy. The vernier, which made it possible to subdivide linear and circular scales with accuracy, made its appearance in 1631. In 1640, the optical axis or line of direction of the telescope was practically defined, and the micrometer was invented by William Gascoigne, 1612 to 1644, which was the forerunner of the phyla micrometer, so essential to modern astronomy, where an image at the focus of a telescope can be measured. The micrometer is indeed an important adjunct to the telescope, for, unless angular distances can be measured, the mere bringing nearer of the celestial bodies would have but a limited amount of usefulness. In the micrometer of William Gascoigne, two pointers carried by a single screw were placed at the focus of a telescope. When these pointers were parallel, they pointed to zero. But by revolving the screw, they could be separated, and the number of revolutions or parts of a revolution could be read from a divided head. Consequently, all that it was necessary to know was the distance between two successive threads of the screw in order to obtain an exact value for any distance which the pointers might separate. Now, if it were desirable to determine the angular distance between two stars, each pointer was set on a star, and the distance between them was thus gradually measured, so that by simple mathematics the corresponding angular distance could be computed. Micrometers soon became an important part of exact observation with a telescope. Ozu and Picard made subsequent improvements, so that finally a micrometer resulted in which a spider filament was placed on a frame moved by a screw with graduated head, thus enabling increased precision of observation to be obtained. This is the fundamental device now used with various improvements and refinements. Römer, who was the first to determine the velocity of light, improved the micrometer in 1672 by adding springs to take up the lost motion. He also constructed the first meridian telescope in 1689. By the middle of the 17th century, the use of telescopic sights for determining the position of the stars had become established. The precision of the observations of that epoch may be estimated at 10 seconds of arc, which corresponds to the diameter of a lead pencil seen at a distance of about 550 feet. Methods and instruments continued to improve. The observations of Lalande attained a limit of precision of one second of arc, corresponding to a pencil at 5,500 feet. At the beginning of the 19th century, great improvements were made. In 1875, the limit of precision had been reduced to one-half a second, which removes the lead pencil to 11,000 feet, or more than two miles. For minute measurements, one of the most useful devices has been the heliometer or divided object glass micrometer, the first really available type of which was constructed by Fraunhofer for the observatory at Königsberg. In this instrument an object glass or lens is used, which is divided along its diameter. The two parts of the glass are mounted so that they can be moved laterally with respect to each other. Consequently, each half supplies a distinct image of the same object, but separated by a strictly measurable amount. Thus, if a double star is under examination, the two half lenses into which the object glass is divided can be moved until the upper star in one image is brought into coincidence with the other star in the lower image, 
so that the distance apart becomes known by the amount of motion employed. By using screws with heads of considerable size to move the halves of the object class, the heliometer can be read to the thousandth part of a revolution, and in the case of the Königsberg instrument, such a division, equivalent to one twentieth of a second of arc, could be measured with accuracy. This new instrument, which was not mounted until 1829, three years after the death of Fraunhofer, was at once employed by Bessel to solve the problem of star distances. His measurement of the parallax of the star known as 61 Cygni, corresponding with a distance about 600 times that of the Earth from the Sun, not only was considered ascertained beyond question, but is spoken of by Miss Clerk as memorable as the first published instance of the fathom line so industriously thrown into celestial space, having really and indubitably touched bottom. In 1874 the heliometer was applied to the observation of the transit of Venus, and again in 1877, when Mars came into opposition with the Sun, Sir David Gill, using the heliometer, made a valuable determination of the solar parallax, obtaining a value of 8.78 seconds, corresponding with a distance of 93,080,000 miles. By this time the heliometer had become an accepted method for improving astronomers' knowledge of the sun's distance. A number of heliometers were employed in cooperation at different points of the Earth's surface, the work of Professor Elkins at Yale in connection with Sir David Gill at the Cape of Good Hope Observatory being especially notable. Another modern development of telescopic astronomy has been the direct measurement of the magnitude and brightness of a star, thus superseding to a great degree the judgment of the eye upon which the older astronomers had depended from the days of Hipparchus. The photometers, light measurers, used with telescope for this purpose consist either of those designed to cut down the amount of light furnished by a measurable amount and thus cause the star to disappear, or those in which conditions are so arranged that the light of the star appears just equal to some standard light. Under the first head is the so-called cat's eye, in which a wedge of dark neutral tinted glass is placed close to the eye, either at the eyeball of the eyepiece or at the principal focus where the micrometer wires are usually placed. As the wedge is introduced until the star just disappears, the graduation is read, which graduation can be reduced to a scale of magnitudes. In the other class of photometers, the light of the star is compared with an arbitrary artificial star formed by light from an oil lamp shining through a small aperture. To Huygens is due the application in 1655 of the pendulum to the practical measurement of time, thus giving us a clock so regulated that it was possible to make accurate time observation. The invention of the pendulum clock, patented in 1657, therefore marks a distinct epoch in astronomy. The most usual and most useful form of mounting for a telescope is the equatorial, the principal axis of which is inclined at an angle equal to the latitude of the observatory, and is directed toward the North Pole in the Northern Hemisphere, and toward the South Pole in the Southern Hemisphere. The axis of the instrument is thus parallel to the Earth's axis of rotation, and is therefore called the polar axis. It carries a graduated circle which is parallel to the celestial equator, known as the hour circle from which circle may be read the hour angle of the body upon which the telescope happens to be pointed. The polar axis also carries the bearings of the declination axis, which is perpendicular to the polar axis and carries the telescope itself and the declination circle. When the equatorial telescope is directed toward a star or a planet, it is necessary only to use clockwork machinery to cause the polar axis of the instrument to turn with a uniform motion in order to follow any star or planet which otherwise would soon be carried out of the field of view by the rotation of the earth. 
The equatorial also enables the observer to look at once to a particular part of the heavens where a given body is expected to be at a given time. The mounting for a modern equatorial telescope requires large and heavy moving parts. Where a solar or stellar image is desired, it does not seem desirable to employ such a heavy mechanism. To Léon Foucault, about 1868, the idea occurred to construct a fixed telescope with a mirror, moving with one-half the angular velocity of the sun, deflecting a beam in a fixed direction. Such an instrument was constructed and was employed with good results, although its operation was marred by imperfections in its driving mechanism. However, the device did not attract much attention until plans were made in the Eclipse Expedition of 1890 for extensive photographs of the phenomenon. It was proposed to use the instrument in connection with a second mirror to produce an image which would not move. This device, now called a silostat, was found admirable for eclipse photography. Experiments were made at the Yerkes Observatory to construct such an instrument for solar work. The work was subsequently transferred to the Carnegie Institution Observatory on Mount Wilson. An extension of the same principle may be found in the tower telescope of that institution, where a silostat is mounted on the top of a skeleton tower and a beam of light is reflected to a laboratory beneath. Today the most modern and efficient reflecting telescope of large size is the 100-inch instrument designed for the same observatory by Professor G. W. Ritchie. At the present time both refracting and reflecting telescopes are in use and have been brought to a great degree of perfection. Just which is the better it would be hard to say. The old speculum metal reflector has been almost discarded, and glass, coated with silver, has been substituted. The glass is much superior to the metal, as it can be figured more accurately, and if tarnished, the silver can be removed without changing the figure of the mirror. Again, much study has been given in France to a form of telescope known as the equatorial coudé, in which the optical axis of the telescope is parallel to the axis of the earth and the light of the star is reflected into it by two mirrors. Such an instrument, constructed for the Paris Observatory, has been very convenient for the astronomer, who can sit in his chair and observe the stars as easily as he can use his microscope. But the loss of light and definition by the double reflection, as well as the deflection of the mirrors and the varying temperatures to which the different parts of the instrument are subjected, render this construction far from perfect. End of section 3section 4 of the science history of the universe volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by avai in july 2015 the science history of the universe volume 1 edited by francis rolled wheeler astronomy Chapter 3. The Evolution of Astronomical Instruments and Methods, The Rise of Astrophysics, The Spectroscope and Its Modifications. To gain a knowledge of the composition and nature of the celestial bodies is the fundamental problem of astronomy. Unable to bring a celestial body or a specimen from it, except in the rare case of a meteorite, to the chemical laboratory for study, the astronomer is dependent entirely on a study of the energy that it emits in the form of light and heat rays. Strange as it may seem, these rays furnish as true a record of their birth and life history as if a sample from the distant star had been tested in the assay furnace or with the reagents of the chemist. The simple instrument called a spectroscope gives an accurate and permanent record which affords complete data for the studies of the astronomer. White light is composed of various forms of vibration, 
which, taken by themselves, will supply light of various colours from red to violet. It was found by Sir Isaac Newton, in passing a beam of white light through a prism, that not all of the rays are bent equally toward and away from the perpendicular, but that the amount of bending depended upon their colour, or, as it is now termed, their wavelength and position in the solar spectrum. Thus, when he permitted a beam of white light, emerging from a hole in a shutter, to fall upon a prism in a dark room, he found that there was produced after its emergence a brightly coloured band, with the red at one end, where the waves were refracted the least, and shading through yellow and green to violet, where the waves were bent or refracted most. Consequently, if there were a source of light capable of furnishing one colour, and that only, it would be obvious, wherever that colour appears in the bright band produced by the prism, that it radiated from a particular source. Before 1753, a young Scotchman, Thomas Melville, noticed that when various compounds of sodium were introduced into an alcohol flame and viewed through a prism, there appeared a particular shade of yellow light, which was always bent or refracted to a fixed and definite degree. Others repeated these experiments, and finally Fraunhofer, 1787-1826, through 1826, a great optician of Munich, rediscovered this deep yellow ray and found its place in the spectrum. The same phenomenon was noticed by many other experimenters. Indeed, the omnipresence of the yellow light was often an embarrassment in spectral research. That this yellow line was due to sodium was pointed out by William Swan. Finally, it was noted that the distribution of sodium was so general, and the prism test of its presence so delicate, that its absolute exclusion was well nigh impossible. Before Fraunhofer's experiments, the round hole in the shutter of Newton had been supplanted by a slit or crevice about one-twentieth of an inch wide, and the spectral band thus formed from sunlight was not only continuous, but free from overlapping images, so that the colours were shown in their purity, crossed by seven dark lines. In the course of his experiments, Fraunhofer not only used the slit, but added to it the telescope of the modern spectroscope. He was surprised to find not merely seven, but thousands of dark transverse lines, many of which he mapped, counted, and designated by the letters of the alphabet. Not only did he examine sunlight in this way, but also the light of the moon and planets, and found that stellar spectra too were crossed by the same dark lines. In the case of certain stars there were even dark bands. He found that one, or rather a pair of solar lines which he had marked in his map with the letter D, coincided exactly with the yellow beam which accompanied incandescent sodium vapour. The coincidence was noted by Fraunhofer, but the explanation came in 1859 from the distinguished German physicist Professor Gustav Robert Kirchhoff, 1824-1887. through 1887. He, it was, who sent a beam of bright sunshine through sodium vapour, and discovered that the D line of Fraunhofer, instead of being effaced by the flame, was strengthened. The same held true with iron. The inference was of course drawn that sodium and iron were constituents of the glowing atmosphere of the sun, and that light of the particular wavelength in passing through such an atmosphere was absorbed. This particle has been formulated by Miss Clerk as follows. Substances of every kind are opaque to the precise rays which they emit at the same temperature, that is to say, they stop the kinds of light or heat which they are then actually in a condition to radiate but it does not follow that cool bodies absorb the rays which they would give out if sufficiently heated. Hydrogen at ordinary temperature, for instance, is almost perfectly transparent, but if raised to the glowing point, as by the passage of electricity, it then becomes capable of arresting, and at the same time of displaying in its own spectra, 
light of four distinct colors. In these few words we have the essence of spectroscopic chemistry and astrophysics. Materials of the earth, when heated to incandescence, give a bright line spectrum characteristic of the individual element, but the same materials in the sun show a spectrum marked by dark lines. While spectrum analysis was applied to chemistry and terrestrial materials by Bunsen, Kirchhoff worked industriously and made a map of the solar spectrum some eight feet in length, in which the various lines of the elementary bodies were represented. The spectroscope, as constructed by Kirchhoff, consisted of a slit placed at the principal focus of the convex lens to make the rays parallel for their passage through the prism. In order to secure greater dispersion, several prisms were added and the emerging beam was passed through the telescope to form an image of the spectrum. The new instrument at once presented an enormous number of lines for study, not only of the sun, but of various other celestial bodies. It was soon applied to the observing end of an astronomical telescope, so that the celestial image was formed directly at the slit of the spectroscope. By increasing the number of prisms, the dispersion of the spectroscope can be increased, and a longer spectral band produced, in which otherwise closely adjacent lines are increasingly separated. But in passing through a number of prisms, there is considerable loss of light by reflection and absorption, so that a limit is soon set to the number of prisms employed. Another form of spectroscope, which makes use of a grating or a number of fine lines ruled very closely together on a transparent or a reflecting surface, has been found to possess greater dissolving power without any accompanying loss of light. In fact, the resolving power of a perfect grating depends simply upon the total number of lines it contains, so that the light efficiency per unit area may be as great for a large grating as for a small one. The principle of the grating depends upon the interference of the various minute light waves caused by a series of lines, amounting to from 10 to 20,000 to the inch ruled on a transparent or a reflecting surface. The mathematical discussion of the formation of a spectra by the interference of the light waves in passing through or being reflected from such a grating can hardly find a place here. The result, however, is essentially the same as in the case of a prism. As soon as the dispersion of light was obtained by this means, it was found that it could be studied quantitatively and that the grating could be used for astronomical measurements with as great facility as the prism spectroscope. Lewis M. Rutherford of New York was able to make excellent gratings about 1864, but it remained for Professor Henry A. Rowland at the Johns Hopkins University to construct a dividing engine with a screw, practically free from error which would move a small plate of polished speculum metal by regular intervals of one fifteen thousandth of an inch under a diamond point which traced sharp and regular lines. This machine not only was remarkable sensitive in its action, but automatically compensated for any minute irregularities in the screw. It was made to work at a constant temperature. It automatically proceeded with its ruling night and day until a grating of the desired length was completed. Professor Rowland, for the first time, ruled gratings on concave surfaces and used them in place of the prism of the ordinary spectroscope. The spectra obtained with these diffraction gratings, in conjunction with special lenses, were many feet in length and could be photographed in sections on photographic plates, each of about 20 inches in length. The grating spectroscope has been modified by Professor A. A. Michelson of the University of Chicago, who has devised a new form of grating in which a series of glass plates precisely equal in thickness are placed one on another like a flight of steps. A parallel beam of light when transmitted through them is resolved into spectra of a very high order, exceeding even those of Rowland's largest gratings 
so that compound lines in the spectrum can be studied with facility. The application of the spectroscope has made of astronomy an experimental science, with methods and instruments for research and future progress fully as promising as may be found in any of the physical or natural sciences. The spectroscope has not only amplified astronomy, but it has developed the new science of astrophysics, in which astronomy is combined with physics. New methods and instruments for research already have brought to light striking discoveries which have compelled the modification of older astronomical and cosmical theories. In connection with the spectroscope it is possible to measure the temperature of the radiations sent out from the sun and the stars with a high degree of accuracy by means of the bolometer, a sensitive thermometer invented by Professor S. P. Langley. It consists of two very fine threads of platinum wire about one two thousand five hundredth of an inch in thickness, mounted side by side within a constant temperature chamber. On one of these wires the radiation is permitted to fall, while the other is carefully shielded. Any change in the temperature of the wire on which the light or heat waves fall produces a difference in its electrical resistance that can be measured with a high degree of precision, so that a difference of less than one millionth of a degree in the temperature can be clearly indicated. The spectrum formed by the spectroscope is caused to move slowly across the exposed platinum wire of the bolometer, and the galvanometer in the circuit reflects from its mirror a spot of light upon a photographic plate, so that the deflections of the magnetic needle are photographed and registered, thus indicating the intensity and energy at the different parts of the spectrum. This instrument was first used by Langley to determine the amount of heat received from the sun on the top of Mount Whitney in 1881, and since that time it has been employed by him and his successors at the Astrophysical Laboratory at Washington and also at Mount Wilson. The problem that the bolometer seems capable of solving is to determine the atmospheric absorption of light and heat in the passage of the sun's rays to the earth. It has also been used to measure the heat spectrum of the moon and some of the brighter stars, in the case of the former showing that the moon is very cold, as there is a considerable quantity of heat radiated having a wavelength greater than that of the heat radiated from a block of ice. After the fundamental work of Kirchhoff in identifying the spectral lines of the sun and the stars with various terrestrial materials, it was but natural that the composition of stars as shown in their spectra should be thoroughly attacked by astronomers. Among the first of these was Sir William Huggins, who devoted the greater part of a useful scientific life to research of the heavenly bodies, especially as revealed by the spectroscope. In 1862, Huggins, Secchi, and Lewis M. Rutherford began their researches in stellar spectra that enabled them to classify and compare the spectral bands furnished by the different stars. It was the spectroscope in the hands of Sir William Huggins that made possible the solution of the riddle of the nebulae, the nature of which for long years had been a vital point of discussion among astronomers. On August 29, 1864, directing his spectroscope to the planetary nebulae in Draco, Huggins saw, instead of the bright band he anticipated, a single line which subsequently was resolved into three lines. Thus he proved that the nebula was not an aggregation of stars or incandescent solid materials which would have afforded a continuous spectrum crossed by dark bands and a luminous gas. The effect of the spectroscope on astronomical research is thus summarized by Professor Hale. In astronomy, the introduction of physical methods has revolutionized the observatory, transforming it from a simple observing station into a laboratory. The interest of the students of astrophysics is no longer confined simply to celestial phenomena. For astrophysics has become, in its modern aspect, almost an experimental science, 
in which some of the fundamental problems of physics and chemistry may find their solution. The stars may be regarded as enormous crucibles, in some of which terrestrial elements are subjected to temperatures and pressures far transcending those obtainable by artificial means. In the sun, which appears to us not merely as a point of light like the stars, but as a vast globe whose every detail can be studied in its relationship to the general problem of the solar constitution, the immense scale of the phenomena always open to observation, the rapidity of the changes and the enormous masses of material involved provide the means for researches which could never be undertaken in terrestrial laboratories. Hence it is that astrophysics may equally well be regarded as a branch of physics or as a branch of astronomy. The great advantage of the spectroscope over the eye or the direct image from the photographic plate is its ability to analyze the action of light. While the intensity of light suffers in its journey through space, yet the nature or character of the light undergoes practically no change, so that the light from a distant star, separated from the earth by an interval that seems to us almost infinite, can be received in our spectroscope and be resolved into a spectral band with difficulty but slightly greater than that which would be found in the employment of a luminous source of light at the opposite end of the laboratory table. The spectroscope, therefore, can be used in astronomy to determine the composition of a distant body according to the principle of spectrum analysis. But this is not all. It also enables the determination whether the light from a luminous body in the heavens is approaching or receding, and whether the light emitted from such a body is the same today as it was yesterday or half a century ago, and whether it comes from one or more bodies which the eye and perhaps the telescope cannot separate, but which are distinctly separate. Hence the astronomer is only too glad to remove the eyepiece from his telescope and put in its place some spectroscopic device which will analyze the light into separate colors and give him much valuable information as to the constitution and motions of even the most distant star. The value of the spectroscope is greatly increased by the application of photography. The general nature of a spectroscopic investigation can best be described by abstracting from Professor Hale its description of solar spectrum analysis. Sunlight must be reflected from a mirror to a heliostat, driven by clockwork to maintain the beam in a fixed direction, to the slit. Between the slit and the heliostat a lens is introduced, for the purpose of forming an image of the sun upon the slit. When the illumination is secured in this way, the whole grating is filled with light from the diverging rays. The grating then produces an image of the solar spectrum upon the photographic plate, where it may be recorded by giving a suitable exposure. To facilitate an accurate comparison, the solar spectrum is photographed side by side on the same plate with the spectrum of the substance whose presence in the sun is to be determined. In order to accomplish this, one half of the slit is covered, and the sunlight is admitted through the other half. Thus the solar spectrum is photographed on one side of the plate. After this exposure is completed, the sunlight is shut off, and the screen in front of the slit moved so as to cover the half previously open, and to uncover the other half. The image of the sun on the slit of the spectroscope is then replaced by an image of an electric arc light burning between two poles of iron. The spectrum of the iron vapor is thus produced on the plate, and a strip of this spectrum is photographed beside the strip of solar spectrum. The bright lights of iron are represented in the solar spectrum by corresponding dark lines which accurately image them in position. In Rowland's work on the solar spectra, thousands of lines were found to correspond with the iron lines given by the electric arc. The same process can be employed to determine the presence of other substances in the sun. In the case of metals, the electric discharge may be caused to pass between two metallic rods, 
or fragments of the metal may be placed in a hole drilled in one of the carbons of an ordinary electric arc lamp. In the latter case the spectrum of carbon, and also of impurities which the carbon poles always contain, will appear on the plate with the spectrum of the metal in question. But these extra lines may always be identified and usually give no trouble. The identification of the solar lines, however, is not always so simple as in the case of iron. Many substances are doubtfully represented in the sun by only a small number of lines, and it is sometimes very difficult to decide whether a few apparent coincidences are sufficient to warrant one in drawing definite conclusions. The matter is usually determined by ascertaining whether certain well-known groups of lines, which for various reasons are considered to be especially characteristic of an element, are actually represented. If these groups are absent, an apparent coincidence with certain less characteristic lines belonging to the same element should be regarded with suspicion. In the case of gases, the comparison is effected by the aid of vacuum tubes, in which the gas, usually at low pressure, is illuminated by an electric discharge. Thus, the lines given by a hydrogen tube in the laboratory have been shown to coincide in position with lines ascribed to hydrogen in the sun. After many years of study of the solar spectrum by these methods, Rowland reached the conclusion that the chemical composition of the sun closely resembles that of the earth. Certain elements, such as gold and radium, iodine, sulfur and phosphorus, chlorine and nitrogen, have not been detected in the sun. But this does not prove that they are certainly absent, as their level in the solar atmosphere, or in the low degree of their absorptive effects, might prevent them from being represented. On the other hand, various substances not yet found on the Earth are shown by many unidentified lines of the solar spectrum to be present in the Sun. Some, if not all of these, will probably be discovered by chemists, just as helium was found by Ramsay in Clevite. Rowland remarked that if the Earth were heated to a sufficiently high temperature, it would give a spectrum closely resembling that of the Sun. End of section 4 Section 5 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 4. The Evolution of Astronomical Instruments and Methods, Celestial Photography. After the spectroscope, photography has been the most useful tool of the astronomer and to its aid must be credited some of the most important work of the latter half of the nineteenth century, for the development of celestial photography as outlined in the present chapter, an interesting paper by Professor E. E. Barnard supplies in large part the material. According to Professor Barnard, the application of photography to astronomy may be said to date from the very first announcement of Daguerre's wonderful discovery of the production of a permanent image by the effect of light upon silver salts. The celebrated French astronomer, Arago, quickly foresaw its great possibilities, especially in the faithful delineation of the surface features of the sun and the moon, for these two objects at least were bright enough to register themselves with the sluggish materials then in use. It was of course obvious to astronomers and physicists that the formation of an image on a sensitized plate was in no way different from that produced at its focus by the telescope lens, and that the image of a celestial body would be produced as well as any other. It was from America that the first practical work came, and, within less than one year from the announcement of Daguerre's discovery, in March 1840, Dr. John W. Draper of New York City succeeded in getting pictures of the moon which, though not very good, foreshadowed the possibilities of lunar photography. Five years later, at the Harvard College Observatory, Bond, with the aid of Messrs. Wilpel and Black of Boston, succeeded in obtaining still better pictures of the moon with the 15-inch refractor. These pictures on daguerreotype plates aroused great interest, 
especially in England. However, the difficulties encountered led to failures generally, except in the case of De La Rue, Dancer, and one or two others. In 1858, De La Rue, using a 13-inch metal speculum, reflecting telescope, without clockwork, and guiding it by following a lunar crater seen through a plate, made the most important of the early efforts at lunar photography. His photographs were the best until those made in America, in 1860, by Dr. Henry Draper, son of the illustrious John W. Draper. He secured excellent photographs of the moon, superior to any previously made, and capable of considerable enlargement. These pictures were the best taken until Lewis M. Rutherford began his remarkable work about 1865. His admirable photographs of the moon were made with a refractor of 11-inch aperture, which, constructed under his immediate supervision, was the first telescope corrected especially for the photographic rays. The completion of the Lick Observatory in 1888 marked another decided advance in astronomical photography, especially of the moon. The great focal length of this magnificent instrument gave an unenlarged image of the moon about six inches in diameter, which in itself was a great advantage. Good results were also secured with the Yerkes refractor. Admirable lunar photographs have been made by Messrs. Loewy and Prusseau with the equatorial coude at Paris and have shown the usefulness of this singular instrument for such work. The first picture of the sun seems to have been made on a daguerreotype plate by Fizeau and Foucault in 1845, says Professor Bernard. During the total eclipse of the sun on July 28, 1851, a daguerreotype was secured with the Königsberg heliometer, 2.4 inches in diameter and 2 feet focus, by Dr. Busch, which appears to have been the first photographic representation of the corona. It showed considerable detail quite close to the moon. But in the early eclipses photographic work seems to have been devoted mainly to representations of the solar prominences which at that time were as rarely seen as the corona itself. During the eclipse of 1869, however, Professor Himes secured a photograph which showed the brighter structure of the corona. Similar pictures were also obtained during the same eclipse by Mr. Whipple of Boston. The corona was also slightly shown on pictures made as early as 1860 by M. Surratt. None of them, however, showed more than slight traces of the corona, extending only for a few minutes of arc from the moon's limb. Nearly all the pictures seem to have been taken with an enlarging lens, which was doubtless used to get the prominences on a larger scale. The first really successful photographs of the corona were obtained at the eclipse of December 22, 1870, when it was shown on the plate to a distance of about half a degree from the moon's limb. This picture, made by Mr. Brothers at Syracuse, Sicily, showed a considerable amount of rich detail in the coronal structure, the same can also be said of the photographs of this eclipse taken by Colonel Tennant and Lord Lindsay's party. These seem to have been the first pictures that really showed the great value of photography for coronal delineation. The eclipse of 1871 was still more successfully photographed, and an excellent representation of the corona, full of beautiful detail, was secured. In 1878, extensive preparations were made to observe the eclipse of July 29 of that year, Photography was to play an important part, though astronomers did not rely very strongly upon it, for it appears that all were prepared to make the customary drawings of the corona. Unfortunately, each person faithfully carried out that purpose. A most suggestive illustration of the uncertainty of such work is found in the large collection of drawings published in a volume issued by the United States government relating to the eclipse of 1878. An examination of these forty or fifty pictures shows that scarcely any of them would be supposed to represent the same object, and none of them at all closely resembled the photographs. The method of freehand drawing of the corona, made under the attending conditions of a total eclipse, received its death blow at that time, for it showed the utter inability of the average astronomer to sketch or draw what he really saw under such circumstances. In the eclipses of 1882, 1886, and 1889, photography played a part of increasing importance in the observations. In the latter year, there were a large number of amateur photographers who took advantage of the eclipse to make many photographs which, in a number of cases, were taken in a systematic and scientific manner. At the Lick Observatory, a beginning was made in eclipse photography 
with an extemporized apparatus, and successful exposures were made. During the eclipse of 1896, important work was done in photographing the flash spectrum, or the momentary reversal of the Fraunhofer lines, which occurs when the edge of the sun disappears behind the moon, or reappears from it, and for an instant exposes the reversing layer, which was first seen by Professor Young at the eclipse of 1870. This photograph was made by a young Englishman, William Shackleton, who, on exposing a plate at the critical instant of the reversal of the lines, caught for the first time the fugitive bright lines, which are visible for only about a minute. This gave a permanent visible record of the phenomenon, which removes it from the class of hasty visual observations, whose results depend upon the memory of the observer. The photographing of such a minute point of light as a star is quite different from that of a luminous or brilliant body like the sun or moon, yet it was early essayed, and, from the first photograph of a star by Bond in 1850 to the present time, stellar photography has gradually risen to a prominence as remarkable as it is important. Indeed, it is now quite indispensable. The principal reason for the real increase of importance in this work, however, was the successful introduction of the very rapid dry plate. The wet or collodion process, which astronomers soon pushed to its limits, was poorly adapted to the photography of the stars, and of no use whatever for comets and nebulae. Notwithstanding the inherent difficulties of the wet plate, the photographs of the star clusters, etc., of the southern skies, obtained under the direction of Gould, with an eleven-inch photographic reflector by the wet process, were of the highest value, and showed upon measurement a striking agreement in accuracy with visual work. The same can be said of Rutherford's photographs of the Pleiades, Praesepi, etc., which were made prior to Dr. Gould's, and which were the first photographs of this kind. As early as 1857, Bond had shown, by measurement of a series of photographs of the double star Mizar, that the highest confidence could be placed in measures of star plates. This was subsequently fully verified by Gill, Elkin, and others. As regards absolute accuracy, Dr. Elkin showed in 1889 that measures of a photograph of the Pleiades taken by Mr. Burnham with the great telescope at Mount Hamilton had equal value with the heliometer measures of the same stars. By 1881 or 1882, however, dry or gelatin emulsion plates were beginning to be used with every promise of their ultimate value, as was shown by the photographs of the Comet of 1881, which were made by Draper and Janssen. These were the first photographs ever made of a comet. Efforts had been made to secure pictures of Donati's Comet in 1858, but without success. It was quite obvious that as soon as satisfactory photographs of stars were secured, some earnest effort would be made to make use of them in a quantitative and systematic way. Previously, for the production of star maps and catalogues, elaborate series of observations were made at the various observatories, and the positions of the stars computed and incorporated in large volumes. At the Royal Observatory at the Cape of Good Hope, Sir David Gill, in 1882, after making some pictures with a large camera of the comet of that year, found that not only did the plate show the stars visible to the naked eye, but a number as small as the ninth or tenth magnitude. Accordingly, it occurred to him that such photographs furnished a novel and excellent method of cataloging the stars and mapping the heavens, as it was necessary only to measure on the glass negatives the position of the various stars and refer them to certain well-known points of reference. From 1887 to 1891, the entire southern heavens, from 18 degrees south declination to the celestial pole, were duly photographed. The half-million stars found on the negatives were then measured, and the magnitude of each determined by Professor J. C. Captain at the University of Groningen, Holland. Thus, in 1899, was finished the Cape Photographic Durchmusterung, which is published in three quarto volumes, and contains the magnitude and approximate position of every star photographed, the magnitude of the stars on each plate being reduced to a visual scale. At the time when Sir David Gill began his photographic work, Dr. Bernard states, the Henry brothers of Paris were making a chart of the stars along the elliptic in their search for planetoids. They had at this time reached the region of the Milky Way, and the marvelous wealth of stars they encountered on entering the boundaries of that vast zone completely discouraged them from carrying their charts through the rich region 
traversed by the elliptic. While hesitating as to the advisability of continuing their work, the photographs of the great comet came to their notice. They were struck with the great number of stars shown on these pictures together with the image of the comet. The idea at once occurred to them that they could use this wonderful process to make their charts. They began at once the construction, with their own hands, of a suitable photographic telescope of thirteen and a half inches diameter for the photography of the stars. This instrument produced exquisite star pictures, which were marvels of definition, as well as photographs of the nebulae, of Saturn and Jupiter, the moon, etc. It was the success of the Henry Brothers' work that led to the International Astrophotographic Congress, which met at Paris in 1886. This Congress undertook the organization of an international commission engaged in the preparation of a photographic chart and catalogue of the heavens, and the work since that time has been actively in progress. Uniform instruments of the same aperture and focal length are used at the 18 observatories participating in this work, and two sets of plates are being made, one to include all the stars that are capable of being photographed, and the other one those of the eleventh magnitude. With this photographic map, astronomers anywhere can compile their own catalogues, and portions of such catalogues by various national observatories have already been issued. The method of preparing the chart consists in photographing the whole sky upon glass plates about eight inches square. Each observatory has had assigned to it definitely its part of the sky, and about 11,000 plates of the size specified will be required to complete the task. Each plate, of course, carries one or more well-determined catalog stars, whose position is known with accuracy, so that from such points of reference it is possible to determine exactly the position of any other star on the plate. The photographic plate not only did away with the necessity of making the star charts by eye and hand, so essential to facilitate the discovery of planetoids, but it also did away with the necessity of the charts themselves for that purpose. The little planet, which is moving among the stars, now registers its own discovery by leaving a short trail, its path during the exposure, on the photographic plate. The first of these photographic discoveries of planetoids was made by Dr. Max Wolff in 1892, and his observatory at Heidelberg subsequently became a headquarters for discoveries of this kind. Planetoids are now found wholesale in this manner by photography. In the early days of photography, nebulae were considered the most unpromising subject for the photographic plate to deal with. Most of these objects appeared so faint that but little encouragement in the direction was offered the celestial photographer. One of the brightest and most promising of the nebulae is that in the sword of Orion, and this was naturally one of the first of these objects to receive photographic attention. In September 1880, Dr. Henry Draper began photographing nebulae with this object and succeeded, with 51 minutes exposure, in getting a good picture of the brighter portions on dry plates. This was the first nebulae photograph. It was followed by other photographs, one of which showed stars down to the 14.7 magnitude, which were visually beyond the reach of the same telescope. These pictures marked a new era in the study of nebulae. When the results were communicated to the French Academy by Dr. Draper, Janssen took up the work with a reflecting telescope, having a silver-on-glass mirror of very short focus, constructed in 1870 for the total solar eclipse of 1871. With this, Janssen found it easy to photograph the brightest parts of a nebula with comparatively short exposures. Unfortunately for science, the death of Dr. Draper in 1882 put a stop in America to the work he had inaugurated, but it was at once taken up in England by Common, who, with a three-foot reflector, attained rapid and immediate success. His photographs of the great nebula of Orion are still classic. They were a great advance over the work of Draper, for the reflector was not only a larger telescope, but was also better adapted for photographic purposes, and especially for photographing nebulae. In fact, as we shall see in a later chapter on nebulae, much of the progress in their study has been due to photography. The photography of nebulae was carried on with remarkable success at Lick Observatory during the incumbency of Professor James E. Keeler as director. Using the Crossley Reflecting Telescope, presented to the observatory by Dr. Common, he made a photographic study of nebulae and reached the conclusion that there are at least 120,000 of the spiral type within the range of this instrument. Professor Perrine, 
who succeeded to this work on the death of Professor Keeler, believes that half a million is nearer the figure, and that with more sensitive photographic plates and longer exposures the number of spirals would exceed a million. Not only stellar motion, but stellar distances can be measured by photography. Professor Pritchard, at Oxford, has used the sensitive plate to sound the celestial depths. His first experiments were undertaken with the star 61 Cygni, and by measuring 200 negatives which had been made in 1886, he derived for that star a parallax of 0 0.438 seconds, which was in satisfactory agreement with Ball's value of 0 0.468 seconds. This work was subjected to detailed scrutiny, and the Astronomer Royal was convinced that it was more accurate than that of Bessel's results obtained with a heliometer. This was the beginning of the method of measuring a parallax from photographic plates. Professor Kaptine showed in 1889 that from such plates, exposed at desired intervals, parallaxes could be derived wholesale. He applied his system in 1900 to a group of 248 stars with encouraging success. In fact, it was suggested that a photographic parallax, Dirk Musterung, should be undertaken after the completion of the astrographical chart of the heavens. When used in connection with the spectroscope, the photographic plate has a field singularly suited to display its possibilities. Here it deals not alone with what can be seen, but it enters into regions where the eye takes no cognizance of things. For though it is partly blind to the light which affects the eye, it can readily penetrate the regions where man, in turn, is blind. By special treatment of the plate, photography registers those rays invisible to the eye and permits their accurate measurement. The spectrograph, or combination of photographic apparatus with spectroscope, must be so arranged as to show with distinctness the greatest number of lines, the individual lines being separated. Consequently, there are various types of spectrograph, depending upon the purpose for which they are to be employed. One of the combinations of the spectroscope with the photographic apparatus is found in Professor Hale's spectroheliograph, which consists of a spectroscope across whose slit the solar image moves at a uniform speed. Instead of the eyepiece, there is a second slit which permits light from only a single line to pass and fall upon the moving photographic plate, so that an image of the sun or a sunspot in light of a single wavelength can be made to fall upon the plate and thus be recorded. The general effect of photography in astronomy may be summarized in the brief statement that it has removed the astronomer from the eyepiece of the telescope and has substituted the more sensitive photographic plate with its permanent record. Hence it is that the present-day student of astrophysics does not correspond with the traditional idea of the astronomer, says Professor Hale. His work at the telescope is largely confined to such tasks as keeping a star at the precise intersection of two crosshairs, or in the narrow slit of a spectrograph, in order that stars and nebulae, or their spectra, may be sharply recorded upon the photographic plate. His most interesting work is done, and most of his discoveries are made, when the plates have been developed and are subjected to long study under the microscope. End of section 5《Section 6 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rold Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 5. The Law of Gravitation. When the astronomers of old tried to account for the apparent motions of the heavenly bodies by complete systems of epicycles, they must surely have asked themselves, why do the planets move so regularly? What makes them move thus? If they did, they troubled themselves but little to answer the inquiries in anything but a perfunctory way. For the most part they were content to regard the stars as the playthings of divinity, and the cause of their motions, therefore, as a mystery forever veiled to human eyes. Still one astronomer, Anaxagoras, did have some idea of a force which holds the planets in their orbits, and which might be the same as that which operates upon substances at the surface of the earth. After his day, possibly 499 to 427 B.C., 
The idea seems not to have been expressed by any one until the awakening of science in the seventeenth century. Then Kepler darkly hinted at some attractive force, because his discovery of the mathematical curve described by the planets seemed to demand the existence of some constantly exerted controlling force, and also because he had read Gilbert's De Magnete, in which he was made acquainted with the phenomena of electrical attraction. Such a force, as he had in mind, would act to maintain the motion of the planets and to drive them along in their orbits, but this was hardly the solution of the problem, since, as Galileo found, the motion of a body itself must continue indefinitely unless there is some cause at work to alter or stop it. This formed the first and most important of the laws of motion which, if not independently discovered by Newton, were subsequently to be stated by him with greater force and conciseness. The laws were of primary importance, because they afforded a new and correct way of considering not only the underlying reasons for the motions of the planets, but of all mechanical problems involving matter and motion. Aside from the three great laws of planetary motion established by Kepler as the result of many observations, the most important lesson taught by him, and one that was readily learned by Newton, was that the motions of the planets were not to be attributed to the influence of mere geometrical points, such as the centers of the old epicycles, but to the actual presence of other bodies. Kepler suggested, in particular, that the planets might be considered as connected with the sun, and therefore as sharing to some extent the sun's motion of revolution. From the sun emanated that special kind of influence which he assumed. Yet, while Kepler considered the sun as the source of this hypothetical force, he believed in a more general gravity or attraction between bodies. He was unfortunate enough, however, to conceive of it diminishing simply in proportion to the distance between the two bodies, a mathematical impossibility, as was demonstrated by Newton. This is the more surprising as he had demonstrated that the intensity of light was reciprocally proportional to the surface over which it was spread, and that it varied inversely as the square of the distance from the luminous body. It was also unfortunate that, while Kepler's ideas of the nature of gravity were sound and accurate in many respects, they bore no particular logical connection, either one with another or with his theory of planetary motion. They are, however, worthy of comment as indicating the situation before Newton took these and other speculative ideas, and the three isolated laws of planetary motion, and bound them together into one beautiful doctrine which must underlie all astronomical science. Kepler, in his work, Commentaries on the Motions of Mars, definitely states that gravity is a corporal affection, reciprocal between two bodies of the same kind, which tends, like the action of a magnet, to bring them together. When the earth attracts a stone, the stone at the same time attracts the earth, but by a force feebler in proportion as it contains a smaller quantity of matter. He then proceeds to state that if the moon and earth were not retained in their respective orders by an animal or other equivalent force, the earth would mount toward the moon one fifty-fourth part of the interval which separates the two, and the moon would descend the fifty-three remaining parts, supposing it to have the same density. This idea of gravity, according to Kepler, was indeed general and served to explain the cause of the tides, as is clearly indicated in the following passage. If the earth ceased to attract its waters, the whole sea would mount up and unite itself with the moon. The sphere of the attracting force of the moon extends even to the earth and draws the waters towards the torrid zone, so that they rise to the point which is the moon in the zenith. After Kepler had promulgated his famous laws of planetary motion, many minds independently conceived a force to account for the remarkable uniformity of that motion. Thus the idea occurred to Robert Hooke, to Christopher Wren, and perhaps to Edmund Halley, who was Newton's most intimate friend, and who probably did more than any other man of his time to popularize the idea of universal gravitation. It remained for the towering genius of Sir Isaac Newton, 1643 to 1727, to formulate into a mathematical law of gravitation the effect of that universal force with which every schoolboy is now acquainted. The honor of having anticipated Newton was claimed by Hooke, 
and the two entered into an acrimonious controversy. Hook never brought forward convincing proof of his claims. So far as Newton is concerned, the great merit of his work lay not so much in conceiving the law of gravitation as in his brilliant demonstration of its truth. Starting with Kepler's laws of planetary motion, he showed not only that they were true, which was hardly a task of merit after Kepler had considered the observations of Tycho Brahe and all other astronomers whose recorded observations would throw any light on the subject, but why those laws were true, and why no other laws could have accounted for the conditions actually observed in the motion of the planets. And, furthermore, underlying these famous planetary laws he discovered must be the attraction of gravitation. By a mathematical analysis unrivaled in the history of astronomy, he proved his theorem completely. Not only did he suggest, as did Kepler, that the power of attraction resided in the sun, but he proved mathematically that as a necessary consequence of that attraction, every planet must revolve in an elliptical orbit around the sun, having the sun as one focus, and that the radius of the planet's orbit must sweep over equal areas in equal times, and that in comparing the movements of two planets it is necessary that the squares of the periodic times be proportional to the cubes of the mean distances. These facts were discovered by Kepler. They were explained by Newton, with the aid of the powerful and celebrated mathematical reasoning which he had created. The explanation was the law of gravitation. It occurred to Newton that if a diagram of the path of the moon for any given period, say one minute, be made, it would be found that the moon departs from a straight line during that period by a measurable distance. In other words, the moon has been virtually pulled toward the earth by an amount that is represented by the difference between its actual position at the end of the minute and the position it would occupy if it had moved in a straight line, which according to Galileo's law of motion, it should follow unless some external force deflected it. By measuring the amount of deflection, he had a basis for determining the amount of the deflecting force. This deflection Newton found by his calculation to be 13 feet. Obviously, the force that acted on the moon made it fall toward the earth a distance of 13 feet during the first minute of its fall. Galileo had shown that the rapidity of a body's fall to the earth increased at a uniform rate, what is now termed the acceleration of gravity. In other words, the higher the starting point of the fall, the greater would be the final velocity. Hence, the amount of the attracting force is in some way related to the distance between the two bodies, a relation which Newton expressed by stating that the falling body is attracted to the earth by a force which varies inversely as the square of the distance between them. If the attracting force then varies inversely as the square of the distance, would the moon drop toward the earth at the calculated rate of 13 feet in the first minute? That was the problem which presented itself to Newton. The mathematical solution was simple, based as it was on a comparison of the moon's distance with the length of the earth's radius. Unfortunately, there were no accurate dimensions of the earth available when Newton made his first calculation in 1666. Hence he found, on the basis of the erroneous data at his disposal, that the moon fell toward the earth 15 instead of 13 feet during the first minute, a discrepancy so great that he dismissed the matter from his mind. When in 1682 his attention was called to a new and apparently accurate measurement of a degree of the Earth's meridian made by the French astronomer Picard, he attacked the problem anew. As he proceeded with his computation, it became more and more certain that this time the result harmonized with the observed facts. So completely was he overwhelmed that he was forced to ask a friend to complete the simple calculation. When the computation was ended, it was known that the force which causes bodies to fall to the earth extends outward to the moon, and that by reason of this force the moon circles around the earth. It required but a slight stretch of the imagination to assume that a force which can span the distance between the earth and the moon may also span the distance from the sun to the earth, and the other members of the solar system. That such is really the case, Newton proved by a mathematical calculation of the orbital motions of Jupiter's satellites and of the various planets. These discoveries and fundamental principles, enunciated by Newton, were elaborated with great exactness in his Principia, 
and the section which discusses the motions of the moon, confessedly one of the most difficult problems in celestial mechanics, has been termed by Sir George Airy the greatest chapter on physical science ever written. That it has stood the test of time is demonstrated by the fact that Newton's results have scarcely been extended in the centuries which have elapsed since their publication. The entire work is a marvel of exact mathematical reasoning by the greatest genius the world has ever produced, according to Lagrange's estimate of Newton's intellectual powers. Galileo had experimentally shown before Newton that the rate at which two bodies fall to the ground from equal heights is independent of their weights. A mass of gold and a mass of lead, although of unequal weight, reach the earth at the same time, if dropped simultaneously from the same height. Newton repeated the experiment very exactly. He realized as a result that weight, gravitation, is constant. Because a pound of lead weighs less than two pounds of lead, in other words, is attracted with one-half the force, merely for the reason that it contains less matter, he was forced to the conclusion that gravitation is dependent upon quantity of matter as well as distance. Thus he introduced the very difficult conception of mass as distinguished from weight, or the force of attraction exerted on it by the earth. The former, of course, is absolute and constant, but the latter varies with the position of the material in question on the earth's surface or elsewhere in the universe. If the mass of Venus is seven times that of Mars, then the force with which the sun attracts Venus is seven times as great as that with which it would attract Mars, if placed at the same distance. And therefore also the force with which Venus attracts the sun is seven times as great as that with which Mars would attract the sun, if at an equal distance from it. Hence, in all cases of attraction, the force is proportional not only to the mass of the attracted body, but also to that of the attracting body, as well as being inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Gravitation thus appears no longer as a property peculiar to the central body of a revolving system, but as belonging to a planet in just the same way as to the sun and to the moon, or to a stone in just the same way as to the earth. Moreover, the fact that separate bodies on the surface of the earth are attracted by the earth, and therefore in turn attract it, suggests that this power of attracting other bodies, which the celestial bodies are shown to possess, does not belong to each celestial body as a whole, but to the separate particles of which it is composed, so that, for example, the force with which Jupiter and the Sun attract each other is the result of compounding the forces with which the separate particles making up Jupiter attract the separate particles making up the Sun. Thus is suggested, finally, the law of gravitation in its most general form. Every particle of matter attracts every other particle with a force proportional to the mass of each and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. When Newton completed his Principia, astronomy became in the fullest sense an exact science. Given the positions, velocities, and motions of the sun, earth, moon, and other planets, then the manner in which they interact on one another can be learned, and even their form and dimensions determined. In short, astronomy, from a more or less mystical science, became in earnest a mathematical science. When the motions and orbits of heavenly bodies were once observed, the positions of these bodies could be computed for future epochs. In his Principia, Newton confines himself to the demonstration of the laws of gravitation. He says nothing about the means by which bodies are made to gravitate toward each other. His mind did not rest on this point. He felt that gravitation itself must be capable of being explained. It is known that he even suggested an explanation depending on the action of an ethereal medium pervading space. But with that wise moderation, which is characteristic of all his investigations, he distinguished such speculations from what he had established by observation and demonstration, and excluded from his Principia all mention of the cause of gravitation, reserving his thoughts on this subject for the queries printed at the end of his Optics. The attempts which have been made since the time of Newton to solve this difficult question are few in number, and have not yet led to any well-established result. End of Section 6 
Section 7 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Labonte. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 6. The Solar System planetary distances. To the ancients, as well as to the moderns, the sun and the moon appeared not only the largest, but the most important of all the celestial bodies. With the sun and moon, five other conspicuous spheres eventually were linked, spheres distinguished by reason of their regular motions. These orbs, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, were named planets, or wanderers, to distinguish them from the fixed stars. Venus, familiar as the evening star or the morning star, was discovered, it is claimed, by Pythagoras in the 6th century BC, but even in the poems of Homer there are references to both stars without any indication of their identity. Jupiter, Venus, Mars, and Saturn, ranking with the brightest of the stars, and Mercury, occasionally seen near the horizon just after sunset or before sunrise. All were known to the ancients. A study of their movements naturally led to the obvious conclusion that all these moving stars or planets were related in some way and that the motion of one was more or less dependent on the motions of the others. Hence it may be asserted that the ancient history of astronomy begins with the system of planets that revolve around the sun. What is the nature of these planets? Obviously, they are not all alike in size or distance. Even to the naked eye, their appearance seems to reveal conditions that need explanation. Early observation and study revealed the fact that the planets occupied a section of the heavens where there were no so-called fixed stars. But later observation also revealed that associated with the planets are a number of smaller bodies of much the same nature known as planetoids or asteroids, which, with a single exception, occupy the zone of the heavens between Mars and Jupiter. Lastly, there are a large number of temporary visitors to this solar system, known as the comets. They plunge in from space, sweep around the sun, and drift away by various paths or orbits, most of them never to return. Planets, satellites, planetoids, and comets comprise the solar system. Vast and marvelously complete as that system is, it must be admitted that it is but a part of the great universe. It may be, as there is some reason to suppose, that this solar system is but one of many similar systems scattered throughout the universe, and that each of these, including that in which the Earth is situate, is in turn wheeling about some central orb inexpressibly distant. The solar system to which the Earth belongs is merely a type and not a unique example of planetary order. The intellectual rise in astronomy is nowhere more clearly revealed than in the history of man's conception of the solar system. Perhaps the first inquiry that must have flashed across the mind of a thinking Chaldean or Greek concerned itself with the distances of the heavenly bodies. How far away are the planets? How is their distance measured? The second question concerned itself with their motions. Whither do they drift and why? Around these questions cluster a group of vague guesses, fruitless speculations and poetic fancies, from which at last a scientific method was evolved for measuring planetary distances and accounting for planetary movements. It was not until comparatively late in astronomical history that means were devised for ascertaining the physical condition of each planet. The distances of the planets, small as they seem in comparison with the sidereal measurements, are felt to be immense, using only round numbers which are sufficiently accurate for the present purpose. The planet Neptune, the outermost known member of our system, is 2,800,000,000 miles from the Sun. In a cord 28 feet long, each single foot will represent a 100 million miles. 
On such a scale, a map of the United States could not be seen without the aid of a microscope. Suppose a bead were placed at each end of this line, one representing the sun, the other Neptune. Between the two, other beads will represent the other planets. One nearly four inches from that representing the sun will be Mercury. Another at about seven inches, Venus. A third at eleven inches, the Earth. A fourth at seventeen inches, Mars. A fifth at about five feet, Jupiter. A sixth at nine feet, Saturn. A seventh at eighteen feet, Uranus. And an eighth, Neptune, at the end. The mean distances of the planets from the Sun are as follows. Mercury, 36 million miles. Venus, 67,200,000 miles. Earth, 92,900,000 miles. Mars, 141,500,000 miles. Jupiter, 483,300,000 miles. Saturn, 886 million miles. Uranus, 1,781,900,000 miles. Neptune, 2,791,600,000 miles. Attempts to measure some of these distances approximately are found in early times. The idea that some of the planets must be nearer the Earth than others must have been suggested by eclipses and occultations, in other words, passage of the moon over the sun and over a planet or fixed star. No direct means being available for determining the distance, rapidity of motion anciently was employed as a test of probable nearness. The stars being seen above, it was but natural to think of the most distant celestial bodies as the highest, and accordingly Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars, being beyond the Sun, were called superior planets, as distinguished from the two inferior planets, Venus and Mercury. Uranus and Neptune are modern additions to the solar system and could not have been included in the hypothesis. Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, for example, arrived at the conclusion that the planets are farther off than the sun and moon as the result of an occultation of Mars by the moon and as the result of similar observations made in the case of other planets by the Egyptians and Babylonians. Ptolemy, 2nd century AD, although far more original and daring in his astronomical conceptions than Aristotle, was able to add but little toward a solution of the problem. He expressly states that he had no means of estimating numerically the distances of the planets or even of knowing the order of the distance of the several planets. He followed tradition in conjecturally accepting rapidity of motion as a test of nearness and placed Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, which performed the circuit of the celestial sphere in about 2, 12, and 29 years respectively, beyond the Sun in that order as Venus and Mercury accompany the Sun and may therefore be regarded as on the average performing their revolutions in a year. The test, to some extent, failed in their case, but Ptolemy again accepted the opinion of the ancient mathematicians, probably the Chaldeans, that Mercury and Venus lie between the Sun and Moon, Mercury being the nearer to the Earth. Copernicus gave the first glimpse of the truth, to quote Berry in his short history of astronomy, Quote, from the fact that Venus and Mercury were never seen very far from the Sun, it could be inferred that their paths were nearer to the Sun than that of the Earth, Mercury being the nearer to the Sun of the two, because never seen so far from it in the sky as Venus, the other three planets being seen at times in a direction opposite to that of the Sun must necessarily revolve around the Sun in orbits larger than that of the Earth a view confirmed by the fact that they were brightest when opposite the Sun, in which positions they would be nearest to us. The order of their respective distances from the Sun could be at once inferred from the disturbing effects produced on their apparent motions by the motion of the Earth. Saturn, being least affected, must on the whole be farthest from the Earth, Jupiter next and Mars next, the Earth thus became one of six planets revolving round the Sun, 
the order of distance Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, being also in accordance with the rates of motion round the Sun, Mercury performing its revolution most rapidly in about 88 days, Saturn most slowly in about 30 years." Unquote. It was not until John Kepler, 1571 to 1630, published his Epitome of the Copernican Astronomy, his Harmony of the World, and a treatise on comets, that astronomers were given a definite formula which enabled them to determine planetary distances with any exactitude. Kepler's speculative and mystic temperament led him constantly to search for relations between the various numerical quantities occurring in the solar system. By a happy inspiration, he tried to discover a relation between the sizes of the orbits of the various planets and their times of revolution around the sun. After a number of unsuccessful attempts, he discovered a simple and important relation commonly known as Kepler's third law. Quote, the squares of the times of revolution of any two planets, including the Earth, about the Sun are proportional to the cubes of their mean distances from the Sun. Unquote. In other words, given the periods, there is need only to find the interval between any two of them in order to infer at once the distance separating them all from one another and from the Sun. Here was the plan. What was next? to be discovered was the scale upon which the plan was to be drawn. There must be first a trustworthy measure of the distance of a single planet from the Sun, the Earth for example, and the problem would be solved. How is this measure to be obtained? Sir Robert Ball, in his Story of the Heavens, gives this simple example for partial explanation. Quote, Stand near a window where you can look at buildings or at any distant object. Place on the glass a thin strip of paper vertically in the middle of one of the panes. Close the right eye and note with the left eye the position of the strip of paper relatively to the objects in the background. Then, while still remaining in the same position, close the left eye and again observe the position of the strip of paper with the right eye. You will find that the position of the paper on the background has changed. Move closer to the window and repeat the observation and you find that the apparent displacement of the strip increases. Move away from the window and the displacement decreases. Move to the other side of the room, the displacement is much less, though probably still visible. We thus see that the change in the apparent place of the strip of paper as viewed with the right eye or the left eye varies in amount as the distance changes but it varies in the opposite way to the distance, for as either becomes greater, the other becomes less. We can thus associate with each particular distance a corresponding particular displacement. From this, it will be easy to infer that if we have the means of measuring the amount of displacement, then we have the means of calculating the distance from the observer to the window. It is this principle, applied on a gigantic scale, which enables us to measure the distances of the heavenly bodies. Look, for instance, at the planet Venus. Let this correspond to the strip of paper, and let the sun, on which Venus is seen in the act of transit, be the background. Instead of the two eyes of the observer, we now place two observatories in distant regions of the Earth. We look at Venus from one observatory. We also look at it from the other. We measure the amount of displacement, and from that we calculate the distance of the planet. All depends then on the means which we have of measuring the displacement of Venus as viewed from the two different stations." Unquote. Two observers standing upon the Earth must be some thousands of miles apart in order to see the position of the Moon altered with regard to the starry background to obtain the necessary data upon which to ground their calculations. The change of position thus offered by one side of the Earth's surface at a time is not sufficient, however, to displace any but the nearest celestial bodies. When there is occasion to go farther afield, a greater change of place must be sought. This can be obtained as a consequence of the Earth's movement around the Sun. Observations taken several days apart will show the effect of the Earth's change of place during the interval upon the positions 
of the other bodies in our system. But when the depths of space beyond are to be sounded and an effort is made to reach out for the purpose of measuring the distance of the nearest star, the utmost change of place is necessitated. This results from the long journey of many millions of miles which the Earth performs around the Sun during the course of each year. Still, even this last change of place, great as it seems in comparison with terrestrial measurements, is insufficient to show anything more than the tiniest displacements in a paltry 43 out of the entire host of stars. It is thus readily realized with what an enormous disadvantage the ancients coped. The measuring instruments at their command were utterly inadequate to detect such small displacements. It was reserved for the telescope to reveal them, and even then it required the great telescopes of recent times to show the slight changes in the position of the nearer stars, which were caused by the Earth's being at one time at one end of its orbit, and some six months later at the other end, stations separated by a gulf of about 186 million miles. It was from an opposition of Mars observed in 1672 by John Richter, unknown date of birth to 1696, at Cayenne in concert with Giovanni Domenici Cassini at Paris, that the first scientific estimate of the sun's distance was derived. The sun appeared to be nearly 87 million miles away. John Flamsteed, 1646 to 1720, the first astronomer royal of England, deduced 81,700,000 from his independent observations of the same occurrence. John Picard's, 1620 to 1682, later result was just one half Flamsteed's, 41 million. Philippe de la Hire thought that the earth must be separated from the sun by at least 136 million miles. The transits of Venus in 1761 and 1769 were employed after other attempts had been made to measure the sun's distance. The transit of 1769 is of particular interest not only for a fairly good determination of the sun's distance, but also for the reason that the celebrated Captain Cook was commissioned to sail to Otaheite for the purpose of witnessing the transit of Venus. At Otaheite, on June 3rd, the phenomenon was carefully observed and measured. Simultaneously with these observations, others were obtained in Europe and elsewhere. From a combination of all the observations, an approximate knowledge of the sun's distance was gained. The most complete discussion of these observations did not, however, take place for some time. It was not until the year 1824 that the illustrious Johann Franz Enke computed the distance of the sun and gave, as the definite result, 95 million miles. Later, Urbain Jean-Joseph Le Verrier, 1870, reduced the estimate to 91,320,000 miles, which held good until Professor Simon Newcomb in 1882 gave the figure 92,475,000 miles. In 1900, nearly all the observatories of the world, under the direction of Maurice Levy of the French Academy of Science, began a new computation which will lead to more exact results. The old problem of measuring a planet's distance from the sun is not yet completely solved. If Sir David Gill's plan of basing a new set of calculations on the opposition of Eros in 1931 is carried into execution, the sun's distance will be ascertained to within 10,000 miles. Present knowledge declares the distance of the planets from the sun with an error not exceeding 1 50th of 1%. End of section 7. Section 8 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fred Abood. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt-Wheeler. Astronomy, 
Chapter 7 The Solar System The Motions of the Planets The motions of the planets also formed the basis for archaic theorizing. That the planets move, the ancients were fully aware, for the very word planet means wanderer. The strip of the celestial sphere through which moved the sun, the moon, and the five planets known to the ancients, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, was called the Zodiac, because the constellations in it were named after living things, with one exception. The Zodiac was divided into twelve equal parts, the signs of the Zodiac, through one of which the sun passed every month, so that its position could be roughly given by stating in what sign it was. The stars in each sign were formed into a constellation, the sign and the constellation each receiving the same name. The relative movements of the planets, as the ancients conceived them, are thus summarized by Berry. In Pythagoras occurs, perhaps, for the first time an idea which had an extremely important influence on ancient and medieval astronomy. Not only were the stars supposed to be attached to a crystal sphere, which revolved daily on an axis through the Earth, but each of the seven planets, the Sun and Moon being included, moved on a sphere of its own. The distances of these spheres from the Earth were fixed in accordance with certain speculative notions of Pythagoras as to numbers and music. Hence, the spheres as they revolved produced harmonious sounds which specially gifted persons might at times hear. This is the origin of the idea of the music of the spheres which recurs continually in medieval speculation and is found occasionally in modern literature. At a later stage these spheres of Pythagoras were developed into a scientific representation of the motions of the celestial bodies, which remained the basis of astronomy till the time of Kepler. Philolaus, the Pythagorean, who lived about a century after his master, introduced for the first time the idea of the motion of the earth. He appears to have regarded the earth, as well as the sun, moon, and five planets, as revolving around some central fire, the earth rotating on its own axis as it revolved, apparently in order to ensure that the central fire should always remain invisible to the inhabitants of the known part of the earth. Although pure fancy, the idea of Philolaus was a valuable contribution to astronomical thought. Despite the immense influence of the Pythagoreans, most Greeks shared Plato's idea that any careful study of celestial motions was degrading rather than elevating, for the whole subject smacked too much of the unesthetic section of geometry. Still, Plato, 429 to 347 BC, did give a short account of the celestial bodies, according to which the sun, moon, planets, and fixed stars revolve on eight concentric and closely fitting wheels or circles around an axis passing through the earth. This idea of Plato's was more or less followed by later philosophers. Thus, Eudocius of Sinaitis, 409 to 356 BC, attempted to explain the more obvious peculiarities of planetary motion by means of a combination of uniform circular motions. The celestial motions were to some extent explained by means of a system of 27 spheres, one for the stars, six for the sun and moon, 20 for the planets. There is no clear evidence that Eudocious made any serious attempt to arrange either the size or the time of revolution of the spheres, so as to produce a precise agreement with the observed motion of the celestial bodies, though he knew with considerable accuracy the time required by each planet to return to the same position 
with respect to the sun. In other words, his scheme represented the celestial motions qualitatively, but not quantitatively. Aristotle adopted the scheme of Eudocius, but needlessly complicated it by treating the spheres as material bodies and added 22 more spheres, thus making 56 in all. He argues against the possibility of the Earth's revolving around the Sun on the ground that there ought to be a corresponding apparent motion of the stars, an objection finally disposed of only during the 19th century when it was discovered that this motion can be seen only in a few cases because of the unutterably great distance of the stars. No substantial advance can be noted until Hipparchus, 160 to 125 BC, made an extensive series of observations with all the accuracy that his instruments would permit, and critically made use of old observations for comparison with later ones, so as to discover astronomical changes too slow to be detected in a single lifetime, an essentially modern method. He systematically employed a geometrical scheme, that of eccentrics and epicycles, for the representations of the motions of the sun and the moon, a mode suggested in substance by Apollonius, of Perga, who flourished in the 3rd century BC. The great services rendered to astronomy by Hipparchus can hardly be better expressed than in the words of the great French historian of astronomy, Delambre, who is in general no lenient critic. When we consider all that Hipparchus invented or perfected and reflect upon the number of his works and the mass of calculations which they imply. We must regard him as one of the most astonishing men of antiquity, and as the greatest of all in the sciences which are not purely speculative, and which require a combination of geometrical knowledge with a knowledge of phenomena to be observed only by diligent attention and refined instruments. The last great name encountered in tracing the record of changing conceptions of planetary motions is that of Ptolemy, 100 to 170 AD, whose reputation rests on his Almagest, which may be regarded as the astronomical gospel of the Middle Ages. Hipparchus, as we have seen, found the current representations of the planetary motions inaccurate and collected a number of new observations. These, with fresh observations of his own, Ptolemy employed in order to construct an improved planetary system. Following the idea of Hipparchus, Ptolemy thought that the sun and moon moved in circular orbits around the earth as a center. Ptolemy's chief work was to expand the system of epicycles so that it could explain discrepancies between theory and observation discrepancies overlooked or ignored by Hipparchus. The deviations of the planets from the ecliptic, for example, were accounted for by tilting up the planes of the epicycles. Thus, with the aid of the system of Hipparchus, supplemented with his own idea of tilting epicycles, he worked out with great care and labor the motions of the planets. Although the Hipparchian Platonic doctrine was framed on an extravagant estimate of the importance of the earth in the scheme of the heavens, yet it must be admitted that the apparent movements of the celestial bodies were thus accounted for with considerable accuracy. For 14 centuries, the Almagest was regarded as the final authority on all questions of astronomy and it may be considered as the loftiest piece of calculation appertaining to the ancient world. End of section 8
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Labonte. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler, Astronomy, Chapter 8, The Solar System, Modern Investigation, Part 1. The Ptolemaic system of astronomy was discredited only at an epoch nearly simultaneous with that of the discovery of the New World by Columbus. The true arrangement of the solar system was then expounded by Nicholas Copernicus, 1473-1543, to in the great work De Revolutionibus, to which he devoted his life. The first principle established by these labors showed the diurnal movement of the heavens to be due to the rotation of the earth on its axis. Copernicus pointed out the fundamental difference between real motions and apparent motions. He proved that the appearances presented in the daily rising and setting of the sun and the stars could be accounted for by the supposition that the earth rotated just as satisfactorily as by the more cumbrous supposition of Hipparchus and Ptolemy. He showed, moreover, that if the ancient supposition were true, the stars must have an almost infinite velocity, and declared that the rotation of the entire universe around the Earth was clearly preposterous. The second great principle, which has conferred immortal glory on Copernicus, assigned to the Earth its true position in the universe. Copernicus transferred the center, about which all the planets revolve, from the Earth to the Sun, and he established the somewhat crushing truth that the Earth is merely a planet pursuing a track between the paths of Venus and of Mars, and subordinated, like all the other planets, to the supreme sway of the Sun. This great revolution swept from astronomy those distorted views of the Earth's importance which arose, perhaps not unnaturally, from the fact that the observers chanced to live on this particular planet. Whether the actual services rendered by Copernicus are commensurate with his fame may be doubted. He labored under the weight of an ecclesiastical tradition that could not be abandoned without some risk. He was a bold man, indeed, who dared to overthrow or even to question orthodoxy and to diminish the Earth's overshadowing importance in the solar system. The Copernican system was not flawless either in theory or logic, and many objections could be made to it particularly by an astronomer who had observed and studied the movements of the heavenly bodies. After the example of the ancients, Copernicus assumed as an axiom the uniform circular motion of the planets, and as the only motions which are observed are in a state of incessant variation, he was obliged, in order to explain the inequalities, to suppose a different center for each of the orbits, the sun was placed within the orbit of each of the planets, but not in the center of any of them. In other words, he still adhered to a system of epicycles. Consequently, the sun performed no other office than to distribute light and heat. Excluded from any influence on the system, the sun became a stranger to all the motions. The fixed stars were alleged to be stationary, and it was necessary to suppose that they were almost infinitely distant inasmuch as they always seem to preserve the same position when viewed from the opposite sides of the Earth's orbit. While various astronomers showed some disposition to accept the Copernican teaching, most of them were bitterly opposed to it on ecclesiastical, traditionary, and scientific grounds. Tycho Brahe, 1546-1601, was the most distinguished of these opponents, being an indefatigable observer and practically the first to realize the value of continuous observation, he enriched astronomy by a star catalog and studies of the movements of the other heavenly bodies. Tycho accepted the Copernican conception of a central sun, but rejected the idea that the earth moved. Thus, he sought to effect a compromise between the Ptolemaic and Copernican systems. It was the study of a comet in 1577 that led Tycho to formulate his ideas of the solar system. He believed that the comet X, as shown in the accompanying diagram, was revolving around the sun at a distance greater than that of Venus, and assumed that both the sun C and the earth A were centers of revolving systems. 
the five planets revolving around the Sun and the entire system in turn moving around the Earth. This incorrect proposition, which was one of the least of Tycho Brahe's contributions to astronomical science, is significant, showing as it does how difficult it was for the principles of Copernicus firmly to establish themselves and planetary motion to be explained satisfactorily. Whatever Tycho may have thought of the Copernican system, his contemporary Galileo, 1564 to 1642, was willing to accept it. It has been shown how Galileo, with the telescope of his invention, was able to extend astronomical science and to introduce new methods of observation, which came naturally to one who was a leader in the experimental science of his time. But even before his work with the telescope, Galileo had adopted the astronomical views of Copernicus and collected arguments for their support. He was able in 1604 to confirm the discovery of Tycho Brahe that changes take place in the heavens beyond the planets and that there was an important region beyond the earth and its immediate surroundings. As was but natural, the use of the telescope broadened Galileo's horizon and true scientist that he was, he immediately brought to bear his new discoveries on the fundamental conceptions. Thus his discovery of the satellites revolving around Jupiter as the planets themselves revolved around the Sun not only rendered necessary the explanation of these new bodies but dealt a serious blow to the infallibility of Aristotle and Ptolemy, neither of whom had any idea of the existence of these satellites. Further support was given to the Copernican theory by the ocular demonstration of these satellites revolving around Jupiter and not dropping behind, just as the moon was required to move around the Earth. A mechanical difficulty brought forward by the opponents of the Copernican idea. As Galileo developed his astronomical ideas and discoveries, he naturally came into conflict with ecclesiastical authority and there began the unfortunate controversy as to the relative validity in scientific matters of observation and reasoning on the one hand and the authority of the church and Bible on the other. Controversies such as this were conspicuous in the latter part of Galileo's life. They culminated in his famous trial and formal abjuration of his alleged errors and in his conviction quote, of believing and holding the doctrines false and contrary to the holy and divine scriptures that the sun is the center of the world and that it does not move from east to west and that the earth does move and is not the center of the world also that an opinion can be held and supported as probable after it has been declared and decreed contrary to holy scriptures unquote. despite galileo's abjuration his general attitude toward the church and bible is contained in his approval of the saying of cardinal baronius quote, that the intention of the Holy Ghost is to teach us not how the heavens go, but how to go to heaven." Unquote. His attempts to explain and demonstrate the Copernican system in his great astronomical treatise, Dialogue on the Two Chief Systems of the World, the Ptolemaic and Copernican, led to his trial and conviction before the Inquisition. Kepler, another of Galileo's contemporaries, did more even than the great Italian to bring about a proper conception of the solar system and the motions of the planets. A student under Tycho, it was but natural that Kepler should have imbibed from his master a respect for systematic observation, regardless of the correctness or incorrectness of Copernican views. As a result, Kepler early adopted the Copernican doctrine, opposed though it was by his master. His observations led him to the conclusion, however, that even Copernicus had not revealed all the mysteries of planetary motion, and that the hypothetical circles in which the planets revolved around the sun, according to Copernicus, did not agree with the paths observed. Under the instruction of Tycho, Kepler addressed himself to the problems involved in the planet Mars, whose positions as seen in the sky were a combined result of its own motion and that of the Earth, as both move around the Sun. Actual observation of the planet and the consideration of various geometrical theories that suggested themselves eventually led to the conception that the path of the planet must be some form of an oval. Finally, Kepler reached the conclusion that instead of being circular, the planet's motion must lie in the simple curve known as an ellipse, 
and formed by taking an oblique section of a cone, while the circle has but a single center, the ellipse depends for its form upon two fixed points, each of which is termed a focus. It can be drawn by using two pins stuck in a sheet of paper and by inserting a pencil within a loop of string that also includes the two pins. The curve may be traced by moving the pencil while the string is kept taut. It will be found that if the two points are kept close together, the curve approaches and form a circle, while if they are separated, the figure becomes elongated and possesses what the mathematicians term greater eccentricity. At any rate, every point on the curve is such that the sum of its distance from the two foci is always the same. Kepler found that the sun was at one focus. When the planet was near that focus, it moved with greater velocity than when at the opposite part of its orbit. The speed of motion, however, was always proportional to the areas swept out by a straight line from the sun in equal intervals of time. In other words, they were formulated the now famous first and second laws of Kepler as follows. One, the planet describes an ellipse, the sun being in one focus. Two, the straight line joining the planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in any two equal intervals of time. Kepler not only established these laws for Mars, but immediately applied his principle to Earth and then claimed, without proof however, in his Epitome of the Copernican Astronomy that these two fundamental laws applied also to all the planets and to the motions of the moon. Accompanying these two laws was the third already discussed, in which it is stated that the squares of the times of revolution of any two planets, including the Earth, about the Sun are proportional to the cubes of their mean distances from the Sun. It was the disclosure of these wonderfully simple relations that laid the foundation for the Newtonian law of gravitation. Contemporary judgment, of course, could not anticipate the culmination of a later generation. What it could understand was that the first law of Kepler attacked one of the most time-honored of metaphysical conceptions, the Aristotelian idea that the circle is the perfect figure and that planetary motions, consequently, must be circular. Not even Copernicus had doubted the validity of this assumption. Kepler was too great a genius to rest content with the mere observation that the planets move in ellipses. Next he desired to determine why they do so move. It remained for Isaac Newton, 1643 to 1727, to answer the question satisfactorily. Yet Kepler had a curious premonition of the law of gravitation. Quote, Whereas the Ptolemaic system, unquote, comments Berry, quote, required a number of motions round mere geometrical points, centers of epicycles or eccentrics, equants, etc., unoccupied by any real body, and many such motions were still required by Copernicus, Kepler's scheme of the solar system placed a real body, the sun, at the most important point connected with the path of each planet and dealt similarly with the moon's motion around the earth and with that of the four satellites round Jupiter. Motions of revolution came, in fact, to be associated not with some central point, but with some central body and it became therefore an inquiry of interest to ascertain if there were any connection between the motion and the central body. The property possessed by a magnet of attracting a piece of iron at some little distance from it suggested a possible analogy to Kepler, who had read with care and was evidently impressed by the treatise On the Magnet, De Magnete, published in 1600 by William Gilbert of Colchester. 1540 to 1603. He suggested that the planets might thus be regarded as sharing to some extent the sun's own motion of revolution. In other words, a certain carrying virtue spread out from the sun with or like the rays of light and heat and tried to carry the planets around the sun. Kepler says himself in his epitome, quote, there is therefore a conflict between the carrying power of the sun and the impotence or material sluggishness, inertia, of the planet. Each enjoys some measure of victory, for the former moves the planet from its position and the latter frees the planet's body to some extent from the bonds in which it is thus held. 
but only to be captured again by another portion of this rotary virtue, unquote. Thus is faintly indicated the great theory of gravitation which, as developed by Newton, was to supply a satisfactory explanation of planetary motion and which is the underlying basis of all modern astronomy. Newton had become convinced that the attracting power of the Earth extended even to the moon and that the acceleration produced in any body, whether it be as distant as the moon or close to the Earth, was inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the Earth's center, and also proportional to the mass of the body. Then he found that the motions of the planets could be explained by an attraction toward the sun, which produced an acceleration inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the center of the sun, not only in the same planet, in different parts of its path, but also in different planets. Again, it follows from this that the sun attracts any planet with a force inversely proportional to the square of the distance of the planet from the sun's center, and also proportional to the mass of the planet. Accordingly, if the earth or sun attracts a body, the body must exert a similar force on the earth or the sun, and gravitation is not only a property of the central body of a revolving system, but belongs to every planet in just the same way as to the sun and to a moon, or to a stone just as to the earth. After Newton had established provisionally the law of gravitation and the laws of motion, it remained for him to prove that the observed motions of the planets agreed with those calculated. A situation of the greatest complexity, however, was relieved by the fact that the mass of even the largest planets is so very much less than that of the sun that the motion of any single planet is affected but slightly by the others and it may be assumed to be moving very nearly as it would if the other planets did not exist, due allowance being made subsequently for minor disturbances or perturbations produced in its path. One by one the various irregularities observed were explained, and the motion of the moon and its various eccentricities were computed with accurate numerical results. End of section 9「Section 10 of The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy, Chapter 8, The Solar System, Part 2. For many years, the solar system remained in its fancied integrity. There was no change in the original five planets and the number of satellites first discovered by Galileo and added to by subsequent observers had reached an apparent culmination when G.D. Cassini had detected the second pair of satellites of Saturn in 1684. Accordingly, when Herschel, following his custom of making a review of the heavens with each new telescope that he constructed, found March 13, 1781, with a Newtonian telescope seven feet in length, a small star which appeared so much larger than its companions and of such uncommon appearance, he suspected it to be a comet. Further study revealed that it was more than a comet and of far greater interest. When heedfully observed and its path calculated, it was found that no ordinary cometary orbit would in any way fit its motion. Anders Johann Lexel first recognized that Herschel's body was not a comet, but a new planet revolving around the sun in a nearly circular path and at a distance about 19 times that of the Earth and nearly double that of Saturn. A vain attempt by Herschel to name the new planet after his royal patron, George III, Georgium Citus, finally resulted in the proposal and acceptance by British and continental astronomers alike of the name Uranus, which harmonized with the names of the other planets. This discovery was of especial interest, inasmuch as Johann Daniel Titius, a professor at Wittenberg, had pointed out the remarkable symmetry in the disposition of the planets. 
In a note published in 1772, he showed that the distance of the six known planets from the Sun could be represented with a close approach to accuracy by a certain series of numbers increasing in the regular progression 0, 3, 6, 12, 24, 48, etc. Adding four to each number, the results would give the relative distances of the six known planets from the Sun. In applying this law, which does not hold good in the case of Neptune, it was found that the term of the series following that which corresponded with the orbit of Mars was not represented in the list of planets. Accordingly, Johann Elbert Bode, a German astronomer, assumed a hypothetical planet to take this place. When Uranus was discovered, its distance was found to fall but slightly short of perfect conformity with the law of Titius, and it stimulated the search for a new body, which, as will be seen in the chapter of the planetoids, proved to be the small planet Ceres. The study of Uranus after its discovery by Herschel furnished many discoveries to astronomers. Despite the most careful calculations of the movements of the planet through more than a century's observations, the conclusion was reached that considerable errors existed or that the planet was wandering from its course. In fact, these disturbances had aroused the interest of several mathematicians and astronomers, and a young English student, John Couch Adams. Soon after his graduation from Cambridge, communicated in 1845 to the Astronomer Royal numerical estimates of the elements and orbits of the unknown planet, which he assumed was acting on Uranus and was the cause of the disturbances. In fact, he indicated the actual place in the heavens of the hypothetical planet. At practically the same time, a French astronomer, Urbain Levier, who had made a careful study of the solar system in response to a request from Dominique F.J. Arago, the head of the French observatory, prepared an elaborate memoir in which he demonstrated that only an exterior body could produce the disturbances observed and that such a body must occupy a certain and determinate position in the zodiac. He also assigned the orbit of the disturbing body, indicating that it would be as visible and bright as a star of the eighth magnitude. In fact, he supplied data to Professor Gala of the Berlin Observatory, which enabled that astronomer to find in the heavens on September 23, 1846, within less than a degree of the spot indicated, an object with a measurable disk. A reasonably complete map of this portion of the sky in which all the stars were noted, proved beyond question that the object was not a star, while its movement, as predicted, was ample confirmation of its planetary nature. Adams' work, which antedated that of Levier, had not received attention originally in Great Britain at the hands of the Astronomer Royal, but as the matter assumed importance, the Cambridge Observatory also participated in the search and on September 29, 1846, the planet was seen again. Thus, Neptune was discovered. To show the rapidity of astronomical research in the 19th century, it may be remarked that it required but 17 days for the discovery of a satellite by Lassell with a two-foot reflecting telescope. Astronomers have suspected the existence of still other planets, and the belief has been expressed that such a body exists nearer to the Sun than Mercury, which, as has been seen, enjoys the reputation of being the closest of all the planets to the central luminary. The average distance of Mercury from the Sun is about 36 million miles, so that there would be enough space for such a planet. Its peculiar position in close proximity to the Sun, however, would act against its being observed. A small luminous point in this position would be altogether invisible, even with the best modern telescope, while its setting and rising, simultaneous almost with those of the Sun, make it invisible at these times, even under the most favorable conditions. If this planet should pass across the Sun's disk, just as do Mercury and Venus, it would be seen while from its size it would be much less of a spectacle than the two planets mentioned, it might be detected. Claims have been advanced by astronomers that they have seen such a transit of a small spot. The first suggestion of an intramercurial planet came from the distinguished French astronomer Levier, who in 1859 advanced such a hypothesis in an attempt to explain the movements of the planet Mercury. 
His theory involved a body of about the size of Mercury revolving at somewhat less than half its mean distance from the Sun or at a greater distance if of less mass and vice versa, whose motion in great part would explain the irregularities observed. In the same year, Dr. Les Carbo at Orger maintained that he had observed such a body crossing the sun's disk, and the name of Vulcan was bestowed upon it. Several astronomers claimed to have seen the new planet. Their observations were not well authenticated, and on the dates fixed for the probable transits, no trace of the planet could be found. The strongest test was the examination of the sky at the time of a solar eclipse, for then the light of the sun was cut off, and a strange body could be readily identified. Despite a careful watch at subsequent eclipses and an examination of photographic plates, only negative results have been obtained. Today, the belief that there is any body of considerable size within the orbit of Mercury is held only by a few astronomers and very guardedly stated. If the search for an intramercurial planet was unsuccessful, it has in no way deterred astronomers from endeavoring to find other unrecognized members of the solar system. Much interest has been aroused by a hypothetical ultra-Neptunian planet, which of course would be the furthest from the sun of all the members of the solar system. The basis for such a hypothesis is the reduction of observations made of the positions and motions of Uranus and Neptune. Neptune has been under observation for only a small part of a revolution, so that data thus far obtained seem to many astronomers insufficient for the purpose. Yet a number of astronomers have sought by calculation to prove the existence of such a planet. While their results are discordant, yet they indicate very closely the regions of the sky where search for the hypothetical body might be rewarded with success. Professor W. H. Pickering of Harvard in 1909 evolved a method for the discovery of the distant planet, a method which he first tested by application of the data available to Adams and Levier for the discovery of Neptune, and found that the method would succeed. Proceeding then with his hypothetical planet, which he termed O, he found that it was 51.9 times as far distant from the Sun as the Earth, though its mass was but twice that of this planet, and that it had a period of revolution of 373.5 years. The problem presented by Uranus, Neptune, and O, according to Professor Pickering, is quite the same as that of Mercury, Venus, and the Earth, which has been thoroughly studied, so that the relative motions are well understood. But in investigating the effect that such a hypothetical planet would have on the motion of Uranus, Professor A. Gallot recently arrived at the conclusion that there were indications pointing to the possibility of still another and more distant planet also exercising a perturbing influence. The results of his calculations and studies therefore indicate the possible existence of two ultra-Neptunian planets, one at a distance from the Sun equal to 44 times the Earth's mean distance, and having a mass of about 1 64,000th the mass of the Sun, the other having a distance 66 times that of the Earth, and a mass of about 1 14,000th that of the Sun. While these figures disagree with those of Professor Pickering, Yet the position calculated for the second planet agrees quite closely with that of the Harvard astronomer. The problem is by no means solved. It is mentioned to show that a plausible case has been made for at least one ultra-Neptunian planet. After astronomers had definitively decided how far the planets and the Sun are situated from the Earth and how they move with respect to one another, they began to wonder if perhaps the whole solar system did not in turn revolve around some central orb. The possibility first occurred to Tobias Mayer, John Michel, and Joseph Jerome Lefrançois Lalande, but the problem was not attacked with any degree of success until William Herschel, in 1782, began to draw conclusions from his study of the Milky Way and decided that the entire solar system was drifting toward the constellation Hercules. But Herschel's theory did not meet with general acceptance for many years. Other astronomers suggested various stars as possible central suns controlling the movement of our solar system, 
Thus, Maedler not only proposed that Alcyon, the principal star in the Pleiades, should be the central sun because of its situation at a point of neutralization of opposing tendencies and consequently at rest, but even went so far beyond the limits of astronomy as to declare that, quote, here was the seat of the Almighty, the mansion of the Eternal, end quote. It is hard even for science to quell the imagination and to confine an observer to facts. Maedler's theory was short-lived. Further study of the stars demonstrated the soundness of Herschel's views. When a modern telescope is turned toward the Milky Way, this white girdle of the celestial sphere is resolved into a vast number of stars, of which more than 140 million already have been counted on photographs. Each of these stars is a sun like that which governs the Earth, probably surrounded by planets like the Earth. And all these solar systems also are moving, many of them more swiftly than ours. It was inferred from Herschel's measurements of stellar positions, distances, and motions that the solar system was situated comparatively near the center of a universe shaped like a thin double convex lens. This universe was supposed to rotate as a unit about its center, with the result that the sun, comparatively near that center but absolutely at an immense distance from it, moved in a circle of dimensions so vast that since the discovery of its motion, it had not deviated appreciably from a straight line, but had steadily directed its course toward the constellation Hercules. This simple scheme must now be abandoned, for it has been discovered by Professor J.C. Keptine, a Dutch astronomer, that the visible universe consists of two distant parts. The scientific imagination is compelled to picture two processions of stars moving in paths which make an angle of 115 degrees with each other. One of these stellar streams moves three times as fast as the other. The sun forms a part of one of the streams and is at present at their intersection. Although it is known in a general way that the entire solar system is moving through space at the rate of 12 miles a second, the shape and size of the sun's orbit are utterly unknown. The changes of environment, accordingly, that will accompany the description of it defy conjecture. The actual course of the solar system is inclined at a small angle to the plane of the Milky Way. Presumably, it will become deflected, but perhaps not sufficiently to keep the system clear of entanglement with the galactic star throngs. In the present ignorance of their composition, no forecast of the results can be attempted. They are uncertain and exorbitantly remote. Hence, in a sense, the world knows where it is and in what direction it is moving. But what is the goal? When shall it be reached? And what will happen then? Or, in this crossing of the congested thoroughfares of the heavens, will the world be shattered by a collision and resolved into a glowing nebula? This has been the fate of many stars, of several within the period of human history, and of one, Nova Percy, within a few years, and witnessed in all its destructive detail by astronomers still living. End of section 10. Recorded by Dan Longauger in Washington State. Section 11 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 9. The Sun, Eclipses, Sunspots, and Aurorae, the Photosphere. Part 1. The preeminence of the sun among the celestial bodies and its obvious importance to the life of the world has given to it a unique place, not only in astronomy but in philosophy and religion. The rising of the sun and the light that it casts over the earth are distinctly symbolical of the conquest of light over darkness or the triumph of truth over error, so that in many schemes of mythology the sun god assumes the highest rank and rules over the other elements, such as the moon, the rains and floods, and the stars. Of this there are abundant instances in all primitive religions. Among the Oriental nations, to whom we owe the idea of a flood from which the world emerged, the sun god reigned supreme. 
in egypt among the chaldeans and babylonians and later among the greeks and romans the sun held like sway in persia sun worship was developed into a more formal religion which survived for many years after the mind of man had developed to a point where it was concerned with philosophical speculation rather than with the mysticism handed down by the priesthood there came a desire to understand the relation of the sun to the earth and to the universe its motion across the sky was obvious as well as its change of position from time to time on this as has been seen various theories were founded it was early realized that the sun described an annual path on the celestial sphere which path is a great circle and this great circle known as the ecliptic because eclipses take place only when the moon is in or near it is at an angle to the equator of the sphere this angle is termed the obliquity of the ecliptic and was measured by the chinese it is claimed as early as 1100 bc with remarkable accuracy later the same feat was claimed for pythagoras or anaximander in the sixth century bc both of whom probably derived their information from the Chaldeans or Egyptians. When the sun crosses the equator, the day is equal to the night, which occurs twice a year, at the vernal equinox about March 21st and the autumnal equinox about September 23rd. When the sun is at its greatest distance from the equator on the north side, the time is known as the summer solstice, and when at its greatest distance on the south side, it is termed the winter solstice. The positions of these points in the heavens were also known to the early Chinese astronomers with considerable accuracy, while Anaximander, who supposed the sun to be of equal magnitude with the earth, used a gnomon, or vertical pillar, casting a shadow to observe the solstices and equinoxes. Anaximenes is said to have believed that the sun was a mass of red-hot iron or of heated stone somewhat larger than the Peloponnesus. He looked upon the heavens as a vault of stones, prevented from falling by the rapidity of its circular motion, while the sun could not proceed beyond the tropics on account of a thick and dense atmosphere which compelled it to retrace its course. Later, Philolaus of Cretona, who was a disciple of Pythagoras and followed his master's teaching that the earth revolved about the sun, assumed that the sun was a disk of glass which reflected the light of the universe. Eudoxus of Canidus, about 370 BC, stated that the diameter of the sun was nine times greater than that of the moon, which marked a triumph over the illusions of sense. About the time of Alexander, the great Pythias, using the nomen, determined the length of the shadows cast at the summer solstice in various countries. His observations are the most ancient of those preserved after those made in China. The study of the sun was undertaken very systematically by Hipparchus, who discovered that the solar orbit was eccentric and that the sun moved at different speeds at different parts of its journey. With his observational data, Hipparchus produced the first tables of the sun which are mentioned in astronomy. He was enabled to determine the difference between the solar day or time as shown by the sun and the time indicated by some such measuring device as the clepsydra or water clock. The motion of the sun was also studied by Ptolemy. He compiled solar tables more extensive than those of Hipparchus, which were employed until Albictegni, born 815, made a new compilation of greater accuracy and which served as a connecting link between the astronomers of Alexandria and those of modern Europe. The obliquity of the ecliptic was constantly being studied. Ulu Beg, a Tartar prince and grandson of the great Tamerlane at Samarkand, using a gnomon 100 feet in height, determined the obliquity of the ecliptic or precession of the equinoxes and secured data for the construction of astronomical tables which were of considerable accuracy. The apparent motions of the sun furnished many difficult problems for the astronomer since the observational data lacked accuracy on account of the absence of satisfactory instruments. Measuring angles by the shadow cast and positions in the sky by crude forms of angular measurement were not adequate for exact work. Not until the advent of the quadrant and the telescope with its various adjuncts was scientific measurement possible. But there were from time to time solar eclipses, of which a careful record was maintained and which the ancient priests noted in connection with their calendar observations. These eclipses played a most important part in ancient astronomy.
an eclipse of the sun occurs when earth moon and sun are in direct line at the time of new moon as the latter lies between the earth and the sun its dark body will pass across the sun's disk cutting off the direct illumination if the earth cuts off the sunlight from the moon there is a lunar eclipse solar eclipses are of three kinds partial annular and total in the first the moon instead of passing directly between the earth and the sun slips past on one side and cuts off from sight only a portion of the sun's surface in the annular eclipse the moon is centrally interposed between the sun and the earth but falls short of the apparent size required to conceal the solar disk entirely consequently at the height of obscuration a bright ring is visible around the moon in a total eclipse however the sun completely disappears behind the dark body of the moon the difference between a total and an annular eclipse depends upon the fact that the apparent diameters of the sun and the moon are so nearly equal as to preponderate alternately one over the other through the slight periodical changes in their respective distances from the earth it is the total eclipse that particularly arouses the attention of astronomers for it cuts off entirely the light of the sun and in addition to enabling the observation of the various parts of its surface as it passes across its disk to be made also makes it possible for an observer to see the stars and planets in the daytime even if they are very near to the sun a total eclipse of the sun is not visible on the entire earth but only along a comparatively narrow band lying roughly from west to east and measuring about 165 miles in width a partial eclipse is seen for about 2000 miles on either side of this band but otherwise the phenomenon is not visible on the earth's surface Chinese records going back over 4,000 years describe a solar eclipse which occurred during the 22nd century BC. That eclipse carried with it a distinct moral lesson. Two bibulous state astronomers, Ho and He, unfortunately happened to be drunk on the day of its occurrence and hence incapable of supervising the performance of the required rites, which consisted in beating drums, shooting arrows, and other ceremonies intended to frighten away the mighty dragon who was about to swallow up the Lord of Day. Although the eclipse was only partial, nevertheless, great confusion resulted, and Ho and He were put to death as a lesson to later astronomers. Another early record of a total eclipse comes from Babylon, 1063 BC. Several centuries later, Assyrian tablets record solar eclipses. Herodotus, Plutarch, and the Bible all refer to the phenomenon. Thus, one is enabled to determine with accuracy the time of historical events. Likewise, in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, several notable eclipses are recorded. The sun appears as a brilliant white body. Just as the earth is enveloped by an atmosphere, so the sun is surrounded by several layers of gaseous and vaporous matter, with the result that so far as an observer on the earth is concerned, its nucleus is quite invisible. These layers are more or less transparent, just as the atmosphere of the earth is transparent, so that the bright white body of the sun is visible only through these various envelopes. This bright white portion is called the photosphere and is the source of the light and heat which is radiated to the earth. Here are found the sun spots distinctly seen with the telescope and even by the naked eye. Under the photosphere it may be that the more solid portions of the sun are situated, but it is obvious that its surface consists of highly incandescent vapors above which is a smoke-like haze. Upon this rests the reversing layer, which is composed of glowing gases, but is cooler than the photosphere beneath. It has a thickness of between 500 and 1,000 miles and contains, as the spectroscope shows, many of the elements of which the earth is composed in the form of vapor above the reversing layer comes the chromosphere the chromosphere is between 5,000 and 10,000 miles in thickness and is composed of glowing gases chief among which is hydrogen the chromosphere is a brilliant scarlet in hue but the redness is entirely overpowered by the intense white light of the photosphere which shows through from behind the most interesting features of the chromosphere are the red prominences, which are the marks of violent agitation in its upper portions, and which are such a notable feature in total solar eclipses. After the chromosphere comes the corona, which is the outer envelope of the sun, and consists of a halo of pearly white light of irregular outline, which fades away into the surrounding sky and extends outward for many millions of miles. The corona suffers so much from the brilliancy of the photosphere that it is only on the occasion of a total solar eclipse that it can be seen in all its remarkable beauty. 
as the photosphere the reversing layer and the chromosphere are all sources of light the solar spectrum observed in spectroscopes is composed of the three separate spectra combined for this reason eclipses afford welcome opportunities for studying the sun's surface when the moon completely covers the photosphere its brilliant light is cut off and the other features of the sun can be examined visually and what is more important spectroscopically and photographically thus when the spectroscope is directed to the reversing layer during a total eclipse the dark lines of the solar spectrum change into bright lines or are reversed but this reverse spectrum is a phenomenon of a moment only and as the moon progresses an altered spectrum is obtained that of the chromosphere is of sufficiently long duration to permit an estimate of its depth and nature and finally when this is covered up there is the corona which has a distinct spectrum of its own containing a strange line the distinguishing green of which has not yet been identified with any element known upon the earth modern conceptions of the sun are due very largely to the use of the telescope the spectroscope and the spectroheliograph especially the last two instruments with this telescope when the intense light of the sun is properly reduced it is possible to examine its surface and obtain a certain amount of information as to its nature or to obtain photographs of that surface by very short exposures but on the spectroscope and the spectroheliograph the astronomer depends for his knowledge of the constitution and composition of the greater center of the solar system the development and nature of the spectroscope as used in solar research have been already discussed but it is appropriate to add here a brief explanation of the spectroheliograph for to its use is due not only a large part of present-day information of the prominences but more recently an explanation of the sunspots themselves and the study of various features of the photosphere the spectroheliograph was first devised in successful working form by professor george e hale at kenwood observatory chicago in eighteen eighty nine the principle of this instrument is very simple writes professor hale its object is to build up on a photographic plate a picture of the solar flames by recording side-by-side -side images of the bright spectral lines which characterize the luminous gases in the first place an image of the sun is formed by a telescope on the slit of a spectroscope the light of the sun after transmission through the spectroscope is spread out into a long band of color crossed by lines representing the various elements at points where the slit of the spectroscope happens to intersect a gaseous prominence the bright lines of hydrogen and helium may be seen extending from the base of the prominence to its outer boundary if a series of such lines corresponding to different positions of the slit on the image of the prominence were registered side by side on a photographic plate it is obvious that they would give a representation of the form of the prominence itself to accomplish this result it is necessary to cause the solar image to move at a uniform rate across the first slit of the spectroscope and with the aid of a second slit which occupies the place of the ordinary eyepiece of the spectroscope to isolate one of the lines permitting the light from this line and from no other portion of the spectrum to pass through the second slit to a photographic plate if the plate be moved at the same speed with which the solar image passes across the first slit an image of the prominence will be recorded upon it the same method answers for the study of the sunspots and other features of the sun's surface as the result of telescopic spectroscopic and spectroheliographic observation it is now known that the sun's principal features are its sunspots its photosphere its chromosphere and its corona a sunspot when examined through a telescope consists of a dark central region called the umbra into which long narrow filaments reach the space occupied by these filaments is termed the penumbra the darkness of the umbra is not absolute but is relative to the more brilliant surface of the photosphere and if observed alone would be far more brilliant than the most powerful arc light these dark spots on the sun were familiar objects in the days of pre-telescopic observation but their importance to astronomy dates with their discovery in sixteen ten by galileo with his telescope the great italian astronomer did not announce his discovery until may sixteen twelve by which time sunspots had been seen independently by thomas harriet fifteen sixty to sixteen twenty one john fabricius fifteen eighty seven to sixteen fifteen who published his observations in june sixteen eleven or before galileo and the jesuit father christopher shiner fifteen seventy five to sixteen fifty all of them pioneer observers with the telescope end of section eleven section twelve of the science history of the universe volume one 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 9 The Sun, Part 2. Before sunspots were clearly observed with the telescope, it was assumed that they were due to the transit of Mercury. Even Father Shiner, after his telescopic studies, suggested that the spots might be small planets revolving around the sun and appearing as dark objects whenever they passed between the sun and the observer. It was recognized, however, that the spots appeared to move across the face of the sun from the eastern to the western side, or roughly from left to right. Father Shiner's view was also held by Jean Tarda, Canon of Sarlat, by Father Malpertius, a Belgian Jesuit, and later by William Gascoigne, the inventor of the micrometer. Galileo, however, advanced a cloud theory, while Simon Marius, astronomer and physician to the brother Margraves of Brandenburg, proposed the ingenious slag theory, according to which the dark spots were the cindery refuse of a great solar conflagration and occasionally expelled in the form of comets, which afterward blazed up with renewed vigor. Galileo, in a controversy with Father Scheimer, proved him wrong in his planetary theory, while the occurrence of the comets in 1618 won supporters for the theory of Marius. Galileo also ascertained the rotation of the sun in a period of between 25 and 26 days, as well as the general zone of the sunspots. The next important contribution to sunspot theory came from Durham, whose observations were made during the years 1703 to 1711. He believed that the spots on the sun were caused by the action of some new volcano, whose smoke and other opacous matter produced the spots. As they decayed, they became half-shadows encircling the darker portions, and finally became bright spots. Lalande, the celebrated French astronomer, believed that the spots were rocky elevations, about which the penumbra represented shoals or sand banks, while around flowed enormous oceans. Lalande's explanation, as well as that of Durham, was clearly based upon terrestrial analogies, which were employed with considerable frequency by early astronomers. In 1769, Alexander Wilson of Glasgow, 1714 to 1786, examining the large sunspot visible that year, noted that as the sun's rotation carries a spot across its disk, there was a change in its appearance, and that the same effect of perspective was produced as if it were a saucer-shaped depression, the bottom forming the umbra, or central black spot, and the sloping sides the penumbra, or surrounding portion of half-shadow. The penumbra appeared narrowest on the side nearest the center of the sun and widest on the part nearest the edge. Hence Wilson assumed that the great and stupendous body of the sun is made up of two kinds of matter, very different in their qualities, that by far their greater part is solid and dark, and that this immense and dark globe is encompassed by a thin covering of that resplendent substance from which the sun would seem to derive the whole of his vivifying heat and energy. Wilson went on to explain that the excavation of spots might be occasioned by the working of some sort of elastic vapor which is generated within the dark globe, and that the luminous material, which was more or less fluid, was acted upon by and tended to throw down and cover the nucleus. Sir William Herschel devoted considerable attention to the sun, and observing the variation in the sunspots, reached the conclusion in 1801 that it indicated a certain variability in the total amount of solar radiation which he assumed might have some connection with terrestrial phenomena, especially the weather. He endeavored first in 1801 to trace connection between the price of wheat, naturally influenced by the effect of weather on the crops, and the occurrence of sunspots, claiming that when the latter were scarce there was a diminished solar activity, which caused colder weather, with obvious results. Ingenious as this theory was, there were not sufficient substantiating meteorological data. It finds, however, a counterpart in modern studies of the sun's heat, not necessarily connected exclusively with sunspots, however, whereby it is hoped to establish some useful knowledge of the relation between the amount of heat radiated from the sun and weather conditions on our Earth. Herschel's observations of the sun and sunspots were continued by his son, Sir John Herschel, at the Cape of Good Hope, 1836-1837. to 1837. 
john herschel assumed that their motion was due to fluid circulations similar to those producing the trade and anti-trade winds on the earth the spots in this view of the subject he said would come to be assimilated to those regions on earth's surface where for the moment hurricanes and tornadoes prevail the upper stratum being temporarily carried downward displacing by its impetus the two strata of luminous matter beneath the upper of course to a greater extent than the lower and thus wholly or partially denuding the opaque surface of the sun below such observation of sunspots made with considerable thoroughness by the astronomers mentioned as well as numerous others did not establish any regularity in their appearance or effacement it remained for heinrich schwab seventeen ninety to eighteen seventy five at de so to announce in eighteen forty three that the sunspot phenomenon reached a maximum probability in a decennial period this announcement although coming as it did after a patient study of the sun attracted no particular attention until a series of sunspot statistics were published in humboldt's cosmos then the correctness of schwab's observations and deductions was apparent to all when compared by dr john lamont and sir edward sabine with various periodical magnetic disturbances it was found that the two cycles of changes agreed with extraordinary exactness it was a remarkable coincidence that the observations of a number of investigators were in complete harmony a study of sunspot records established the decennial period more correctly at eleven point one one years thus commenced a recognition that magnetic disturbances on the earth were related in some way to sunspot phenomena for many years no direct connection could be established although various theories were forthcoming likewise further attempts were made to identify the variations of sunspots with meteorological phenomena but without success until wolf in eighteen fifty nine by an examination of the zurich chronicles one thousand to eighteen hundred a d found data which established occurrences of the aurora borealis to be correlated with a disturbed condition of the sun from this time on the influence of the sun on terrestrial conditions assumed new importance the beautiful phenomenon of the aurora which consists of a glow in the sky about the north and south poles had been observed for ages but the first scientific connection of importance recorded was in seventeen sixteen when halley stated that the northern lights were due to magnetic effluvia in seventeen forty one he order at upsala observed that they produced an agitation of the magnetic needle this connection was further demonstrated by arago eighteen nineteen so that by the middle of the nineteenth century the connection of the aurora with the sun and in turn with terrestrial magnetism was as evident as it was insufficiently explained the first result of modern study of the sun spots was to put an end to the old notion that there was a dark and cold interior of the sun and that the sun spots were merely rents in the brilliant cloud covering through which the interior portion could be seen the late professor s p langley one of the most active of the modern students of the sun and its surface thought that the filaments which taken together constitute the penumbra were everywhere present on the surface professor hale states he regarded them as resembling the stalks of a wheat field seen on end in the undisturbed photosphere and revealing more of their true characteristics in the penumbra where they are bent over and drawn out toward the central part of the spot langley believed that we are observing clouds of luminous vapors rising from the sun's interior the seats of convection currents which bring to the surface the immense supplies of heat radiated by the sun into space separating these luminous columns are darker regions characterized by a lower degree of radiation the minute details can be recorded only with the greatest difficulty under ordinary atmospheric conditions the solar image is not seen as a sharp and well-defined object but its details are continually blurred by the effect of irregularly heated currents in our atmosphere even under the best conditions the moments of very sharp definition are few and the greatest patience and perseverance are required on the part of an observer who would record his impressions of the solar structure at the best drawings based upon visual observations must be unsatisfactory since even the skilled hands of langley could not secure the perfect precision which is so desirable it accordingly might be hoped that here as in other departments of solar research photography would afford the necessary means of securing results unattainable by the eye unfortunately however this hope has only been partially realized the influence of sunspots is not confined to magnetic and electrical phenomena the researches of Koppen, which have been confirmed by Newcomb, 
show that the average temperature of the earth determined by the combination of a great number of thermometric observations made at several stations indicated a fluctuation of point three degrees to point seven degrees celsius during the eleven-year sunspot period in other words the temperature of the earth's atmosphere indicates small fluctuations which correspond with the sunspot period thus indicating that the solar heat radiation varies with the number of the sunspots the mean temperature of the earth is greatest at the time of minimum sunspots and lowest at the time of maximum sunspots hence the determination of the amount of heat radiated by the sun at various times especially at sunspot maxima and minima is a matter of considerable terrestrial importance the study of the sunspots carried on by professor hale with the spectroheliograph and other apparatus including special red sensitive plates of considerable speed reached an interesting stage in 1908 when it was demonstrated that sunspots are centers of attraction which draw toward them the hydrogen of the solar atmosphere subsequently it was found that these spots are the seats of great cyclones in which cool hydrogen gas is set whirling and is sucked down in the great maelstrom of the sun rushing into the center of the spot at a rate of about 60 miles a second consequently the spots are the center of great solar disturbances which are of an electromagnetic nature according to the modern electronic theory of matter and electricity electrons or minute particles of matter in their terrific cyclonic velocity produce magnetic lines of force it was found by professor zeeman that when light is passed through a strong magnetic field the lines of the spectrum are subdivided and appear double this Zeeman effect Professor Hale has found in the spectrum of the sunspots. If one looks at the center of a spot, the light travels in the direction of the axis of the whirl or cyclone, while in viewing a spot at the edge of the sun, the direction is at right angles to the axis and is manifested accordingly in the spectrum. This theory has been thoroughly confirmed, so that today it is known that sunspots are magnetic fields of great intensity. The important discoveries made by Professor Hale and his associates may thus be summarized as follows. First, that the spots are cooler than the surrounding region. Second, that they are centers of violent cyclones. And third, that they are magnetic fields of great intensity. In addition to the sunspots, the photosphere includes other interesting features, notable among which are the faculae, little torches, so named by Father Shiner these bright globular objects besides the sunspots are the only other phenomena of the sun's surface visible by direct observation schroeder showed that the faculae are heaped up ridges of the disturbed photospheric matter secchi and young assumed that the faculae are the result of violent eruptive action of the sunspots but it remained for the spectroheliograph to give a clear idea of their nature professor hale states that they are usually most numerous in the vicinity of sunspots and near the sun's limb they are sometimes very conspicuous brilliant objects covering large areas near the center of the sun however they are practically invisible though faint traces of them can sometimes be made out on photographs taken with suitable exposure this increase of brightness toward the sun's limb is assumed to be due to the elevation of the faculae above the photospheric level and their escape from a considerable part of that absorption which so materially reduces the brightness of the photosphere rising above the denser part of the absorbing veil and thus suffering but little diminution of light they appear near the sun's limb as bright objects on a less luminous background the chief difference of the faculae from the rest of the photosphere lies in their greater altitude as photographs have shown that they may be resolved into granular elements similar to those constituting the photosphere but they are the regions from which immense masses of vapors rise to the solar surface and for that reason are important in the solar mechanism near the edge of the sun their summits lie above the lower and denser part of that absorbing atmosphere which so greatly reduces the sun's light near the limb and in this region the faculae may be seen visually at times they may be traced to considerable distances from the limb but as a rule they are inconspicuous or wholly invisible toward the central part of the solar disk the kenwood experiments had shown that the calcium vapor coincides closely in form and position with the faculae and hence the calcium clouds were long spoken of under this name in the new work at the yerkes observatory the differences between the calcium clouds and the underlying faculae became so marked that a distinctive name for the vaporous clouds appeared necessary they were therefore designated flocculi 
a name chosen without reference to their particular nature but suggested by the flocculent appearance of the photographs with the spectroheliograph professor hale relates it was at once found possible to record the forms not only of the brilliant clouds of calcium vapor associated with the faculae and occurring in the vicinity of the sun spots but also of a reticulated structure extending over the entire surface of the sun from a systematic study of spectroheliograph negatives in the course of which the heliographic latitude and longitude of the calcium clouds or flocculi in many parts of the sun's disk were measured from day to day by fox a new determination of the rate of the solar rotation in various latitudes has been made this shows that the calcium flocculi like the sunspots complete a rotation in much shorter time at the solar equator than at points nearer the poles in other words the sun does not rotate as a solid body would do but rather like a ball of vapor subject to laws which are not yet understood end of section 12《Science History of the Universe》Section 13 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Labonte.《The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler, Astronomy, Chapter 10, The Sun, 2, The Reversing Layer, The Chromosphere and Corona radiation pressure and solar energy part one the so-called reversing layer was discovered by the late professor charles a young during the eclipse of december twenty second eighteen seventy on which occasion he placed the spectroscope with its slit tangential to the sun's limb so that it ran along a shallow bed of incandescent vapors when the moon reduced the size of the crescent of the sun the dark lines of the spectrum and the spectrum itself gradually faded away until all at once, as suddenly as a bursting rocket shoots out its stars, the whole field of view was covered by bright lines more numerous than one could count. This phenomenon lasted about two seconds and gave the impression of a distinct reversal of the Fraunhofer spectrum, showing bright lines for dark in every case. That such a reversing layer should exist was demanded by Kirchhoff's theory of the production of the Fraunhofer lines and implied a stratum of mixed vapors at a lower temperature than that of the surface of the sun. It was by such a stratum that the missing rays of the solar spectrum were stopped. The spectrum from this portion alone could supply bright lines if the overpowering brilliancy of the solar background could be cut off, which can occur only at the time of an eclipse. This observation of Professor Young's, with its important bearing on the theory of Kirchhoff, was not confirmed until 1896, when photographic evidence was forthcoming. During the eclipses of 1898 and 1900, abundant corroborative material was obtained, and the reversing layer as a reality was conclusively demonstrated. The total depth of this reversing layer has been placed at from 500 to 600 miles. It continues in a normal state of tranquility, for little change is produced in the aspect of the dark lines. The chromosphere, or envelope of glowing gases, which covers the sun completely, was detected by observers of eclipses in the 18th and 19th centuries. There is a record in a letter from Captain Stanion to Flamsteed, the British astronomer royal, describing an eclipse witnessed at Bern on May 1st, old style 1706, in which he states that the sun's, quote, getting out of the eclipse was preceded by a blood-red streak of light from its left limb, unquote. Halley and de Louisville in 1715 noted a similar phenomena, and it was also observed during annular eclipses of 1737 and 1748, but with the ruby brilliancy toned down to brown or dusky red, by the surviving sunlight. During the eclipses of 1820, 1836, and 1838, similar observations were made, but it was not until the eclipse of the 8th of July, 1842, that the virtual discovery of the chromosphere as a solar appendage may be said to have been made. The eclipse of 1868, which was observed spectroscopically and photographically, as well as with the telescope, served to make clear the nature of the chromosphere and to reveal that it is a continuous envelope of hydrogen 
and other incandescent gases, some thousands of miles in thickness, and of the same eruptive nature as the prominences which are shot out from it. In other words, it seems to be a collection of minute flames set close together in giving it the appearance of a large conflagration. The summits of the flames of fire, which incline when the sun's activity is greatest, are erect during its phase of tranquility. The chromosphere is marked by an irregular distribution over the sun's surface, which in no way partakes of the character of an atmosphere. Professor Hale, in 1897, discovered a low stratum of carbon vapor. Such rare metals as gallium and scandium have been discovered with the spectroscope. The vapors of magnesium, iron, and several other substances are conspicuously represented in the spectrum of the chromosphere, and with the Yerkes telescope, the fine bright lines due to the vapor of carbon also may be seen. The solar prominences are conspicuous eruptive or flame-like emanations from the chromosphere which are seen at total eclipses of the sun. They project like red flames beyond the dark edge of the moon and were first described by Lector Vassinius, a Swedish professor of Gothenburg, who observed the total eclipse of May 2nd, Old Style, 1733. One of these reddish clouds outside of the solar disk was so large that it could be detected with the naked eye. The phenomenon excited his admiration and wonder. The prominences were also observed in 1778 by the Spanish Admiral Don Antonio Ulloa, who was convinced of their connection with the sun on account of their color and magnitude. By some observers, the solar prominences were regarded as the illuminated summits of lunar mountains, and by Arago, they were described as solar clouds shining by reflected light. Abbe Petal in 1842 spoke of them as self-luminous and as a third or outer solar envelope composed of the glowing substance of the bright rose tint which produced mountains, just as clouds were piled above the Earth's surface. In 1851, Hind, an English astronomer, noted on the south limb of the moon, quote, a long range of rose-colored flames, unquote which Dawes spoke of as a low ridge of red prominences resembling in outline the tops of a very irregular range of hills. Airy also noted this rugged line of projections and spoke of its brilliancy and nearly scarlet color. But the truly solar origin of the phenomena was not conclusively demonstrated until 1860 when the prominences were photographed by Secchi and Delarue and shown to be independent of the motion of the moon. In 1868, with the growth of spectroscopy and solar chemistry, the gaseous nature of the prominences and their connection with the sun was made evident. They were found to consist of immense masses of hydrogen and helium gas rising from the chromosphere and reaching an altitude of hundreds of thousands of miles. The Corona The Corona is a beautiful lustrous solar wrapping which can be observed only during a total eclipse. The winged circle, the winged disk, or the ring with wings, as it is variously called, found upon Assyrian and Egyptian monuments, may be reproductions of the phenomenon. The first definite mention of a solar corona is to be found in Plutarch in connection with the eclipse which probably took place in 71 AD. He writes that the obscuration caused by the moon, quote, has no time to last and no extensiveness, but some light shows itself around the sun's circumference, which does not allow the darkness to become deep and complete, unquote. Kepler mentions a ray of light seen around the eclipsed sun in 1567 and ascribes it to some sort of luminous atmosphere around the sun. In 1706, Cassini, observing an eclipse of the sun in France, saw the, quote, crown of pale light, unquote, around the lunar disk, and stated that it was caused by the illumination of the zodiacal light. Halley, observing an eclipse in London in 1715, describes minutely the phenomena of the luminous ring rising around the moon to a great height and showing considerable brilliancy. The eclipse of 1842 was the first to indicate the corona's great importance to astronomers, and from that date it received careful attention and earnest study. 
In 1869, Professor Harkness and Professor Young discovered a bright line of unknown origin in the coronal spectrum, showing that it consists in large part of glowing gases. With the advent of astronomical photography and with the development of the spectroscope, more attention than ever was given to the careful study of the corona in the limited time available on the occasion of a total eclipse. The corona is described by Professor Hale as a, quote, faintly luminous veil of light extending outward in long streamers from the surface of the photosphere to distances of several millions of miles and exceeded in brilliancy even in its brightest parts by the full moon. In many ways, its streamers resemble those of the aurora borealis, and it is indeed possible that their origin may be ascribed to some similar electrical cause. During the few minutes of a total eclipse, they are not seen to undergo change of form, but the outline of the corona does vary greatly from year to year in sympathy with the general variation of the solar activity. Spectroscopic observations have shown that the corona consists mainly of gases unknown to the chemist. That is to say, the lines in its spectrum do not coincide in position with the lines of any terrestrial element. Whether these gases, which are probably very light, will ultimately be found on the Earth cannot be predicted. Like helium, first known in the sun, they may eventually be encountered in minute quantities in some mineral where they have hitherto escaped the chemist's analysis. The fact that the lower part of the corona gives a continuous spectrum, with a feebler solar spectrum superposed upon it, indicates that minute incandescent particles are present which are hot enough to radiate white light and which scatter enough sunlight to account for the presence of the solar spectrum." Unquote. The strange line in the green portion of the spectrum does not correspond with that of any element with which we are acquainted upon the Earth, and accordingly a hypothetical element has been assumed to which the name coronium has been applied. Chemical Composition Anaximenes' idea that the sun was a glowing ball of incandescent iron came almost as near the truth as subsequent speculations by philosophers and astronomers until about the middle of the 19th century. In 1859, Kirchhoff's great discovery of the explanation of the Fraunhofer lines in the solar spectrum made it possible to ascertain the chemical composition of the sun. Thus, as has been shown, the bright colored band formed of light from a small hole in Newton's shutter passing through a prism made that prism the forerunner of an instrument able to teach the nature and constitution of bodies far distant in the heavens. Thomas Melville had examined with a prism various flames in which different substances had been introduced and had reached the conclusion by the middle of the 18th century that certain vapors, notably sodium, contained light which had a definite place in the spectrum. Melville's deep yellow ray became the sodium line in the spectroscope of Fraunhofer. When Kirchhoff noted the identity of certain lines characteristic of terrestrial elements and then assumed their presence in the sun, he laid the foundation of the modern science of solar chemistry. Wherever light can be observed from a heavenly body, it is now possible to resolve it into its spectral elements and thus to identify the substances. In fact, as substances such as helium were found in the sun by Lockyer, which had no terrestrial counterpart, hypothetical elements were assumed. The spectroscope has shown in the sun the presence not only of gases such as hydrogen and helium, but iron, sodium, magnesium, calcium, and many other substances. Hence, the chemical composition of the earth and the sun are much the same, although there is evidence of the existence in the sun of substances not yet found in the earth. When the spectroscope was applied to the analysis of the chromosphere and its prominences, it was found that they are composed of the vapor of calcium and of the light gases helium and hydrogen. Sunspots too have been found to have a characteristic chemical composition while the corona emits rays which probably indicate the presence in it of very light and tenuous gases. With the light given off by the sun, there is to be considered a phenomenon which only recently has been demonstrated by experiment, namely that light exerts a pressure which can act on minute particles quite as effectively as gravitation. 
Gravitation, however, attracts entire masses, but pressure acts only on surfaces, so that a force, such as the pressure of light, to be effective must deal with very minute masses. If you subdivide a mass into a large number of minute particles, the effect of gravitation is not changed, but a point will be reached in the subdivision where particles may be obtained having much surface and very little weight. If such a particle has a diameter of one one hundred thousandth of an inch, it will be exactly balanced in space, pulled by gravitation, weight on the one hand, pushed by light on the other. If the particle is even smaller than one one hundred thousandth of an inch in diameter, the pressure of light upon it pushes it away with terrific force. It is the radiation of the sun acting on the minute particles that produces the phenomenon of comets' tails, and it is this pressure which may be responsible for the brilliant phenomena of the corona, visible only during the vanishing moments of a total eclipse. No one has ever satisfactorily explained how the highly attenuated matter composing both the prominences and the corona is supported without falling back into the sun under the pull of solar gravitation. Now that Arrhenius has cosmically applied the effects of light pressure, a solution is presented. How difficult it is to account for such delicate streamers as the prominences on the sun is better comprehended when we fully understand how relentlessly powerful is the grip of solar gravitation. The sun admittedly projects vapors into space, vapors which must condense into drops when they encounter the cold of outer space. If the drops are larger than the critical size which determines whether light pressure or gravitation shall prevail, they will be snatched back by the sun's gravitational attraction and give rise to the curved prominences that are often observed. If they have approximately the critical diameter, they will float above the sun in the form of beautiful carmine clouds, balanced in space by the equal and oppositely acting forces of gravitation and radiation pressure. These clouds have hitherto been particularly puzzling, for in the absence of a dense solar atmosphere their existence seemed a celestial paradox. If the condensed drops are smaller than the critical diameter, they will be projected by the pressure of light far beyond the sun to form the beautiful pearly corona. From the fact that comets have passed through the corona without any very apparent retardation, some idea of its tenuity can be gained. Assuming that the corona consists of particles of such size that the radiation pressure on each exactly equals its weight, Arrhenius finds that the entire corona weighs no more than 12 million long tons, which is equivalent to 400 large transatlantic steamers and is not more than the amount of coal burned on the earth every week. Compared with the infinity of the space in which it is poised, the earth is smaller than a vanishingly small speck on a sheet of paper having an area of many square miles. So far as the earth is concerned, the sun is very much in the position of a man who throws away all but a single cent of a fortune consisting of twenty-three million dollars. For only one two billion three hundred millionth of his radiated energy reaches this globe. What then becomes of the huge number of corpuscles which are shot from the sun and which never strike the earth? It is conceived by Arrhenius and his followers that many of them must collide with corpuscles discharged by suns other than that of the solar system, suns ineffably distant, so that their light reaches the earth only after the lapse of countless centuries, and so that they are seen not as they gleam now, but as they gleamed when Egypt was young and Greece was a wilderness inhabited by savages. Such collisions must result in the formation of large masses up to a limit determined by the electrical charges carried by the corpuscles. End of section 13section 14 of the science history of the universe volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. 
Chapter 10 Solar Energy Part 2 Solar Energy The Earth depends upon the Sun for its supply of heat and light. The Sun is transmitting heat to the Earth, and unless the supply of energy is being replenished in some way, it is obvious that it must be losing in heat and temperature. From its effect on the Earth, an estimate can be had of the amount of heat radiated by the Sun annually. If it be assumed that the Sun has the same heat capacity as water, and hydrogen is the only substance with a greater heat capacity, it would fall in temperature about 4 degrees Fahrenheit annually. If, therefore, the great luminary were simply a hot body, cooling off, its present rate of radiation could not be maintained for more than 3,000 years that the sun has been radiating a much longer period than this is obvious from geological and biological evidence so that some other cause must be sought up to the nineteenth century the doctrine of infinite durability was generally held by astronomers and geologists for that reason no particular attention was paid to the nature of the heat of the sun and its source but with the formulation of the doctrine of the conservation of energy it was realized that the energy of the earth must proceed from the sun for the greater part and consequently it became necessary in turn to question the source of solar heat robert mayer to whom is due the earliest conception of the conservation of energy asked himself if the sun is hot why does it not cool off in 1848, Mayer published some answers to his own question in a paper which failed to receive the approval of the French Academy of Sciences. His conclusions were as follows. The sun cannot be a glowing mass sending out radiation without compensation. Solar heat cannot be due entirely to chemical changes, nor can it be due to solar rotation. In his opinion, it was the result of meteors falling into the sun. He did not overlook the fact that the resulting increase in the mass of the sun would increase its attraction for the planets and would shorten the sidereal year. This was contrary to the facts of observation, and Mayer was forced to an incorrect conception of the undulatory theory of light to explain the situation. Six years later, William Thompson, subsequently Lord Kelvin, reached independently almost the same conclusion as Mayer, but he was able to explain the increase in the sun's mass resulting from meteoric showers. For according to the gravitation theory, the added matter is drawn from space, where it acts on the planets with very nearly the same force as when incorporated in the sun. Lord Kelvin then ventured an estimate of the age of the sun, which was the first attempt in this direction made by a physicist. He assumed that the solar energy of rotation was derived from the fallen meteors, which, allowing for the constant loss of solar energy by radiation, could be acquired in 32,000 years. Taking into consideration the limited amount of meteoric matter available near the sun, he concluded that sunlight cannot last as at present for 300,000 years. This theory attracted little attention when promulgated by him in 1854, and was abandoned by him later. But in the same year, Helmholtz, working along the lines of the nebular hypothesis of Kant in Laplace, derived the heat of the sun from the contraction of the nebula from which the sun and planets were formed. He asserted also a further contraction of the sun, now assumed to be in progress, by which the kinetic energy obtained was converted into heat and compensated for the loss of solar heat by radiation. Accordingly, if the sun contracts one ten-thousandth part of its radius each year, enough heat would be generated to supply radiation for 2,100 years. Helmholtz's computation gives 22 million years as the probable age of the sun, based on a uniform radiation and homogeneous density of that body. Later, S. P. Langley, with experimental data derived from the direct radiation of the sun, reduced this age to 18 million years. This theory immediately supplanted that of the falling meteors, which more serious reflection demonstrated could account only for the slight increase in the solar heat as compared with the energy of shrinkage. Lord Kelvin, in 1862, returned to the subject, favoring a theory like that of Helmholtz's, concluding that we may accept as the lowest estimate for the sun's initial heat 10 million times a year's supply at the present rate, but 50 million or 100 million as possible in consequence of the sun's greater density in his central parts. 
as for the future inhabitants of the earth cannot continue to enjoy the light and heat essential to their life for many million years longer unless sources now unknown to us are prepared in the great storehouse of creation studies of the sun's heat were continued by lord kelvin and in his theory he incorporated a discovery made in 1870 by j homer lane an american which paradoxically demonstrated that within certain limits the more heat a gaseous body loses by radiation the hotter it will become this theory of helmholtz's as modified by kelvin encountered a serious rival in 1882 when sir william siemens proposed that a rotating sun hurled by centrifugal action at the equator enormous quantities of gas into space which returned to it again at the poles somewhat after the manner of a regenerative furnace helmholtz's theory was modified in eighteen ninety nine by professor t j j c who abandoned the german scientist's hypothesis of homogeneous density for the sun and applied lane's law investigating minutely the more complex case of central condensation as the result of his study the probable age of the sun was extended from twenty two million to about thirty two million years all of these researches came before the discovery of radium and when the extraordinary properties of this new substance were known it was stated that a bare fraction of a percent of radium present in the sun would account for and make good the heat that is annually lost by radiation should this hypothesis hold good an entirely new aspect is given to the problem of solar heat and to the heat of the earth this innovation advanced by members of the younger school of physicists all of whom had prosecuted with vigor researches in radioactivity did not appeal to lord kelvin who maintained in 1906 that the gravitation theory was still sufficient to account for the sun's heat no evidence has been produced of the presence of radium in the sun although helium has been found there as helium is obtained from radium the existence of radium in the sun is quite probable Sir George H. Darwin, in discussing the effect of these recent discoveries on solar age, says, Knowing as we now do that an atom of matter is capable of containing an enormous store of energy in itself, I think we have no right to assume that the sun is incapable of liberating atomic energy to a degree at least comparable with that which it would do if made of radium. Accordingly, I see no reason for doubting the possibility of augmenting the estimate of solar heat, as derived from the theory of gravitation, by some such factor as 10 or 20. It is obvious, therefore, that while the contraction theory explains the origin of a vast amount of the sun's heat, yet there are other sources of internal energy which recent discoveries plainly indicate are of great importance, so that the scientist at this stage is unable to declare positively the age of the sun or to make any accurate estimate as to the probable duration of the time through which it will afford light and heat to the earth and the other planets. Nevertheless, it seems assured that millions of years hence, how many cannot even roughly be determined, the sun will be reduced from a ball of glowing vapor to a gigantic black cinder rushing through space. Unwarmed by any central luminary, its crust will be washed by oceans of air liquefied by a cold too intense for any living creature to endure. The light of the sun is obviously more intense than any other luminant known to man. If compared with the full moon, 600,000 times as much light is received from the sun. Expressed in another way, the sun gives over 60,000 times as much illumination as a standard candle at a distance of one yard. But not all of the light and heat which is radiated from the sun comes to the earth. Professor Langley, in his experiment at Mount Whitney in 1881, found that a clear atmosphere would cut off 40% of the rays coming perpendicularly to the earth's surface. Gases in the atmosphere, such as carbon dioxide, cut off even a greater amount, and the general absorption is greater at the violet end than at the red. It is for this reason that high altitudes and a clear atmosphere are essential for solar investigation, and for this reason, too, that the setting sun appears red, the bluish rays being absorbed in traversing a greater amount of terrestrial atmosphere than when the sun is high in the sky. The temperature of the sun can be estimated from its brilliancy and from spectroscopic and bolometric studies. It is a common experience that a filament of an incandescent lamp emits more light and glows more brightly when the amount of current is increased. At first the filament is red, but as more current is permitted to flow it becomes yellow and finally a brilliant white. This is marked by an increase in temperature, and secondly the temperature depends upon the brilliancy of the glow. The same analogy holds good in the case of the sun and the stars. 
if the wavelength of the radiation is known and the color which emits the greatest amount of heat in the spectrum and this can be measured by the bolometer by a simple law it is possible to calculate the absolute temperature of a star then by deducting 270 degrees from the result its temperature in the ordinary centigrade degrees is obtained Thus, in the case of the sun, the maximum heat radiation occurs in the greenish-yellow light, which gives a temperature for the rotating disk of the sun of about 5,000 degrees centigrade or 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The atmospheric absorption already referred to serves to cut down the intensity of the radiation, so that, taking this and other amounts into consideration, the temperature of the sun's disk can be estimated at about 6,200 degrees centigrade. Similar investigation in the case of Sirius and Vega, which are white or younger stars, give a temperature about 1,000 degrees Celsius higher than that of the Sun, while the red star Betelgeux, which is a declining star, older than the Sun, has a temperature some 2,500 degrees centigrade less. The temperature of the Sun furnishes different results, depending on the manner in which the problem is attacked. Arrhenius, in his work on Worlds in the Making, summarizes recent work and states that, From the intensity of the radiation, Christensen, and afterward Warburg, calculated a temperature of about 6,000 degrees centigrade. Wilson and Gray found for the center of the sun 6,200 degrees, which they afterward corrected into 8,000 degrees. Owing to the absorption of light by the terrestrial and the solar atmospheres, two low values are always found. That applies to a still greater extent to any estimate based upon the determination of that wavelength for which the heat emission from the solar spectrum is maximum. Le Chantelier compared the intensity of sunlight filtered through red glass with the intensities of light from several terrestrial sources of fairly well-known temperatures treated in the same way. These estimates yielded to him a solar temperature of 7,600 degrees centigrade. Most scientists accept an absolute temperature of 6,500 degrees, corresponding with about 6,200 degrees centigrade. That is what is known as the effective temperature of the sun. If the solar rays were not partially absorbed, this temperature would correspond with that of the clouds of the photosphere. Since red light is little absorbed, comparatively, Le Chantelier's value of 7,600 degrees centigrade and the almost equal value of Wilson and Gray of 8,000 degrees centigrade should represent approximately the average temperature of the outer portions of the clouds of the photosphere. The higher temperature of the faculae is evident from their greater light intensity, which, however, may be partly due to their greater height. Carrington and Hodson saw, on September 1, 1859, two faculae break out from the edge of a sunspot. Their splendor was five or six times greater than that of the surrounding parts of the photosphere. That would correspond with a temperature of about 10,000 or 12,000 degrees centigrade. The deeper parts of the sun which broke out on these occasions evidently have a higher temperature, and this is not unnatural since the sun is losing heat by radiation from its outer portions. At all events, the Earth receives a large amount of energy in the form of light and heat, which amounts to three horsepower for every square yard of space perpendicular to the sun's rays. And while this really is not readily available for mechanical purposes, yet solar engines have been constructed in which this energy has been transformed into power. While the energy of the sun is not, generally speaking, available for mechanical purposes, yet indirectly the heat received by the earth has made possible plant and animal life on which depends the source of all energy. The transmission of the sun's heat to the earth is one of the important problems of present-day physics and meteorology, inasmuch as the amount of radiation or heat emitted by the sun, spoken of by physics as the solar constant, and the relation of this radiation to terrestrial temperature, as well as the study of the radiation of different parts of the sun's disks, are all topics of fundamental importance. The solar constant is measured outside of the Earth's atmosphere at mean solar distance, and the intensity of radiation is employed for a unit which, when fully absorbed for one minute over a square centimeter of area placed at right angles to the ray, would produce sufficient heat to raise the temperature of a gram of water one degree centigrade. If once the original quantity and kind of heat emitted by the sun be known, its effect on the constituents of the atmosphere on its journey to the earth, how much of it reaches the soil, how through the change of the atmosphere it maintains the surface temperature of our globe, and finally how in diminished quantity or altered kind it is returned to outer space, 
it would be possible to predict nearly all of the phenomena of the weather thus it has been known that when there is a small decrease in the solar radiation there follows a marked and general decline in temperature so that knowing the variation of radiation it should be possible to predict changes in climate these data are secured by measuring the total intensity of the radiation as it arrives at the earth's surface with the perheliometer or thermometer with blackened bulb carefully protected from all other influences except the direct rays of the sun and in the second place by measuring the heat or energy in different parts of the solar spectrum with the spectrobolometer the absorption of the atmosphere nearer the earth for different areas requires measurements to be made at several stations for at washington near the sea level the intensity of radiation actually observed is only about three-fourths as great as that observed in the clear atmosphere of mount wilson at a height of six thousand feet Recent observations made at Mount Wilson and Washington by Mr. Abbott of the Astrophysical Laboratory of the Smithsonian Institution indicate that heat sent out to the Earth from the Sun in the course of a year is capable of melting an ice shell 114 feet thick over the whole surface of the Earth. The solar radiation is not a constant quantity, but varies with the decrease in solar distance, the changes occurring from month to month and from year to year. The variation is due to the changes in the source of radiation rather than to the effects of our atmosphere or external causes. The distance and position of the Sun as regards the other members of the solar system has been considered in a previous chapter. It is known that its apparent diameter is 32 arc minutes, 4 arc seconds, which corresponds with 866,500 miles, or 109 and a half times the diameter of the Earth. This would give it an area 11,950 times that of the Earth and a volume 1,306,500 times greater. The actual mass of the Sun is 332,000 times that of the Earth, but its average density is only about a quarter as great, so that the Sun, which has a density of 1.41 as compared with water, is four times as large as it would have to be if its density were the same as that of the Earth. Taking into consideration this lightness as well as the high temperatures prevailing in the sun, one is forced to the conclusion that the body of the sun must be in a gaseous state. The conditions under which the gases are found must be quite different from those with which we are acquainted on the earth. Gravity at the surface of the sun exceeds by more than 27 times gravity on the earth. The motion of the sun as regards the other stars in the heavens has been treated elsewhere, but it is proper here to refer to its rotation on its axis from west to east, which takes place in a period of about 25 days and is apparent from the motion of the sun spots, though it can also be detected by directing a spectroscope toward the edges of the limb and noting by Doppler's principle how one side is approaching the observer and the other is retreating. The time of rotation is not the same for all parts of the disk, but depends upon the position of the spots selected. Those nearest the equator show the most rapid rotation. End of section 14. Section 15 of the Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Walt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 11, Mercury. Ancient records make no mention of the discovery of Mercury, Yet the existence of the planet was surely known even in the days of Nineveh, when a chief astronomer directly refers to the planet in a report which he made to King Assurbanipal of Assyria. The planet is occasionally mentioned in early and medieval astronomical literature. It is stated that Copernicus regretted that he had never been able to observe it properly in the high altitude of Frauenberg. That the planet should have been overlooked by the ancients is not strange when it is considered that it is never visible in the higher altitudes except occasionally near the horizon just after sunset or before sunrise in the clear sky over an eastern desert the primeval astronomer doubtless saw this bright star in that part of the horizon 
where the setting sun was still shedding its beams. Its luster diminishes as the planet draws near the horizon at sunset, until finally it sets so soon after the sun that it is invisible. Years may elapse before a similar opportunity is afforded. If a similar phenomenon took place at sunrise, the primitive astronomer might have inferred that Venus and Mercury were identical, especially as a long series of observations would establish the fact that one of these bodies was never seen until the other had disappeared. Accordingly, some of the ancient astronomers assumed that there was but one morning and evening star. But as records accumulated, it was recognized that there were two bodies which might serve as morning and evening stars. A certain regularity in the recurrence of each planet was noted, and it was possible to make predictions of accuracy as to the time when either could be seen after sunset or before sunrise. While by the time of Plato it was known that Venus and Mercury performed their revolutions in approximately the same time, it was recognized that Mercury's period was different and more rapid than that of other planets. An older tradition, attributed to the Egyptians, stated that both planets revolved around the sun. Ptolemy states that they could be regarded as oscillating to and fro on each side of the sun. That the ancient astronomers might well have been confused by the appearance of Mercury as morning and evening star follows from a consideration of the planet's position and motion relatively to the sun and the earth. The consideration, moreover, applies to Venus as well. Quoting C. G. Dolmage's Astronomy of Today, When furthest from us, Mercury is at the other side of the sun, and cannot then be seen owing to the blaze of light. As it continues its journey, it passes to the left of the sun, and is then sufficiently away from the glare to be plainly seen. It next draws in again toward the sun, and is once more lost to view in the blaze at that time of its passing nearest to us. Then it gradually comes out to view on the right hand, separates from the sun up to a certain distance as before, and again recedes beyond the sun, and is for the time being once more lost to view. To these various positions, technical names are given. When the inferior planet is on the far side of the sun from us, it is said to be in superior conjunction. When it has drawn as far as it can to the left hand, and is then as east as possible of the sun, it is said to be at its greatest eastern elongation. Again, when it is passing nearest to us, it is said to be in inferior conjunction. And finally, when it has drawn as far as it can to the right hand, it is spoken of as being at its greatest western elongation. The continual variation in the distance of the inferior planets, Venus and Mercury, from the Earth during their revolution around the Sun, will of course be productive of great alterations in apparent size, which no doubt also had its effect in bewildering the ancients. At superior conjunction, being then farthest away, Mercury ought to show the smallest disk, while at inferior conjunction, being the nearest, it should appear much larger. When at greatest elongation, whether eastern or western, it should naturally present an appearance midway in size between the two. From these considerations, it would seem that the best time for studying the surface of Venus or Mercury is at inferior conjunction, or when the planet is nearest to the Earth. But that this is not the case will at once appear if it is considered that the sun's light is then falling upon the side most distant, leaving the proximate side unilluminated. In superior conjunction, on the other hand, the light falls upon the side of the planet facing the Earth. But the disk is then so small, and the view besides is so dazzled by the proximity of the sun, that observations are of little avail. In the elongations, however, the sunlight comes from the side, and so we see one half of the planet lit up the right half at eastern elongation and the left half at western elongation. Piecing together the results given at these more favorable views, it is possible bit by bit to gather some small knowledge 
concerning the surface of Mercury or Venus. Consequently, it will be seen that the inferior planets show various phases comparable with the waxing and waning of the moon in its monthly round. Superior conjunction is, in fact, similar to full moon, and inferior conjunction to new moon, while the eastern and western elongations may be compared respectively with the moon's first and last quarters. When these phases were first seen by the early telescopic observers, the Copernican theory was felt to be immeasurably strengthened, for it had been pointed out that if this system were correct, the planets Venus and Mercury, were it possible to see them more distinctly, would of necessity present phases when viewed from the Earth. The apparent swing of an inferior planet from side to side of the Sun, at one time on the east side, then passing into and lost in the Sun's rays, to appear once more on the west side, is the explanation of what is meant when one speaks of an evening star or a morning star. Mercury of Venus is called an evening star when it is at its eastern elongation, that is to say, on the left hand of the sun. For being then on the eastern side, it will set after the sun sets, as both sink in their turn below the western horizon at the close of day. Similarly, when either planet is at its western elongation, that is to say, to the right hand of the sun, it will precede him, and so will rise above the eastern horizon before the sun, receiving, therefore, the designation of morning star. Mercury's motions were early studied. With the planet was associated the first of the remarkable astronomical predictions that now have become almost commonplace, so carefully are they worked out by astronomers. Kepler, from his studies of the motions of the planet, was the first to realize that if the orbit of Mercury, which, as has been seen, lies within that of the Earth, and thus nearer the Sun, were exactly circular, and in the plane of the elliptic, a transit of Mercury across the Sun's disk would occur once in each synodical revolution, or period between two successive conjunctions of the planet with the Sun as seen from the Earth. The epoch of the transit could be calculated very easily. But Mercury's orbit is inclined seven degrees to the ecliptic, and is very eccentric, for which reason his calculations were only approximately correct. It was in 1627 that Kepler predicted transits of both Mercury and Venus across the Sun, and assigned the date of November 7th for the former. Gassendi, to whom was entrusted the task of proving Kepler's prophecy, began his observation on the 5th of November, watching the image of the sun formed by a lens on a white screen from light emitted through a hole in a dark room. But Kepler was not in error by as much as that. Only five hours after the time assigned did the transit actually begin. Thus was commenced a series of observations of the time when Mercury crosses the great central luminary of this system. These transits are by no means rare, for thirteen of them were observed in the nineteenth century. They afford opportunity for observation which enables the movements of the planet to be calculated with accuracy. After the transits of 1661 and 1677, Lahir constructed new tables of Mercury and predicted a transit on May 5, 1707. The calculation was in error by nearly a day. After the transit of May 1753 had been observed several hours later than Lahir's, and as much earlier than Halley's prediction, Lalande constructed new tables and predicted the transit of 1786, which actually took place 53 minutes later than the time announced by Lalande, and about as much earlier than the time computed by Halley's tables. Lalande then corrected his tables and predicted the transits of 1789, 1799, and 1802 with a fair approach to accuracy. The tables compiled by Lindenau in 1813 still left much to be desired. The problem of Mercury's motion was in this condition when it was attacked by Le Verrier, who was under no illusion in regard to its difficulty. 
Leverrier did not succeed in overcoming the difficulty until 1859. As a result of his work, supplemented by that of later investigators, astronomers are now in possession of at least fairly accurate information on the subject of the planet's orbital phenomena. It is known, for example, that Mercury is the swiftest in its movements of all the planets. With the exception of some of the satellites, it has an orbit that departs most from the circular form. In other words, an orbit marked not only by the greatest eccentricity, but also by the greatest inclination of all planetary orbits to the ecliptic. This eccentricity of the orbit is such that the sun is seven and one-half million miles out of its center, while the actual distance of the planet from the sun ranges from about 29 million miles to 53 million, or a mean distance of about 36 million of miles. The velocity varies from 35 miles a second when the planet is at perihelion, or nearest the sun, at the pointed end of its oval course, to about 33 miles a second at aphelion. To explain the perturbations in Mercury's motion, Abbe Moreau has recently advanced the following hypothesis. The sun is unquestionably surrounded by matter, which gives rise to the observed phenomena of the corona. Photographs made during the eclipse of 1905 showed an outer corona extending to a hitherto unsuspected distance from the sun. This outer corona is ellipsoidal, and its major axis is very nearly coincident with that of the zodiacal light. This region, then, is filled with a resisting medium, composed of matter which is gradually falling in toward the sun. The mechanism of this fall, or contraction, is very complex, and as we have no idea of the identity of the matter, it is difficult to calculate its changes in form. The resistance which the medium opposes to a moving body is likewise difficult to estimate, but we know from the observed acceleration of comets that this resistance is by no means negligible. At the epochs of maximum coronal development, this resisting medium may easily extend to the orbit of Mercury. Hence, that planet in its revolution around the Sun must traverse masses of rarefied gas and swarms of minute particles by which its course is modified. We are far from knowing the quantitative effect of the resisting medium, and much study of the corona will be required to complete the solution of this interesting problem. Because of the lack of surface markings, the rotation periods are very uncertain. Recently, Professor McCarg in France has deduced a rotation of 24 hours 8 minutes. G. Schiaparelli has put forward the view that both Venus and Mercury rotate in a time equal to the individual period of revolution around the Sun, and thus always turn the same face toward the Sun. Such a motion, which is analogous to that of the Moon around the Earth, could be easily explained as the result of tidal action at some past time when the planets were, to a great extent, fluid. This may be true, as Mercury is one of the planets which has no moon, and consequently will be influenced directly and solely by the sun insofar as tidal phenomena are concerned. These tidal effects must be especially severe on account of the proximity of Mercury to the sun. Because of this lack of a satellite, the mass of the planet is very difficult to determine. At various times, Laplace, Inc., and Leverrier have given values of one-ninth to one-thirtieth of the Earth's mass. The first convenient opportunity of placing this planet in a gravitational balance of determining its mass was presented in August 1835, when Encke's comet, in the course of its eccentric path through the solar system, penetrated within the orbit of Mercury at its perihelion. The attractive power of the planet produced only a slight deviation from the regular course of the comet, sufficient, however, to show that the value previously assumed for Mercury's mass was nearly twice too large. At the same time, the calculations made from these data have not removed the uncertainty that still prevails upon this point. 
Simon Newcomb decided on a value of about one twenty first of that of the earth, while William Harkness made it one twenty fifth. Beyond its motion, comparative little is known of Mercury. The spectroscope seems to indicate that the atmosphere of Mercury contains water vapor just as does the earth, but the studies of Professor Lowell at Flagstaff, Arizona, do not show any signs of clouds or obscurations, and there are no indications of any atmospheric envelope. In fact, the surface of Mercury has been termed colorless, a geography in black and white. The first student of the surface of Mercury was Johann Hieronymus Schroter, 1745 to 1816, who, as will be seen, was a pioneer in the study of the topography of the moon. In April 1792, Schroter concluded from the gradual degradation of light on its brightly illuminated disk that Mercury possessed a tolerably dense atmosphere. During the transit of May 7, 1799, he was struck with the appearance of a ring of softened luminosity circling the planet to a height of three minutes and about a quarter of its own diameter. Referring to this ring as softened luminosity, Agnes Clerk writes in her History of Astronomy, Although a mere thought in texture, it remained persistently visible both with the seven-foot and thirteen-foot reflectors, armed with powers up to 288. A similar appendage had been noticed by de Plantade of Montpellier, November 11, 1736, and again in 1786 and 1789 by Prosperin and Lagargus. But Herschel, on November 9, 1802, saw the preceding limb of the planet projected on the sun cut the luminous solar clouds with the most perfect sharpness. The presence, however, of a halo was unmistakable in 1832, when Professor Moll of Utrecht described it as a nebulous ring of a darker tinge approaching to a violet color. Again, to Sir William Huggins and Stone on November 5, 1868, it showed as lucid and most distinct. No change in the color of the glasses used or the powers applied could get rid of it, and it lasted throughout the transit. It was next seen by Christie and Duncan at Greenwich, May 6, 1878, and with much precision of detail by Tuvalot at Cambridge, Massachusetts. Professor Holden, on the other hand, noted at Hastings-on-Hudson the total absence of all anomalous appearances, nor could any vestige of them be seen by Bernard at Lick on November 10, 1894. Various effects of irradiation and diffraction were, however, observed by Lowell and W. H. Pickering at Flagstaff, and Davidson was favored at San Francisco with a glimpse of the historic aureola, as well as of a central whitish spot which often accompanies it. That both are somehow of optical production can scarcely be doubted. The planet's physical condition presents many problems, and the spectroscope affords little information as to its constitution. As it shines only by reflected light from the sun, its spectrum is but a fine echo of the Fraunhofer lines. An atmosphere like that of the Earth was suspected, however, by H. C. Vogel in 1871 from his spectroscopic studies, though on the very slightest grounds. Later observations made at the Potsdam Observatory by Miller confirm this conclusion and demonstrate that Mercury has a rough rind of dusky rock, which absorbs all but 17% of the direct light radiated upon it by the nearby sun. This would seem to show the utter absence of any appreciable Mercurian atmosphere. The probable lack of atmosphere is also shown by the circumstance that when Mercury is just about to transit the face of the sun, no ring of diffused light is seen to encircle its disk, as would be the case if it possessed an atmosphere. According to the Belgian astronomer Strubont, the linear diameter of Mercury expressed as a fraction of the Earth's is 0 0.350, instead of the previously accepted 0 0.373, the radius, 2,232 kilometers, 1,386.7 miles, and the volume compared with that of Earth is 
zero point zero four two. End of section fifteen. Section sixteen of the Science History of the Universe, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 12, Part 1. For all time, Venus has been known as Evening and Morning Star. By the ancients, it was supposed to be two separate bodies, which were named Phosphorus, Lucifer, or Morning Star, and Hesperus, Vesper, or Evening Star. For Pythagoras, in the 6th century BC, is claimed the honor of discovering the identity of the two stars, but it was probable that he restated the views of Eastern astronomers. As the most brilliant star in the heavens, Venus is certainly the one that has always been most observed. Glittering in the sky like a clear diamond, its pure white light, which on a night where there is no moon, is strong enough to cast a shadow, naturally would impress all whose lives are spent out of doors. Hence Venus has always figured in literature as the shepherd's star. Homer speaks of the planet as Callistus, the beautiful, and as a type of beauty, its worship figures in all mythologies. At a time when the planets were personified as gods and goddesses, it is easy to understand why this star was selected to typify love. Not only on account of its splendor in the evening sky, but for other phenomena, Venus is familiar in history and literature. The historian Varro, 116 to 28 BC, states that Aeneas, on his voyage from Troy to Italy, saw this planet constantly above the horizon, and the same historian is quoted by St. Augustine as speaking of a change in the color and brilliancy of Venus. In 1716, the visibility of Venus in full daylight was hailed as a marvel by the people of London, and in 1750, its appearance at noon aroused general astonishment in Paris. Again, in 1797, when Napoleon returned to Paris from his conquest of Italy, he found the attention of the populace divided between his reappearance and a similar striking midday phenomenon. In fact, Bonaparte always associated this star with his fortunes, and one evening, while engaged in viewing the starry heavens, pointing to the planet, said to Prince Talleyrand, Do you see? That is my star. So long as it shines, I will have no doubt of success. In more recent times, many brilliant appearances of the planet have been observed. The interval between periods of greatest visibility amounting to eight years. At one of these in April 1905 at Cherbourg, Venus appeared as a bright meteor of appreciable size and full form, an effect which was due partly to the formation of a halo. According to the Ptolemaic theory, Venus was always between the Earth and the supposed orbit of the Sun. Hence, it was possible that, at the most, but half of its illuminated surface could be visible to the Earth. When Galileo, with his telescope in 1610, made the striking discovery that Venus appeared in various phases, just as the moon, exhibiting the gibbous as well as the crescent phase, it was a strong and almost the last argument necessary to establish beyond question the Copernican theory that the planets revolve around the sun. Were Venus as large as Jupiter, for example, the phases would readily be discerned by the unaided eye. Indeed, Sir Robert Ball has wondered what would have been the effect on the history of astronomy had Venus been of the size of Jupiter, so that its crescent form could have been seen without a telescope. Then the elementary truth would have been apparent that Venus was a dark body revolving around the sun. The analogy between it and our Earth would have been at once perceived, and the theory of Copernicus long since might have been established. 
the mean distance of venus from the sun is sixty seven million two hundred thousand miles with the exception of the moon and an occasional comet no other heavenly body comes so near the earth at any time the orbit is marked by the smallest eccentricity in the planetary system and is therefore more nearly circular than that of any other planet the planet's greatest and least distance from the sun vary from the mean only by about four hundred seventy thousand miles each way venus is the nearest planet to the earth as there is only twenty six million miles between the orbits of the two at inferior conjunction or their nearest approach yet venus is not as well known as mars since when venus passes nearest the earth it is then between it and the sun so that the hemisphere which is illuminated is not visible to the earth the appearance of venus in the sky as the evening and the morning star was no less impressive to the ancients than the beautiful character of the star itself it is as familiar now as it was to the shepherds of old that when venus disengages himself in the evening from the rays of the setting sun it departs from the sun a little more every night increasing its brilliancy until a certain distance in the east is reached appearing like the moon to travel toward the left of the observer at the end of a few months it has removed itself from the sun to an angular distance that may amount to as much as forty eight at which time the planet sets more than three hours after the sun after shining for some months little by little the planet begins to return toward the sun receding more and more from the earth then passing behind the central luminary and thus ceasing to be the evening star after an interval a new star is seen in the early morning to precede the rising of the sun advancing by imperceptible degrees every day and eclipsing likewise all the bodies of the heavens by its dazzling light at this time it proceeds toward the west that is toward the observer's right hand and we have now the morning star after having preceded the rising of the sun by three hours venus resumes its course anew toward the sun and again is lost in the glare of day it is then passing between the sun and the earth and is at its greatest proximity to the earth sometimes it passes just in front of the sun as it did in eighteen seventy four and eighteen eighty two which phenomenon is known as a transit as it happens but twice in a century a transit is an occurrence of considerable importance to astronomers these transits are valuable for the easy determination of the position of the planet for the investigation of its atmosphere and for the determination of the solar parallax by comparing the amount of apparent displacement in the planet's path across the solar disk when the transit is observed at widely separated stations on the earth's surface these transits occur in june and december taking place in cycles whose intervals are eight one hundred five point five eight one hundred twenty one point five years they have occurred on the following dates december seventh sixteen thirty one december twenty fourth sixteen thirty nine june fifth seventeen sixty one june third seventeen sixty nine december ninth eighteen seventy four december sixth eighteen eighty two and will occur again on june eighth two thousand four and june sixth two thousand twelve the first observed transit namely that of sixteen thirty nine was watched in england by two persons jeremiah horrocks and a friend william crabtree whom horrocks had forewarned of its occurrence that the transit was observed at all was due entirely to the remarkable ability of horrocks according to the calculations of kepler no transit could take place that year sixteen thirty nine as the planet would just pass clear of the lower edge of the sun horrocks however worked the question out for himself and came to the conclusion that the planet would actually traverse the lower portion of the sun's disk the event proved him to be right horrocks who was said to have been a veritable prodigy of astronomical skill unfortunately died about two years after the celebrated transit in his twenty-second year 
the transits of venus next observed in seventeen sixty one and seventeen sixty nine were taken advantage of by edmund halley to suggest a means of ascertaining the distance of the sun the idea had originated in rather vague form with kepler but was suggested more definitely by james gregory in sixteen sixty three after halley had observed the transit of mercury in sixteen seventy seven he realized the advantages of the method and published several papers urging preparations for observing the transit he pointed out says berry treating of this point in his short history of astronomy that the desired result could be deduced from a comparison of the durations of the transit of venus as seen from different stations of the earth i e of the intervals between the first appearance of venus on the sun's disk and the final disappearance as seen at two or more different stations he estimated moreover that this interval of time which would be several hours in length could be measured with an error of only about two seconds and that in consequence the method might be relied upon to give the distance of the sun to about one five hundredth part of its true value as the current estimates of the sun's distance differed among one another by twenty or thirty per cent the new method expounded with halley's customary lucidity was an enthusiasm not unnaturally stimulated astronomers to take great trouble to carry out halley's recommendations the results however were by no means equal to halley's expectations immense trouble was taken by governments academies and private persons in arranging for the observation of the transits of seventeen sixty one and seventeen sixty nine for the former observing parties were sent as far as to Blosk, st helena the cape of good hope and india while observations were also made by astronomers at greenwich paris vienna Uppsala, and elsewhere in europe the next following transit was observed on an even larger scale the station selected ranging from siberia to california from the varunger fjord to odahite where no less famous a person than captain cook was placed and from hudson's bay to madras the expeditions organized on this occasion by the american philosophical society may be regarded as the first of the contributions made by america to the science which has since owed so much to her while the empress catherine of russia were witness to the newly acquired civilization of her country by establishing a number of observing stations on the soil of her empire a variety of causes prevented the moments of contact between the disks of venus and the sun from being observed with the precision that had been hoped the values of the parallax of the sun deduced from the earlier of the two transits ranged between eight minutes and ten minutes while those obtained in seventeen sixty nine though much more consistent still varied between eight minutes and nine minutes corresponding with a variation of about ten million miles in the distance of the sun the whole set of observations was subsequently very elaborately discussed in eighteen twenty two to eighteen twenty four and again in eighteen thirty five by johann franz Encke, who deduced a parallax of eight minutes fifty seven seconds corresponding with a distance of ninety five million three hundred seventy thousand miles a number which long remained classical the uncertainty of the data is shown by the fact that other equally competent astronomers have deduced from the observations of seventeen sixty nine parallaxes of eight minutes point eight and eight minutes point nine end of section sixteen section seventeen of the science history of the universe volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 12, Part 2. The transits of Venus in 1874 and 1882 were memorable as the first in which photographic methods 
and the heliometer were applied in addition to the older methods of time observation to measure the occasion of contact the older methods left unavailable the remainder of the transit but the heliometer made it possible to ascertain the planet's apparent position upon the sun's disk at any time with great precision in the transit of eighteen seventy four the most elaborate photographic measures ever undertaken until this time were carried out in the united states where conditions were most favorable a continuous succession of photographs was made as the planet traveled across the sun's disk and various systems of reference enabled its position to be identified with great accuracy at any part of the transit yet results were hardly more valuable than those obtained by other methods hence in eighteen eighty two the american observers modified their apparatus considerably from previous practice by employing the photographic plate and using the heliostat to reflect the sun's rays through a telescope lens five inches in diameter and of forty foot focal length doubtless better results could be obtained today with modern solar photographic equipment and dry plates no great advances were recorded as the result of the numerous expeditions during these two transits elaborate expeditions were equipped particularly for the second of the two transits and the observations which were voluminous were thoroughly and systematically discussed the results were a somewhat larger value of the solar parallax amounting to eight minutes point eight five seven or rather less than ninety three million miles as obtained by newcomb after combining the heliometer with photographic measurements as all measurements of this kind seem to be affected by some constant systematic error it is the consensus of opinion among astronomers that other methods are more to be trusted in determining the solar parallax than those based on the transits of venus the great brilliancy of venus is due to its relatively small distance from the sun and the earth and to its great reflecting power the albedo of venus or the ratio of reflected to incident light is zero point seven six in other words the planet reflects three-fourths of the light that falls upon it from the sun a proportion which is little exceeded by freshly fallen snow this indicates that venus is surrounded by a dense and cloudy atmosphere similar indications are given by the spectroscope pointing to the existence of an atmosphere containing water vapor and generally similar to our own but denser this atmosphere of venus owing to its great refractive power sometimes appears as a luminous ring in transits of the planet from observations made at the transit of eighteen eighty two it has been computed that the density of the atmosphere of venus is one point eight that of the earth's atmosphere which produces a refractive displacement of thirty three minutes according to medler's calculations the atmosphere of venus is one point seven times as dense as that of the earth many astronomers believe therefore that venus is surrounded by a dense atmosphere into which the sun's rays do not penetrate to a depth sufficient to cause much loss by absorption probably because they are reflected by opaque clouds from this it would follow that the markings which have been observed on the disk of venus through the telescope for centuries may be purely atmospheric as the displacement of the surface markings of a planet when viewed through a telescope furnish the basis for estimates of the period of rotation it may be that calculations so made are without justification these markings of venus are altogether different from those of any other planet they are faint indistinct and apparently variable for the drawings of venus made by different observers before the advent of photography are very unlike the first astronomer to observe any markings on venus was domenico cassini who discovered a bright spot in sixteen sixty six in the following year he discovered a second spot from which he deduced a period rotation of about twenty four hours an estimate which was reduced to twenty three hours and twenty two minutes in jacques cassini's revision of his father's work on the other hand bianchini who studied the planet in seventeen twenty six and seventeen twenty seven deduced from his observations 
a period of rotation equal to twenty-four days and eight hours. Thus began the long and violent controversy in regard to the rotation of Venus. For more than ten thousand observations made between 1830 and 1841, De Vico computed a mean value of 23 hours, 21 minutes, and 23.93 seconds for the period of rotation of Venus. This value, furthermore, agrees very closely with the period of 23 hours deduced by Schroter from observations of the deformation of the horns of Venus, 1788-1793, and it has consequently been adopted in most treatises on astronomy. But in 1890, however, belief in the short period was shaken by Schiaparelli's discoveries. Before this, Schiaparelli had made this surprising announcement that the period of rotation of Mercury was equal to the period of its revolution about the Sun, and he now asserted that the same law governed the motions of Venus, a statement based on observations made in the winter of 1877-78 which showed that the bright spots then visible never varied their positions with respect to the terminator, or boundary line between the planet and its shadow. Observations made in 1895 gave additional support to the view that Venus rotates on her axis in the period of her revolution about the Sun, 225 days, and consequently always turns the same hemisphere toward the Sun just as the moon always presents the same face to the earth. This theory, which on its announcement rested solely on Schiaparelli's authority, soon obtained strong independent support. It has apparently been completely confirmed by the observations made by Lowell at Flagstaff, Arizona in 1895-6. Lowell saw markings that have been seen by no other astronomer before or since, but the most surprising thing about his discoveries is that he saw no spots, but only bands or lines bearing a superficial resemblance to the canals of Mars. The whole configuration remained unchanged for hours, which could not be the case if the period rotation were only 24 hours. Furthermore, the markings remained fixed relatively to the terminator. Lowell denies the existence of clouds on Venus, although he finds in certain phenomena of twilight evidence of the presence of a very dense atmosphere. Many astronomers have refused to accept the conclusions of Schiaparelli, Perotin, and Lowell, and have adhered to the theory of a short period of rotation. Schiaparelli's first announcement was vigorously disputed, soon after its publication, by the French astronomer Trouvelot. During his residence at Cambridge, Massachusetts, from 1875 to 1882, Trouvelot pointed out 17 changes in the markings which Schiaparelli regarded as fixed. Trouvelot regarded the bright spots on the limb of the planet as very high mountains rising above the atmosphere. The observed changes in the appearance of the horns of the crescent planet have also been ascribed to mountains. In the 18th century, Schroter announced the discovery of several mountains on Venus. In 1789, the southern horn of the crescent appeared blunted, and near it on the dark disk of the planet shone a bright peak, the height of which was estimated by Schroter as 117,000 feet, or 22 miles. Truffolo deduced from his own observations a period of rotation of about 24 hours. It is very remarkable that two such experienced and trustworthy observers as Schiaparelli and Trouvelot could be led to such widely differing results from their frequent observations of the same object during the same period. It may be regarded as certain that the problem of the rotation of Venus cannot be solved by observing markings, which is not surprising if they are purely atmospheric phenomena. Sir William Herschel, who has justly been called the greatest observer of all time, doubted the reality of the markings of Venus and regarded them as atmospheric phenomena. But this view was not shared by any of his contemporaries. Beer and Medler, who were also most excellent observers, studied Venus repeatedly in 1831 and later years, but they rarely if ever saw anything that deserved the name of a marking. 
attempts have been made to solve the interesting and difficult problem of the rotation of venus with the aid of the spectroscope but these attempts have also failed to give a positive result the effort was first made by the russian spectroscopist jelopolsky at pulkawa observatory the spectrophotographic measurements which were begun in nineteen hundred indicated a short period of rotation although jelopolsky did not regard the correctness of the result as assured his authority led to the belief that the spectroscope had decided the question in favor of the short period then lowell who had deduced a period of two hundred twenty five days from telescopic observations sought confirmation for this value by the spectroscopic method he first tested his new and delicate apparatus and method by applying them to mars and obtained for that planet a period of rotation of twenty five hours and thirty five minutes which agrees fairly well with the known period twenty four hours and thirty seven minutes for venus low spectrophotographs give a rotational velocity of from five to eight meters sixteen point four to twenty six point two feet per second which corresponds with a long period of rotation though one much shorter than two hundred twenty five days for which the equatorial velocity would be about two meters six point five six feet per second neither of the results obtained at pulkawa and at flagstaff has yet been confirmed elsewhere the spectroscopic method is too difficult to be attempted except by a particularly well-equipped and favorably situated observatory the theory of slow rotation receives powerful support from certain arguments advanced by the distinguished english astronomer sir george h darwin the rotational velocity of every planet must be gradually diminished by tidal friction among its parts in this way the period of the moon's rotation has been made equal to the period of her rotation about the earth and the rotational periods of mercury and venus may have been similarly lengthened to equality with their periods of revolution about the sun which exerts a far greater tidal action upon these inferior planets than upon the earth if venus has already reached this stage all the water on the planet must be accumulated in the form of ice on the dark and intensely cold hemisphere hence as antoniadi has pointed out the presence of clouds and water vapor on the illuminated hemisphere casts grave doubt on the correctness of schiaparelli's theory the presence of clouds in the atmosphere of venus is denied only by lowell who saw the peculiar canal-like markings distinctly whenever terrestrial atmospheric conditions permitted no trace of markings by the way was seen by hansky and stefanik who studied the planet in the summer of nineteen o seven at the mont blanc observatory which is more elevated than flagstaff under very favorable atmospheric conditions and deduced a period of rotation slightly less than twenty-four hours so the problem of the rotation of venus is still unsolved although a majority of astronomers appear to share the view of schiaparelli and lowell the hope that it can be solved by observing markings has proved illusory and there is good reason to believe that the spectroscope will ultimately furnish the solution venus in size is almost identical with the earth its diameter expressed in miles is seven thousand eight hundred as compared with seven thousand nine hundred twenty for the earth its circumference consequently amounts to twenty three thousand four hundred miles as compared with twenty five thousand miles that of the earth the period of revolution around the sun is two hundred twenty five days for many years observers have been looking for satellites of venus fontana sixteen forty five cassini sixteen seventy two and sixteen eighty six and montaigne seventeen sixty one among others imagined that they had made such a discovery but these have for many years been considered optical illusions end of section seventeen Section 18 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 13, Part 1. The Earth. The conception of the Earth formulated by the ancients assumed it to be a flat disk floating on water, which idea persisted in some form or other despite various phenomena clearly impossible of explanation upon such a hypothesis. After some more or less vague speculation on the shape of the Earth by Thales, circa 640 to circa 546 B.C., a clear and rational idea was advanced by Pythagoras, who flourished in the 6th century B.C., and taught that the earth in common with the heavenly bodies was a sphere, and that it received no support at the center of the universe. The idea of the sphericity of the earth was doubtless derived by analogy from the appearance of the moon. The theory became an established part of Greek science and philosophy, and consequently has continued to the present day, anticipating by some two thousand years the acceptance of the belief in the earth's rotation in fact the spherical form of the earth figured prominently in greek astronomy and the division of the earth into zones and the idea of poles was promulgated by the alexandrian philosophers and even before their time indeed not only did they realize the shape of the earth but also its size eratosthenes 276 to 195 or 196 B.C., whom we have already mentioned in our chapter on pre-telescopic work, made one of the first scientific measurements of the Earth, obtaining a result which must be considered the first good geodetic measurement. He found, from the application of simple geometry, that the angular distance of the Earth's surface between Alexandria and Cyrene must be one-fiftieth of the circumference of the Earth. Posidonius, who was born about the end of the life of Hipparchus, made a new measurement of the circumference of the Earth, much after the fashion of Aristothenes, but reached a value too small. One of the crucial arguments for the sphericity of the Earth is that when a ship sails away the hull first disappears from view, while the masts are visible. This was first advanced by Pliny, 23 to 79 A.D. From the Greeks and Romans to the Arabs may be a far journey, but little was done in the study of the earth until the Arab astronomers of Baghdad, under the patronage of Caliph al-Mamun, made a series of measurements of a meridian of the earth, which agreed with those of Ptolemy. These measurements virtually sufficed until Willebrod Snell, 1591 to 1626, a Dutch mathematician who had discovered the law of the refraction of light, made a series of measurements of the Earth's surface from which he computed the length of a degree of a meridian to be about 67 miles, an estimate subsequently corrected to about 69 miles by one of his pupils, and differing but a few hundred feet from the value now accepted. A measurement by Richard Norwood, circa 1590 to 1675, of the distance from London to York, made in 1636, enabled a degree of latitude to be obtained with an error of less than half a mile, and finally Picard, in 1671, made a measurement of this quantity, which we have seen was sufficiently accurate to be used by Newton in computing the mass and motion of the earth and in demonstrating his law of gravitation. This outline shows that the spherical shape of the earth was constantly held in mind by scientists for about 2,500 years. Other views of the earth's shape also obtained. The idea of a flat earth had to be vigorously opposed by arguments founded on experiment, observation, and discovery. After the phenomenon of a disappearing ship, one of the most important of the arguments against the flatness of the Earth's surface was based on the different elevations of the pole star in the sky, depending upon the position of the observer. Now the pole star and the surrounding stars, though they may be at different heights in the sky, form the same pattern wherever on the Earth's surface they are seen, 
thus showing that they are immensely distant and that lines from all points of the earth's surface directed to the pole star would be parallel or have the same direction as one travels north it is seen that the pole star sinks lower and lower in the heavens or has a greater angular distance from our zenith if the earth were flat this would not be the case for an angular distance of seven and a half degrees difference in the position of two stations five hundred and twenty miles apart in a north and south line would mean that the star is only three thousand four hundred and fifty miles distant which is manifestly impossible furthermore it is a well-known experience that in crossing the atlantic from england to the united states the sun by a watch rises an hour later for every six hundred miles we travel west if the earth were flat the sun would rise at the same instant over its entire surface to answer both these conditions namely the sinking in the heavens of the pole star and the equal delays in the time of sunrise in traveling equal distances a round globe is required still the globular form of the earth was not accepted generally until after the historic voyage of christopher columbus and that epoch of exploration and discovery which resulted in the circumnavigation of the earth in fifteen nineteen after the demonstration of the sphericity of the earth came the determination of its exact figure by the systematic measuring of arcs of meridians when the results were mathematically examined the conclusion was reached that the earth was not a perfect sphere but flattened at the ends or in other words that it was an oblate spheroid newton in his principia published in sixteen eighty seven showed from theoretical considerations that the earth bulged out at the equatorial regions on the other hand in the following century in seventeen forty five the cassinis who were leading astronomers of france and deeply interested in the measurement of the earth's surface maintained that the earth was contracted at the equator and bulged at the poles or in other words was prolate the difference in the two ideas being concisely expressed by professor moulton who likens newton's idea of the earth's figure to an orange and that of the cassinis to a lemon it is interesting that newton's proof of the oblateness of the earth anticipated the direct observations of the astronomer and geodesist today it can be demonstrated in simple form by means of observations of the time of vibration of a pendulum such as are carried on systematically by such scientific agencies as the united states coast and geodetic survey it is possible to supply various mathematical proofs of the oblateness of the earth in connection with its motions and with its relations to the moon and to the solar system but these hardly concern us in the present pages and we may dismiss the matter with the assertion that the ellipticity of the earth as determined by harkness in eighteen ninety one amounts to one three hundredth as compared with a value of one two hundred and ninety fifth established in eighteen sixty six by colonel clark of the english ordnance survey and accepted for many years as a standard and one two hundred and thirtieth as was given by newton for the ellipticity of a meridian section of this oblate spheroid clark's spheroid of eighteen sixty six which is generally adopted in geodetic and other computations would give a radius at the equator of three thousand nine hundred and sixty three point three zero seven miles and three thousand nine hundred and forty nine point eight seven one miles at the poles these figures having been slightly corrected in eighteen seventy eight in the second place of decimals the radius of the earth is in many ways a fundamental measure especially in astronomy and for that reason its determination is a matter of no small importance thus observations made with a view of finding the distance of the moon when discussed and reduced simply give us this distance in terms of the equatorial radius of the earth so that to determine the distance in miles we must know the number of miles in the earth's radius as a consequence of the spheroidal shape of the earth a degree of latitude as well as of longitude varies with the point at which it is measured thus at the equator 
one degree of latitude is equal to 68.704 miles, but at the pole a similar degree is equal to 69.407 miles. The difference in a degree measured on the parallels of latitude, which are small circles, is of course obvious, and while at the equator a degree of longitude amounts to 69.652 miles, at latitude 40 degrees, or approximately that of New York, 40 degrees 43 minutes, it would equal 53.431 miles, and at the North Pole it would decrease, of course, to zero. Newton, in his researches on gravitation, by comparing the attraction exerted by the Earth with that of the Sun and other bodies, was able to connect its mass with that of the planets and Sun. The problem of determining the mass of the whole Earth in terms of a given terrestrial body, that is, in tons, pounds, or kilograms, was indeed a serious one, and it was first attacked in Great Britain by Neville Maskelyne, 1732-1811, who was Astronomer Royal. If we know the volume of the earth and its density, referred to some standard as water, air, or iron, it is, of course, easy to determine its mass. But the determination of its density is no less a problem than the determination of its mass directly. It is possible, of course, to compute the relative amount of water, but this gives only a small amount of the mere surface of the earth. We can descend in mine shafts a mile or more, and investigate the nature of the material, but this again affords no clue to the thousands of feet of materials below, so that an estimate of the average density based on such data cannot be considered at all trustworthy. Newton, taking into consideration the various elements of the earth, estimated its density at between five and six times that of water. Maskeline, however, bearing in mind the phenomenon of the deflection of the plumb line observed by Bouguer and Le Condamine in their expedition to measure an arc of latitude in Peru, a phenomenon caused by the attraction of the mountain Chimborazo, selected the narrow ridge of Chehalien in Perthshire, and found that the attraction of the mountain caused a deflection of about 12 seconds on each side of the ridge. This attraction of the mountain as compared with the attraction of the earth on the plumbob enabled a value for the density of the earth of about four and a half times that of water to be obtained. It remained for the famous Cavendish experiment carried out by Henry Cavendish, 1731 to 1810, to substitute for the mountain a pair of heavy balls. This gave a value for the density of the earth of five and a half times that of water, a value confirmed by numerous repetitions of Cavendish's classical experiment. Expressed in pounds, the mass of the earth is a little more than 13 billion billion, a figure that the human mind utterly fails to grasp. There must have been a time when the earth contained much more heat than at present. The sun is not supplying heat enough to make good the losses sustained by the globe. These losses must have been taking place over a period of countless years, one is forced to believe that not only once was our earth much hotter than at present, but that its temperature was a red heat. Going back still further, the now solid globe must have been actually a molten mass. Being a molten mass, it is not difficult to realize that it readily assumed a globular form on its journey through space. A falling drop of rain is a globe. A drop of oil suspended in a liquid with which it does not mix has a spherical shape. Therefore, if a mass of material as large as the earth were so soft that its individual particles obeyed the forces of attraction exerted by each part of the mass on all the other parts, it is quite obvious that it would assume a globular shape, especially under the influence of motion. If this great sphere were caused to rotate around its axis like a ball of clay on a potter's wheel, any lack of true sphericity would not only be overcome, but there would be a tendency for the molten body to bulge at the equator and flatten down at the poles, forming an oblate spheroid, such as by actual measurement the earth is found to be. Indeed, not only is the earth an oblate spheroid, but most of the planets which can be measured have become flattened at the poles for the same reason. In connection with the spherical shape of the earth, mention should be made of a recent theory which seeks to demonstrate 
that the shape of the earth is being transformed into a polyhedral form, or more exactly, that there is a tendency in the direction of its assuming the figure of a regular tetrahedron or four-sided figure, each of whose faces is triangular. This is manifested by the lithosphere or solid portion of the earth. The water is massed on the faces of such a tetrahedron, the force of gravity acting most powerfully at the center of each of the four surfaces. The tetrahedron hypothesis assumes that a more or less solid crust was formed when the earth was still perhaps in an approximately spheroidal form. As contraction occurred in the interior, the external shell proved too large. Hence, a different form has to be assumed, which it is asserted would be the tetrahedral. On each of the faces of such a tetrahedron, one of the four oceans would lie, the Arctic Ocean being assumed as the fourth for the region about the North Pole. The continents would correspond with North and South America, Euro-Africa, Asia-Australia, and Antarctica. This hypothesis is borne out in many respects by geological and other considerations. First advanced in the 70s of the 19th century by Lothian Green, the hypothesis has been put forward in recent years with further developments and attempts at its proof, so that it is considered as a tenable and possible explanation, though its absolute soundness has not been demonstrated. Recognizing and proving the spherical shape of the earth by no means explains the apparent motion of the sun, moon, and stars as regards the planet. As the nature of the solar system was developed by Copernicus and Newton, people were compelled to recognize that the earth revolved around the sun, and furthermore, that it rotated daily about its axis. These motions are necessary to explain various phenomena. For example, when a body moves in a circle, a force is needed to act on it, pulling toward the center proportionally to the square of the rate of spin, and proportionally to the distance. Every pound of mass in the moon would need a pull equal to about the weight of three ounces to keep it in a circle which it traveled around once in 24 hours. Every pound in the sun would need a pull about three-quarters of a hundred weight. The nearest fixed star would need a pull on every pound of about 9,000 tons. One cannot imagine that the earth could exert such forces, and so are obliged to think that the earth is revolving and not the sky. Final proof of the rotation of the earth was furnished in the middle of the last century by Foucault. His experiments were constantly repeated in physical laboratories and experimental lectures. From the dome of the Pantheon in Paris, he suspended a heavy ball by a fine cord and caused it to swing in a single plane. The path of the ball across the floor could be traced, and it was found that after it had been in vibration for some time, it was swinging in a different direction from that in which it had started. The reason was that the floor had revolved under the ball with the rotation of the earth. The daily rotation of the earth on its axis and its yearly rotation about the sun supply us with our means of measuring time. According to Professor Pointing, quote, the earth is a clock. The line to the sun is the finger, and the sky is the face. But the earth is not a regular timekeeper. Our 24-hour day is only the average between successive noons or times when the sun is due south. If compared with a good clock, the sun is in parts of the year too soon and in other parts too late, sometimes as much as a quarter of an hour. This cannot be due to change in the earth's rate of spin, for to change a spin, there must be either a force acting at one side of the center of gravity or a change of shape. The forces on the earth exerted by the sun and moon act almost exactly through the center of gravity and so affect the rate of spin hardly at all. The earth does not change its shape sufficiently to account for the variation in the solar day. The variation in the solar day is due partly to the inclination of the Earth's axis to the plane in which it moves around the Sun, partly to variation of the Earth's motion around the Sun at different times of the year. The fixed stars keep good time getting round in about four minutes less than 24 hours. By them, clocks are rated. Their day is the true time of one rotation of the Earth. Unquote. End of section 18. Section 19 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 13. The Earth, Part 2. Among the movements of the Earth, there is one that is so minute as to be of peculiar interest to the astronomer. It is a small displacement or wobbling of the axis of the Earth, or theoretical pole. This pole shifts its place through a circle of some few yards in diameter in the course of a period of somewhat over a year, and as a result there is a variation of latitude on the Earth's surface. This was discovered first in 1884 and 1885 by Dr. Kusner at Berlin, and after observations made at various stations by members of the International Geodetic Association in 1888, it was found that this synchronous variation was occurring in a periodic manner at a number of stations. The general nature of the occurrence was defined by Professor S. C. Chandler in 1891, who stated that the pole of the earth might be supposed to describe a circle with a radius of 30 feet in a period of 14 months. One reason assigned for this phenomenon is a change in the distribution of mass due to the temporary occurrence of heavy falls of snow or rain limited to one continent, or to the transportation of great bodies of water and air from place to place by atmospheric or sea currents, so that the globe is made slightly lopsided and temporarily to forsake its normal axis. Also, it has been supposed that the earth is not absolutely rigid. As a quasi-plastic mass, it would yield to certain strains, which tend to protract the time of circulation of the displaced pole. In fact, in all consideration of the various phenomena of gravitation and tides, we have to recognize that in practice the astronomer of today is not dealing with the theoretically rigid body of Newton and the earlier mathematicians. One of the important conditions of the rotation of the Earth is that it moves around an axis which is not vertical but which is inclined toward the plane of its orbit. Dolmage, in his volume Astronomy of Today, tells us that, quote, if the axis of the earth stood straight up, so to speak, while the earth revolved in its orbit, the sun would plainly keep always on a level with the equator. This is equivalent to stating that in such circumstances, a person at the equator would see it rise every morning exactly in the east, pass through the zenith, that is the point directly overhead of him at midday, and set in the evening due in the west. As this would go on unchangingly at the equator every day throughout the year, it should be clear that at any particular place upon the earth, the sun would in these conditions always be seen to move in an unvarying manner across the sky at a certain altitude, depending upon the latitude of the place. Thus the more north one went upon the earth's surface, the more southerly in the sky would the sun's path lie, while at the North Pole itself the sun would always run round and round the horizon. Similarly, the more south one went from the equator, the more northerly would the path of the sun lie, while at the South Pole it would be seen to skirt the horizon in the same manner as at the North Pole. The result of such an arrangement would be that each place upon the earth would always have one unvarying climate, in which case there would not exist any of those beneficial changes of season to which we owe so much. The changes of season which we fortunately experience are due, however, to the fact that the sun does not appear to move across the sky each day at one unvarying altitude, but is continually altering the position of its path so that at one period of the year it passes across the sky low down, while at the other it moves high up across the heavens and is above the horizon for a much longer time. Actually the sun seems little by little to creep up the sky during one half of the year, namely from midwinter to midsummer, 
and then just as gradually to slip down it again during the other half, namely from midsummer to midwinter. It will therefore be clear that every region of the earth is much more thoroughly warmed during one portion of the year than during another, that is, when the sun's path is high in the heavens than when it is low down. Once more we find appearances exactly the contrary from the truth. The earth is, in this case, the real cause of the deception, just as it was in the other cases. The sun does not actually creep slowly up the sky and then slowly dip down it again, but owing to the earth's axis being set aslant, different regions of the earth's surface are presented to the sun at different times. Thus in one portion of its orbit, the northerly regions of the earth are presented to the sun, and in the other portion, the southerly. It follows, of course, from this, that when it is summer in the northern hemisphere, it is winter in the southern and vice versa. The fact that in consequence of the slant of the earth's axis, the sun is for part of the year on the north side of the equator and part of the year on the south side leads to a very peculiar result. The path of the moon around the earth is nearly on the same plane with the earth's path around the sun. The moon, therefore, always keeps to the same regions of the sky as the sun. The slant of the earth's axis thus regularly displaces the position of both the sun and the moon to the north and south sides of the equator, respectively, in the manner we have been describing. Were the earth, however, a perfect sphere, such change of position would not produce any effect. At present, the north pole of the heavens is quite close to a bright star in the tail of the constellation of the Little Bear, which is consequently known as the Pole Star, but in early Greek times it was at least ten times as far away from this star as it is now. After some twelve thousand years, the pole will point to the constellation of Lyra and Vega. The most brilliant star in that constellation will then be considered as the pole star. This slow twisting of the earth is technically known as precession, or the precession of the equinoxes. We have seen that the orbit of the earth is an ellipse and that the sun is situated at what is called the focus, a point not in the middle of the ellipse, but rather toward one of its ends. Therefore, during the course of the year, the distance of the earth from the sun varies. The sun, in consequence of this, is about three million miles nearer to us in our northern winter than it is in our northern summer a statement which sounds somewhat paradoxical. This variation in distance, large as it appears in figures, cannot, however, be productive of much alteration in the amount of solar heat which we receive, for during the first week in January, when the distance is least, the sun only looks about one-eighteenth broader than at the commencement of July, when the distance is greatest. The great disparity in temperature between winter and summer depends as we have seen, upon causes of quite another kind, and varies between such wide limits that the effects of this slight alteration in the distance of the sun from the earth may be neglected for practical purposes." End quote. The most striking effect of gravitation in its universal aspect is seen on the earth in the case of the tides, which are due to the attraction of the moon on the earth and especially on the waters of its ocean. While the ancients could not explain the cause of the daily change in the tides, the phenomenon was obvious to all mariners or those dwelling by the sea or even on great rivers. The connection of the moon with this phenomenon, it is claimed, was understood as early as 1000 BC by the Chinese, for at full and new moon exceptionally high tides were observed, and the name of spring tides was applied as contrasted with the minimum high water which was observed at the neap tides at the second and fourth quarters of the moon. Not only the Chinese, but the Greeks and Romans noticed this same phenomenon, and Julius Caesar in his commentaries tells us that when he was embarking his troops for Britain, the tide was high because the moon was full, while both Pliny and Aristotle connect the time of high water with the age of the moon. The connection between the moon and the tide was thus early established and practically applied by navigators who were quick to realize the nature of the phenomenon, 
even though they and the astronomers were unable to present any satisfactory explanation. A general explanation of the tides as due to the disturbing action of the moon and sun, especially the former, was put forward by Newton. Newton's explanation, as described by Berry in his short history of astronomy, was as follows, quote, If the earth be regarded as made of a solid spherical nucleus covered by the ocean, then the moon attracts different parts unequally, and in particular the attraction measured by the acceleration produced on the water nearest to the moon is greater than that on the solid earth, and that on the water farthest from the moon is less. Consequently, the water moves on the surface of the earth, the general character of the motion being the same as if the portion of the ocean on the side toward the moon were attracted, and that on the opposite side repelled. Owing to the rotation of the earth and the moon's motion, the moon returns to nearly the same position with respect to any place on the earth in a period which exceeds a day by, on the average, about 50 minutes, and consequently Newton's argument showed that low tides or high tides due to the moon would follow one another at any given place at intervals equal to about half this period, or in other words, that two tides would in general occur daily, but that on each day any particular phase of the tides would occur, on the average, about 50 minutes later than on the preceding day, a result agreeing with the observation. Similar but smaller tides were shown by the same argument to arise from the action of the sun, and the actual tide to be due to the combination of the two. It was shown that at new and full moon the lunar and solar tides would be added together, whereas at the half moon they would tend to counteract one another, so that the observed fact of greater tides every fortnight received an explanation. A number of other peculiarities of the tides were also shown to result from the same principles. End quote. From Newton's time to the present, the tides have supplied material for astronomical and mathematical research, so that through the efforts of many astronomers and other scientists, their theory and occurrence are now well understood, and the various governments make ample provision through hydrographic offices and otherwise to provide such information for mariners. In the theoretical discussion in modern times, one name stands out prominently, that of Sir George H. Darwin of England, whose researches on the tides of the earth have developed to a point where they have a most important bearing on cosmical theory. It is desirable here to outline the chief features of tides in their everyday occurrence. The term flood tide is applied to the rising water which reaches high water mark at the moment when the tide is highest while in falling the tide is said to ebb until low water or the lowest mark is reached. Near the times of new and full moon occur the spring tides, which are the highest tides of the month, as distinguished from the neap tides, which are the smallest, occurring when the moon is in quadrature. The relative heights of spring and neap tides being about as seven to four. At the time of spring tides, the interval between the corresponding tides of successive days is less than the average value of 24 hours and 51 minutes, and the tides are said to prime, the interval amounting to about 24 hours and 38 minutes, while at neap tides the interval increases to 25 hours and 6 minutes, and then the tides are said to lag. The highest tides of all occur when the new or full moon at the time the moon is in perigree, especially as this takes place about January 1st, when the earth is nearest to the sun. Not only are the tides interesting for their relation to navigation, but on account of their intimate connection with the motion of the earth. The daily movement of the tides is a drag on the energy of our planet and is acting to cut down its speed of rotation. If the speed of rotation of the earth diminishes, it is obvious that our day is being lengthened, that today is longer than yesterday, and that tomorrow will be longer than today, even though these increases are all but inappreciable in the time that the human mind can fathom. Sir Robert Ball, in his Story of the Heavens, summarizes the variation wrought by the tides in the following paragraph, quote, let us take a glance back into the profound depths of times past and see what the tides have to tell us. 
If the present order of things has lasted, the day must have been shorter and shorter the farther we look back into the dim past. The day is now twenty-four hours, but it was once twenty hours, once ten hours, and once six hours. How much farther can we go? When the six hours it passed, we begin to approach a limit which must at some point bound our retrospect. The shorter the day, the more is the earth bulged at the equator. The more the earth is bulged at the equator, the greater is the strain put upon the materials of the earth by the centrifugal force of its rotation. If the earth were to go too fast, it would be unable to cohere together. It would separate into pieces, just as a grindstone driven too rapidly is rent asunder with violence. Here, therefore, we discern in the remote past a barrier which stops the present argument. There is a certain critical velocity, which is the greatest that the earth could bear without risk of rupture. But the exact amount of that velocity is a question not very easy to answer. It depends on the nature of the materials of the earth. It depends upon the temperature. It depends upon the effect of pressure and on other details not accurately known to us. An estimate of the critical velocity has, however, been made, and it has been shown mathematically that the shortest period of rotation that the Earth could have without flying into pieces is about three or four hours. The doctrine of tidal evolution has thus conducted us to the conclusion that at some inconceivably remote epoch the earth was spinning around its axis in a period approximating to three or four hours. End quote. The existence of tides in the solid earth as well as in the ocean was first indicated by Lord Kelvin in 1867. The first numerical estimate of the amount of the tidal oscillations of the solid earth was made by Sir George H. Darwin in 1882 and was based on an indirect method and resulted from observation of the tides of the ocean. Further indirect methods were successfully applied later with more complete data. Sir George H. Darwin has expressed the opinion that we may now feel confident that the earth yields to the tidal forces to the same degree as would a steel globe. The amazing accuracy of Dr. Hecker's recent observations, 1908, are marked by certain collateral considerations, among which may be mentioned the flexure of coastlines due to the varying pressure of oceanic tides and the effects of high and low barometric pressure in bending the Earth's surface. It is impossible to give an accurate measurement of the amount of the vertical motion of the Earth's surface, but it is probable that at spring tides in this latitude the surface of the solid earth moves up and down through about six inches. End of section 19. Section 20 of The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fred Abood. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 1. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 14. The Moon. Part 1. That the moon is the nearest the earth of all the heavenly bodies is one of the most obvious facts which confront the stargazer. Its regular motion must have been early appreciated by primitive man, after he had realized that the rising and setting of the sun marks regularly recurrent intervals of time. As he was able to reflect upon his observations, and properly to coordinate them, he doubtless noted the connection between the form of the moon and its position in the sky with respect to the sun. For by keeping count with pebbles, or rude notches cut in a stick, he would learn that the interval of time between recurring full moons was always the same, and that the series of changes he could observe followed in regular order. 
Thus, when the moon appeared after sunset near the place where the sun had disappeared, he saw a thin crescent, the hollow side of which was turned away from the sun. A little later, the moon set. The next night he observed the moon, further from the sun, with a thicker crescent, and noted also that it set later, an effect that gradually increased until the semicircular disk, with the flat side turned away from the sun, was seen in rather less than a week after the first appearance of the crescent. In another week, the semicircle enlarged to a complete disk, and the moon rose about sunset and set about sunrise, being in a direction nearly opposite to that of the sun. From this time on, the size again diminished. The semicircular form was seen once more with the flat side still turned away from the sun, and toward the west instead of the east, as the moon approached the sun on the other side, rising before it and setting in the daytime. Again he saw the crescent, and marked that the time of rising approached that of sunrise, until the moon became altogether invisible. Two or three nights intervened, and the new moon reappeared, whereupon the whole series of changes was repeated. In other words, this primitive man must have formulated a lunar month. All ancient records recognize this lunar month of twenty-nine and a half days, and that interval must have been adopted long before the year. By the time of Chaldean and Egyptian astronomy, however, the year was known, so that the first conception of the lunar month is lost in the mists of antiquity. The Chaldeans studied the motions of the sun and the moon. Their calendar records, which they seem to have maintained with considerable care, enabled them to discover that eclipses occurred after a period known as the Seraphs, consisting of 6,585 days. The nature of the moon was, of course, to them a mystery. It was known to move around the sky. The Babylonians supposed that, having a bright and a dark side, the different phases were caused by the bright sides coming more and more into view during its movement around the sky. In the 7th century, Pythagoras taught more correctly that the moon, like other heavenly bodies, was spherical, and that it was bright because it received the light of the sun. The phases, he rightly judged, were due to a greater or less amount of the illuminated half turned toward us, and the curve forming the boundary between the bright and dark portions of the moon was to him conclusive evidence of a spherical shape. He was later supported in his theory by Aristotle, who made a similar clear and definite statement of the reason for the phases of the moon. Perhaps the first systematic study of the moon was that of Aristarchus, a famous member of the Alexandrian school, who flourished in the first half of the third century and wrote a treatise on the magnitudes and distances of the sun and moon, which still survives. Taking the moon when it was half full, so that a line drawn to it from the sun made a right angle with a line from the moon to the earth, by measuring the angle between the moon and the sun, he was able to determine the ratio of the sides of this triangle and the relative distance of the moon and the sun from the earth. While the method of Aristarchus was ingenious, yet the result he obtained, that the sun was 18 to 20 times as far distant as the moon, was sadly in error for the actual distance is nearly 400 times. Still, the difficulties in the way of accurate observation were enormous for lack of proper instruments. Aristarchus also took advantage of the solar eclipse to ascertain the distances of these two bodies, and reasoned correctly that when the moon sometimes rather more than hides the surface of the sun, and sometimes does not quite cover it, 
their diameters must vary as their real distances. He even obtained by eclipse observations a value for the diameter of the moon in terms of that of the earth. What would have been an excellent approximation was marred, however, by an incorrect estimate of the apparent size of the moon, which he took as two degrees instead of one half a degree. Nevertheless, this work was an important advance in practical astronomy. It paved the way for Hipparchus, who discussed the motions of the moon, motions which, long before his time, were known to be irregular and much more complicated than those of the sun. The path of the moon is always changing, and its motions are subject to variation. Hipparchus notes that the part of the moon's path in which the motion is most rapid is not always in the same position on the celestial sphere, but moves continuously. He was able to realize the different motions of the moon, to distinguish the various months based upon them, and to employ the Chaldean and other early eclipse observations for determining the position of the moon at various earlier epochs. Hipparchus really evolved a most complicated set of motions. He was aware of the shortcomings of his theory, but was unable to reconstruct it in a satisfactory manner. Following out the eclipse method of Aristarchus, Hipparchus made a determination of the relation between the distances of the sun and moon, measuring their angular diameters, and found that the distance of the moon is nearly 59 times the radius of the earth. Combining this figure for the distance of the sun with that of Aristarchus, a value of 1200 times the radius of the earth was obtained, which value was employed for many centuries. Ptolemy, in the fourth book of the Almagest, discusses the length of the month with the theory of the moon and makes the important announcement of a further inequality in the moon's motion, which Hipparchus had only suspected and which was due in large part to its position with respect to the sun. This was later termed evection and involved a still further complication of the mathematical computations of Hipparchus, because it meant the use of an epicycle and a deferent, which was itself a moving eccentric circle, the center of which revolved around the Earth. Ptolemy's mathematics and ingenuity were able to fit his theory to observations. Although his work showed many inconsistencies which, great as he was, he was unable to control, nevertheless it represented a notable development in astronomy. To Ptolemy is due the parallax method for obtaining the distance of the moon by observing its direction from two points on the Earth's surface, and by finding the distance between these two points in terms of the Earth's radius. This distance of the moon, he estimated, was 59 times the radius of the Earth. With this value, according to the method of Hipparchus just mentioned, he computed the distance from the Earth to the Sun. He found that the distance was 1,210 times the radius of the Earth, which value was equally in error as compared with the modern figure. The actual distance is about 20 times this amount. So readily were the motions of the moon observed, and so carefully were the records maintained, that even at an early date, much was known about its motions. These data enabled much calculation of the moon's motion to be carried on, so that early mathematical astronomy dealt with the moon in no small degree. Various irregularities of its motion and appearance were discussed, and practically all of the notable astronomers made some contributions to our knowledge of the satellite. Even an outline of these discussions would lead the reader far afield into the depths of mathematics, for which reason it is possible to mention only a few of the important 
researches and to indicate merely their general nature. The study of the moon had a practical importance, however, as lunar positions were early used to determine longitude in navigation, and lunar tables were calculated by government and other astronomers. Nowhere was there more interest manifested in the problem of the motion of the moon than at Greenwich Observatory, where the matter had always been a specialty of that institution. It is a curious fact, states the late Professor Newcomb in his Reminiscences of an Astronomer, that while that observatory supplied all the observations of the moon, the investigations based upon these observations were made almost entirely by foreigners, who also constructed the tables by which the moon's motion was mapped out in advance. The most perfect tables made were those of Hansen, the greatest master of mathematical astronomy during the middle of the century, whose tables of the moon were published by the British government in 1857. They were based on a few of the Greenwich observations from 1750 to 1850. The period began with 1750 because that was the earliest at which observations of any exactness were made. Only a few observations were used because Hansen, with the limited computing force at his command, only a single assistant, I believe, was not able to utilize a great number of the observations. The rapid motion of the moon, a circuit being completed in less than a month, made numerous observations necessary, while the very large deviations in the motion produced by the attraction of the sun made the problem of the mathematical theory of that motion the most complicated in astronomy. Thus it happened that, when I commenced work at the Naval Observatory in 1861, the question whether the moon exactly followed the course laid out for her by Hansen's tables was becoming of great importance. For a year or two, our observations showed that the moon seemed to be falling a little behind her predicted motion. But this soon ceased, and she gradually forged ahead in a much more remarkable way. In five or six years, it was evident that this was becoming permanent, she was a little farther ahead every year. What could it mean? To consider this question, I may add a word to what I have already said on the subject. In comparing the observed and predicted motion of the moon, mathematicians and astronomers, beginning with Laplace, have been perplexed by what are called inequalities of long period. For a number of years, perhaps half a century, the moon would seem to be running ahead, and then she would gradually relax her speed and fall behind. Laplace suggested possible causes, but could not prove them. Hansen, it was supposed, had straightened out the tangle by showing that the action of Venus produced a swinging of this sort in the moon. For 130 years, she would be running ahead, and then for 130 years, more falling back again, like a pendulum. Two motions of this sort were combined together. They were claimed to explain the whole difficulty. The moon, having followed Hansen's theory for 100 years, would not be likely to deviate from it. Now it was deviating. What could it mean? Taking it for granted, on Hansen's authority, that his tables represented the motions of the moon perfectly since 1750, there was no possibility of learning anything from observations before that date. As I have already said, the published observations with the usual instruments were not of that refined character which would decide a question like this. But observations of stars, which might be available, and which had been made in many instances, would have an important bearing on this work. For if an oscillation or passage of the moon between a star and the earth occurred, and its time registered, the path of the moon in the heavens and the time at which it arrives at each point of the path would be determined if the time of the oscillation 
was known within one or two seconds. Professor Newcomb continues, It was not until after the middle of the century, 17th, when the telescope had been made part of astronomical instruments for finding the altitude of a heavenly body, and after the pendulum clock had been invented by Huygens, that the time of an oscillation could be fixed with the required exactness. Thus it happens that from 1640 to 1670, somewhat coarse observations of the kind are available, and after the latter epoch, those made by the French astronomers became almost equal to the modern ones in precision. The question that occurred to me was, is it not possible that such observations were made by astronomers long before 1750? Searching the published memoirs of the French Academy of Sciences and the Philosophical Transactions, I found that a few such observations were actually made between 1660 and 1700. I computed and reduced a few of them, finding with surprise that Hansen's tables were evidently much in error at that time. But neither the cause, amount, or nature of the error could be well determined without more observations than these. Was it not possible that these astronomers had made more than they had published? The hope that material of this sort existed was encouraged by the discovery at the Polkawa Observatory of an old manuscript by the French astronomer Delisse, containing some observations of this kind. I therefore planned a thorough search of the old records in Europe to see what could be learned. By good fortune, suitable observations were found at the Paris Observatory, and their relations and the method of making were studied and everything necessary was copied. This work took some six weeks, but Professor Newcomb says, The material I carried away proved the greatest find I ever made. Three or four years were spent in making all the calculations I have described. Then it was found that 75 years were added, at a single step, to the period during which the history of the moon's motion could be written. Previously, this history was supposed to commence with the observations of Bradley at Greenwich, about 1750. Now it was extended back to 1675, and with a less degree of accuracy, 30 years farther still. Hansen's tables were found to deviate from the truth in 1675, and subsequent years to a surprising extent, but the cause of the deviation is not entirely unfolded, even now. One curious result of this work is that the longitude of the moon may now be said to be known with greater accuracy through the last quarter of the 17th century than during the 90 years from 1750 to 1840. The reason is that, for this more modern period, no effective comparison has been made between observations and Hansen's tables. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fred Abood. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 1. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 14. The Moon. Part 2. As the moon rotates around the earth, while the earth is passing in its orbit about the sun, it will be obvious that twice in its journey the sun must come into a line of intersection of the moon's orbit with that of the earth. When this happens at the time of full moon, the earth will lie directly between the moon and the sun, so that the light from the sun is intercepted and a shadow is formed on the moon's surface. 
Sometimes the moon only partially enters the Earth's shadow, and then the eclipse, as this phenomenon is termed, is partial. If, however, the Sun is situated on the line of intersection at the time of new moon, then the Sun will be eclipsed, and a solar eclipse so rich in astronomical significance occurs. Solar eclipses have been discussed elsewhere and their importance explained. Lunar eclipses, besides enabling us to check the motions of the moon and furnishing an interesting spectacle, afford little scientific information. When the black shadow on the moon is first detected in the case of a total lunar eclipse, it is interesting to watch its encroachment until the entire surface of the satellite is covered. Even the moon, on which no direct sunlight can fall, is often visible, glowing with a copper-colored hue, sufficiently bright to enable several of the markings on the surface to be seen. This is due to refraction of the atmosphere, which bends the sunbeams that have just grazed the Earth and permits them to fall within the shadow. In their journey through the denser atmosphere, they have become rich in red rays, which gives to the disk a ruddy or copper-like hue, analogous to that of the sun at sunrise or sunset. Whether the eclipse of the moon is total or partial depends on the extent to which it passes into the shadow of the earth, as the accompanying diagram will indicate clearly. Lunar eclipses are useful to the astronomer for determining the length of the synodic month, and also for determining the temperature to which the moon has been raised, for when it enters the shadow, all direct light from the sun is cut off and the moon becomes cold very rapidly. Furthermore, the position of the moon with respect to the stars can be determined on such occasions with great accuracy. Like solar eclipses, eclipses of the moon can be predicted with high precision, and they are regularly announced in almanacs and ephemerides. The moon always presents the same face to the earth, a phenomenon discovered by Galileo. It must follow that the moon rotates on its axis once in the same number of seconds that it requires for a revolution around our planet. This is explained by the fact that tides on the moon, as in the case of the earth, have lengthened the period of rotation by their braking action. At a time when the moon was still a hot, semi-molten mass, the attraction of the earth produced great tides, not tides of water, but tides of molten rock. These tides on the moon checked its rotational velocity and eventually constrained the moon to rotate on its axis in precisely the same period as that which it requires to revolve around the Earth. All this happened eons ago. There is no longer evidence of any tidal action because the moon is frozen. Although there can hardly be tides on the moon, yet there may be tides in the moon. It may be that the interior of the moon is still hot enough to retain an appreciable degree of fluidity, writes Sir Robert Ball. And if so, the tidal control would still retain the moon in its grip. But the time will probably come, if it have not come already, when the moon will be cold to the center, cold as the temperature of space. If the materials of the moon were what a mathematician would call absolutely rigid, there can be no doubt that the tides could no longer exist, and the moon would be emancipated from tidal control. It seems impossible to predict how far the moon can ever conform to the circumstances of a rigid body. But it may be conceivable that at some future time, the tidal control shall have practically ceased. There would then be no longer any necessary identity between the period of rotation and that of revolution. A gleam of hope is thus projected over the astronomy of the distant future. We know that the time of revolution of the moon is increasing, and so long as the tidal governor could act, 
the time of rotation must increase sympathetically. There will then be nothing to prevent the rotation remaining as at present, while the period of revolution is increasing. The privilege of seeing the other side of the moon, which has been withheld from all previous astronomers, may, thus in the distant future, be granted to their successors. While study of the moon and its motions continued, a beginning was made in the Renaissance to examine the surface of this satellite. Leonardo da Vinci, 1452 to 1519, was the first to explain correctly the dim illumination seen over the rest of the surface of the moon when the bright part was only a thin crescent. This he maintained is due to the earth shine or slight illumination of the moon by light reflected from the earth, just as moonshine is able to illuminate the earth. Galileo's lunar observations through his telescope were epoch-making. Not only was he able to disprove many common conceptions of the nature of the satellite and its surface, but also to present a mass of evidence of a positive character. In spite of the familiar dark markings, the moon was really supposed to be a smooth sphere. After the introduction of the telescope, however, it was recognized by Galileo that the surface of the Earth's satellite was dotted with various inequalities, which he assumed to be mountains, valleys, and seas. Thus he correctly accounted, in part at least, for the unevenness of the surface. He was not content with mere observation of the features of the moon's surface, but measured the height of some of the more conspicuous lunar mountains, and obtained for them an estimated elevation of four miles, a figure which agrees fairly well with modern estimates. Having seen and measured mountains on the moon's surface, it seemed natural that there should be water. The large dark spots he erroneously regarded as seas, although he was not responsible for the corresponding names applied to these supposed expanses of water by some of his successors, and still preserved in lunar maps. The chief marks of astronomical progress, as revealed by Galileo's observation of the moon, were that it was a body in many respects similar to the Earth, that it was not a perfect sphere, and that there is no fundamental difference between celestial bodies and our own Earth, either in their motions or in their general nature, which was important in the final establishment of the Copernican theory. One other discovery of Galileo's in connection with the Moon is of great importance. It had been known for many years that as the Moon revolved around the Earth, the same markings were constantly seen. With the telescope, these markings could be studied so much more distinctly that it occurred to Galileo to ascertain whether there was any change in the moon's disk, or whether its appearance was always exactly the same. He found that as the moon moves in its orbit around the earth, that slight changes are seen in its appearance. In other words, small portions of the hemisphere alternately on its northern and southern half are exposed. The simplest of the motions of the moon in this way subsequently came to be known as liberations. Kepler, in his Epitome of the Copernican Astronomy, demonstrated that as planetary laws applied to the motion of the moon around the Earth, despite irregularities which introduced enormous complications. In this work, however, he devotes much attention to the theory of the moon, explaining in considerable detail both evection and variation. Galileo established the fact that the moon was similar to the earth in many respects. The analogy was carried somewhat further by certain of the pioneer workers with large telescopes. Even Herschel held that because the moon closely resembled the earth, it might be a suitable habitat for human beings. The dark spots once taken for seas and bearing that name on lunar maps are, in reality, lava, while the craters which dot the surface of the satellite, with one or two possible exceptions, 
belong to volcanoes long since extinct. The dark lines once known as rills, which it was assumed were rivers, are plainly without water. If there is a lunar atmosphere, its density must be very small, in fact less than that of the atmosphere far above the Earth. That there is a very rare lunar atmosphere seems to be probable. In fact, the assumption of an atmosphere is necessary for the explanation of certain phenomena. After Galileo's lunar studies, the next important work was that of John Hevel of Danzig, 1611 to 1687, who published in 1647 his Selenographia, in which not only the text, but the plates were prepared by him. Here he systematically describes the names and chief features of the moon, the immense craters and seas, employing many names taken from the earth, such as Apennines, Alps, and Mare Serenitatis for the Pacific Ocean, all designations still found on modern lunar maps. Not all of his names have survived. John Baptiste Riccoli, 1598 to 1671, in a treatise on astronomy called The New Almagest, 1651, gave to various mountains and craters the names of distinguished men of science and philosophers, hence the names of Plato, Archimedes, Tycho, and Copernicus are found on lunar maps. These names have survived in considerable number. More modern map makers, such as Beer and Maedler, whose map was published in 1837, and Schmidt of Athens, who published a map of the moon seven feet in diameter in 1878, have carried out this idea. Modern astronomers are likewise honored with the names of various points represented on the maps. For the origin of the moon, the mind must be forced to look back millions and millions of years to a time when our Earth existed in a very different form. Then it was not a solid mass, but a globe of molten material on which floated a crust, perhaps some 35 miles thick. It rotated not in a period of 24 hours, the present day's length, but at a terrific velocity which may have made the day some three hours in length. Such a speed of revolution naturally produced a most powerful centrifugal force. One day, a cataclysm occurred. 5,000 cubic millions of miles of matter were thrown off into space. Thus, the moon was born. A great scar was left on the surface of the Earth, a scar which, in the opinion of Professor William H. Pickering, is the basin of the Pacific Ocean. After this rending of the earth, the remaining parts of the crust, afloat on the liquid interior, were split along irregular lines into two pieces, which drifted apart and were filled by the waters of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. This theory of Pickering's is diametrically opposed to that of Professor T. J. J. C., who claims that the moon is in reality a planet captured by the Earth in its wanderings through space, and that all satellites have been thus captured. Whatever the origin of the moon, it is the largest of all the planetary satellites, yet smaller in mass than the Earth, from which it is separated by a distance that varies between 222,000 and 253,000 miles. Its gravity is equal to about one-sixth that of the Earth, for which reason the same amount of energy acting, for example, in a volcanic upheaval, produced mountains higher than those on the Earth. This mass of the Moon is about one-eightieth that of the Earth, or 73 trillion tons. The accompanying diagram shows the comparative size of the Earth and the Moon. The diameter of our planet is 7,914 miles, while that of the Moon is 2,160 miles, so that the diameters stand very nearly in the relation 
of 4 to 1, while the superficial area of the moon is equal to about one thirteenth part of the surface of the earth. The average distance of the moon from the earth is also fairly constant, and the average fluctuations do not exceed more than about 13,000 miles on either side of its mean value of 239,000 miles. The moon is essentially a dead planet in the eyes of most astronomers. Its fires long since have been extinguished. It is a great globe of chilled slog. Its craters have no counterpart on the Earth. The lunar crater is a great circular plain, 50 or even 100 miles in diameter, around which rises a precipice perhaps 5 or 10,000 feet, while in the center there may be a hill or two about half as high. Thousands of these volcanoes are visible in the telescope. How these craters were formed is a puzzle. Some astronomers hold that they mark the impact of countless meteorites. Others assume them to be the product of gigantic bubbles in a once molten mass that burst. Again, it is claimed that they are volcanoes resembling those of the Earth. Most astronomers tell us that the craters have long been dead, that the moon has had for centuries no atmosphere, and therefore cannot have water or support plant or animal life. Professor William H. Pickering, however, tells us of an exceedingly rare lunar atmosphere and maintains that the moon's craters are not all extinct. He even claims that certain great white expanses are snow and ice, and furthermore, that there is evidence of the growth and decay of vegetation. To support his views of vanishingly feeble volcanic activity, he calls attention to the little crater named Linny, after the famous naturalist Linnaeus. In modern times, this crater has unquestionably undergone changes. Only a few centuries ago, it was described on the old maps as a crater of moderate size, and later as a very small, round, brilliant spot. A dead volcano cannot alter its shape. If there are still a few intermittently active volcanoes, they must expel water and carbonic acid gas, judging by earthly volcanoes. But water cannot be found on the moon as a liquid, for the temperature of its surface is probably not far from 460 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. Many of the elevated peaks are capped with a silver glow, which also characterizes the lining of the craterlets. In Pickering's eyes, that white sheen is snow. He believes also in accumulations of snow and ice at the poles. If carbonic acid is expelled by lunar volcanoes, it must cling to the moon with great tenacity because of its weight. Since it is the food of plant life, it may possibly support vegetation on the moon. Professor Pickering sees invariable dark spots on the planet organic life resembling vegetation. He figures that since certain lichens grow in certain regions of the earth where the temperature never rises above the freezing point, there is no reason why that vegetation may not flourish on the moon's surface. End of section 21. Section 22 of The Science History of the Universe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 1. Edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Astronomy. Chapter 15. Mars, Part 1. Mars is another instance of a celestial body whose discovery long antedates written history, for which reason it is natural to assume that its appearance in the heavens and its motions have always been known to mankind. Its ruddy light naturally associated it in the Greek mind with the god of war, just as the soft, warm glow of Venus was considered appropriate to the goddess of love. 
To the Chaldean and other ancient stargazers, the motions of the planet were indeed of interest. No planet has received greater attention from astronomers or has been used more for the solution of important astronomical and cosmical problems. Thus, it was from the observation of the passage of the moon in front of Mars, or what is termed by astronomers an occultation of the planet, that Aristotle concluded that the planets were more distant than the sun and moon. What reason he had for including the sun is difficult to conceive, as an occultation of that body would be quite impossible. Later, it was from the study of the motions of the planet made for Tycho Brahe that Kepler was able to derive his great laws of planetary motion. By observing the great hourglass sea, or Sirtis Major, on Mars, Huygens, in 1659, noted the rotation of the planet on its axes, and from a measurement of the planet made its opposition Riker, was able to obtain a reasonably accurate estimate of the distance of the sun in 1673. 1783, Herschel had written, The analogy between Mars and the Earth is perhaps by far the greatest in the whole solar system. For over a century, the development of this analogy has been one of the most important features of astronomy, especially in popular estimation. Today, with a wealth of scientific and observational data acquired during the last score of years, the question, although more fully and intelligently discussed, is as far from solution as ever. Mars revolves around the Sun in an orbit whose mean distance is 141,500,000 miles. But this orbit is so eccentric, amounting to 0 0.093, that the distance varies about 13 million miles. As this distance from the Sun is about one half as far again as that of the Earth, the light and heat that Mars receives are only about four-ninths of the light and heat received by the Earth, an important consideration in discussing the possibility of life on its surface. The real diameter of Mars is about 4,200 miles, a figure correct within 20 miles, so that its surface is 23 one-hundredths and its volume is 0.147 or one-seventh that of Earth. The mass of the planet, derived from observation of its satellites, is about 1 over 9.4 that of the Earth, so that its density is 0 0.73 and the attraction of gravity on its surface is 0 0.38 that of Earth. Mars reflects 0 0.26 of the light that it receives, which is just double that of Mercury. In Mars may be seen a striking difference between the superior and inferior planets, for the crescent phases of the latter are conspicuously absent. This is because the orbits of Mars and the other superior planets lie outside that of Earth. Consequently, such a planet never comes between the Earth and the Sun. At quadrature, a certain amount of the unilluminated portion of, is turned towards the Earth, so that the planet appears like a moon, three or four days from full, with a distinctly gibbous appearance. Kepler suspected the existence of satellites from a somewhat cryptic utterance of Galileo's in regard to the triple Saturn. No particularly sound reasons were advanced for the existence of such satellites. Still that they might be found is forcibly reflected in 18th century literature. In Gulliver's Travels, 1726, is the striking statement that an astronomer on the floating island of Laputa had discovered two tiny satellites of Mars. Dean Swift even advanced the extraordinary statement that one of these moons revolved around the planet in ten hours the approximate correctness of which will presently be apparent. Furthermore, Voltaire, in his Micromegas, published in 1752, and obviously modeled on Gulliver's Travels, also speaks to these small bodies. Although literature and imagination had preceded observation, astronomers could not detect any companions to the ready planet until August 11, 1877, when Professor Hasaf Hall, using the 26-inch refractor of the U.S. Naval Observatory at Washington, which at the time of its construction in 1873 was the largest telescope in the world, studied the vicinity of Mars with unusual care. In 1877, it was at conjunction, so that conditions were favorable for an exhaustive inquiry. On August the 11th, Professor Hall detected a minute speck of light near the planet, and a few days later, August 16th, he ascertained positively that it was a satellite. On the following evening, a second body was discovered, bewilderingly rapid in its motion, 
since that time the two satellites have frequently observed at opposition even with much smaller instruments on july eighteenth eighteen eighty eight the large lick telescope was able to reveal them with their brightness was about one eighth that the time of their discovery the names appropriately designated to the new satellites Deimos and phobos fear and panic were taken from the iliad and represent the companions in the battle of the god of war the satellites are very small having diameters respectively of six and seven miles as photometrically measured at harvard university soon after their discovery by professor pickering phobos the inner is larger and travels an elliptical orbit in seven hours thirty nine minutes and twenty two seconds at a distance of only three thousand seven hundred and sixty miles deimos its companion moves in a nearly circular orbit in thirty hours eighteen minutes at a distance from the planet of twelve thousand five hundred miles it should be remembered in all discussions of the nature of the surface of the planet mars and in developing theories based therein that astronomers must deal with the little disk which one every fifteen years has a maximum of about one five thousandth the area of the full moon when the nearest earth mars is at a distance of thirty five million five hundred thousand miles and would observed by a telescope magnifying one thousand times it appears as only a large as the moon with an ordinary field glass enlarging six or seven times in other words mars is brought to its distance of thirty five thousand five hundred miles hence it is difficult to distinguish minute details consequently visual and photographic observation of mars must be of the most refined character for especially in the former there is opportunity for psychological or subjective phenomena to occur in connection with the observation while it is neither rational nor scientific to deny what credible observers claim they have seen through the telescope in examining the planet yet it must be recognized that visual observations are attended by necessary limitations and should be received in a spirit of caution rather than of enthusiasm the mapping of mars is no recent matter for even in sixteen fifty nine a rough sketch of the surface of the planet was made by huygens in which the v-shaped marking at the equator pointing to the north can be identified as the Certus major this was followed by rough sketches from time to time down to eighteen forty when madler first began a systematic charting of the planet his map was followed in eighteen sixty four by kaiser's by flammarion's in 1876 and green's in 1877 drawings of various parts of the planet were made during these intervals but were not combined into good charts observations made by professor lowell and his staff at the observatory in flagstaff arizona have had the study of this planet especially in view the lowell observatory itself is situated seven thousand three hundred feet above the sea and contains an excellent twenty four inch telescope with which it is claimed that the faintest stars shown on the chart made at the lick observatory with its thirty six instrument are perfectly visible the atmosphere is well adapted for telescopic work so that professor lowell and his colleagues possess singular advantages over other observers on the other hand in many important respects there has been a lack of corroboration of their observations the surface of mars as seen in the telescope is composed of two white polar caps which wane with the approach of summer orange areas which are supposed by lowell and his followers to be deserts and blue-green areas which change their hue to orange during the martian autumn and winter and reassume their verdant tint in the spring the planet is covered with a network of fine lines first discovered by shia pirelli in eighteen seventy seven and called by him canals a designation by which they are still known these canals connect the polar ice caps with the temperate and equatorial zones according to professor lowell they may be regarded as planetary irrigation ditches which serve the purpose of leading the melting water of the poles to those desert regions which would still blossom if properly watered the canals disappear with the approach of winter and creep down with, from the poles towards the equator in the summer a phenomenon which long puzzled astronomers until pickering ingeniously suggested that we see not the canals themselves for they are much too narrow but the vegetation which fringes their banks which withers as the cold of winter descends and which flourishes with the melting of the snows it was shia pirelli who also first announced the curious doubling of the canals in certain instances an announcement which was at first received with derision but which has since been confirmed by his disciple lowell and the astronomers of the great observatories 
this curious gemination has not been satisfactorily explained although professor lowell attributes it part to vegetal causes by opponents of his theory the doubling is regarded as an optical illusion which can hardly be the case because all and not certain of the canals would exhibit the phenomenon furthermore there is some photographic evidence offered by M mr lampland of professor lowell's staff that both the canals and their doubling are real End of section 22section 23 of the science history of the universe volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by pamela nagami the science history of the universe volume 1 edited by francis rolt wheeler astronomy chapter 15 part 2 mars the visual observations of professor lowell have been undertaken with great thoroughness and have brought to light such material which he has employed in the development of his theories to do justice to his work in a single chapter is manifestly impossible it will be most satisfactory to the reader to recapitulate in professor lowell's own words derived from his work on mars and its canals the fundamental facts which he has recorded and on which he bases his conclusions they are as follows quote, number one mars turns on its axis in twenty four hours thirty seven minutes twenty two point six five seconds with reference to the stars and in twenty four hours thirty nine minutes thirty five seconds as a mean with regard to the sun its day therefore is only about forty minutes longer than ours number two its axis is tilted to the plane of its orbit by about 23 degrees 59 minutes, most recent determinations of 1905. This gives the planet seasons almost the counterpart of our own in character, but in length nearly double ours for number three. Its year consists of 687 of our days, 669 of its own. Number four. Polar caps are plainly visible, which melt in the Martian summer to form again in the Martian winter, thus implying the presence of a substance deposited by cold. Number five. As the polar caps melt, they are bordered by a blue belt, which retreats with them. This excludes the possibility of their being formed of carbon dioxide, and shows that of all the substances we know, the material composing them must be water. Number six. In the case of the southern cap, the blue belt has widenings in it in places. These occur where the blue-green areas bordering upon the polar cap are largest. Number seven. The extensive shrinkage of the polar snows shows their quality to be inconsiderable and points to scanty deposition due to dearth of water. Number eight. The melting takes place locally after the same general order and method, Martian year after year, both in the south cap. Number nine, and in the north one. This is evidenced by the recurrence of rifts in the same places annually in each. The water thus let loose can therefore be locally counted on. Number ten, that the south polar cap is given to greater extremes than the north one implies again in view of the eccentricity of the orbit and the tilt of the axis that deposition in both caps is light number eleven the polar seas at the edges of the caps being temporary affairs the water from them must be fresh number twelve the melting of the caps on the one hand and their reforming on the other affirm the presence of water vapor in the Martian atmosphere of whatever else that air consist. Number 13. Since water vapor is present, of which the molecular weight is 18, it follows from the kinetic theory of gases that nitrogen, oxygen, and carbonic acid of molecular weights 28, 32, and 38 respectively are probably there too, owing to being heavier. Number 14. The limb light bears testimony to this atmosphere. 15. 
the planet's low albedo points to a density for the atmosphere very much less than our own. Number 16. The apparent evidence of a twilight goes to affirm this. Number 17. Permanent markings show upon the disk, proving that the surface itself is visible. Number 18. Outside of the polar cap, the surface is divided into red ochre and blue-green regions. The red ochre stretches have the same appearance as our deserts seen from afar. Number 19. And behave as such, being but little affected by change. Number 20. The blue-green areas were once thought to be seas, but they cannot be such because they change in tint according to the Martian season, and the area and the amount of the lightning is not offset at the time by corresponding darkening elsewhere. Number 21. Nor by any augmentation of the other polar cap or precipitation into cloud. It cannot, therefore, be due to shifts of substance. Number 22. Furthermore, they are all seamed by lines and spots darker than themselves, which are permanent in place, so that there can be no bodies of water on the planet. Number 23. On the other hand, their color, blue-green, is that of vegetation. This regularly fades out, as vegetation would, to ochre, for the most part, but in places changes to a chocolate brown. Number 24. The change that comes over them is seasonal in period, as that of vegetation would be. Number 25. Each hemisphere undergoes this metamorphosis in turn. Number 26. That it is recurrent is again proof positive of an atmosphere. Number 27. The changes are metabolic, since those in one direction are later reversed to a restoration of the original status. Anabolic as well as catabolic processes thus go on there. That is, growth as well as decay takes place. This proves them of vegetal origin. Number 28. The existence of vegetation shows that carbonic acid, oxygen, and undoubtedly nitrogen are present in the Martian atmosphere, since plants give out oxygen and take in carbonic acid. Number 29. The changes in the dark areas follow upon the melting of the polar caps, not occurring until after that melting is underway. Number 30. And not immediately then, but only after the lapse of a certain time. Number 31. Though not seas now, from their look, the dark areas suggest old sea bottoms, and when on the terminator appear as depressions, whether because really at a lower level or because of less illumination is not certain. Number 32. That they are now the parts of the planet to support vegetation hints the same past office, as water would naturally drain into them. That such a metamorphosis should occur with planetary aging is in keeping with the kinetic theory of gases. Number 33. Terminator observations prove conclusively that there are no mountains on Mars, but that the surface is surprisingly flat. Number 34. But they do reveal clouds, which are usually rare and are often, if not always, dust storms. Number 35. White spots are occasionally visible, lasting unchanged for weeks in the tropic and temperate regions, showing that the climate is apparently cold. Number 36 but at the same time proving that most of the surface has a temperature above the freezing point. Number 37. In winter, the temperate zones are more or less covered by a whitish veil, which may be hoarfrost or may be cloud. Number 38. A spring haze surrounds the north polar cap during the weeks that follow its most extensive melting. Number 39. Otherwise, the Martian sky is perfectly clear, like that of a dry desert land. End quote. These facts, according to Professor Lowell, make reasonably evident on Mars the presence of quote, number one, days and seasons substantially like our own, number two, an atmosphere containing water vapor, carbonic acid, and oxygen, number three, water in great scarcity, number four, a temperature colder than ours but above the Fahrenheit freezing point except in winter and in the extreme polar regions. Number five, vegetation. End quote. 
While all of Professor Lowell's observations and results are not accepted by all astronomers, and there is considerable opposition to his conclusions, nevertheless they are of interest and worth stating as representing this aspect of the matter in his own words. Comparative studies of lunar and Martian spectra made on the summit of Mount Whitney in September 1909 by Campbell of the Lick Observatory seem to preclude the possibility of much water on Mars. Campbell's photographs show that the Martian atmosphere is no richer in water than the moon's, which, if true, summarily disposes of Martian life. Slipher of Lowell's staff claims to have obtained ample spectroscopic evidence of water. The following paragraphs, taken from the concluding chapter of Lowell's book on Mars and its canals, may be said fairly to sum up his views on Martian life. Quote, that Mars is inhabited by beings of some sort or other, we may consider as certain as it is uncertain what these beings may be. The theory of the existence of intelligent life on Mars may be likened to the atomic theory in chemistry, in that in both we are led to the belief in units which we are alike unable to define. Both theories explain the facts in their respective fields, and are the only theories that do, while as to what an atom may resemble we know as little as what a Martian may be like. But the behavior of chemic compounds points to the existence of atoms too small for us to see, and in the same way the aspect and behavior of the Martian markings implies the action of agents too far away to be made out. One of the things that makes Mars of such transcendent interest to man is the foresight it affords of the course earthly revolution is to pursue. On our own world, we are able to study only our present and our past. In Mars, we are able to glimpse in some sort our future. Different as the course of life on the two planets undoubtedly has been, the one helps, however imperfectly, to better understanding of the other." End quote. The views expressed by Professor Lowell in the work just quoted were further developed by him in the course of a few years succeeding its publication and in Mars as the Abode of Life, published in 1908, he expresses himself even more firmly convinced that Mars is inhabited by a race of intelligent beings. Additional study of Martian phenomena, according to Professor Lowell, indicates that the canals and oases, as he sees them, are proof that life of no mean order of intelligence prevails on the planet. He suggests, quote, part and parcel of this information is the order of intelligence involved in the beings thus disclosed. Peculiarly impressive is the thought that life on another world should thus have made its presence known by its exercise of mind, that intelligence should thus mutely communicate its existence to us across the far stretches of space, itself remaining hid, appeals to all that is highest and most far-reaching in man himself. More satisfactory than strange this, for in no other way could the habitation of the planet have been revealed. It simply shows again the supremacy of mind. Men live after they are dead by what they have written while they are alive, and the inhabitants of a planet tell of themselves across space, as do individuals athwart time, by the same imprinting of their mind. End quote. To this he adds the statement that conditions for life on the planet are approaching an end, as it is rapidly drying up and that the energies of the inhabitants are being the slowly diminishing supply of water. Quote, the drying up of the planet is certain to proceed until its surface can support no life at all. End quote. So that as compared with the Earth, Mars presents a distinctly later period of evolution. No such danger at present confronts our own planet, but assuming that these explanations are correct, it is not improbable that the cooperative action of all the nations of the world may be required at some future date to deal with a similar problem. In opposing the idea of canals on the surface of Mars, much stress has been laid on the alleged fact 
that the finer markings and some of the apparent doublings are based upon optical illusions or psychological phenomena. Thus to prove that instinctively the eye would arrange in the form of straight lines vague suggestions of markings, E. W. Maunder of the Greenwich Observatory, England, and J. E. Evans of the Royal Hospital School at Greenwich in 1902 performed an experiment with a number of schoolboys. A circular disc was exhibited five or six inches in diameter on which were represented with some accuracy the shaded area of the planet as it might appear in the telescope. Instead of canals, a few faint wavy lines and a larger number of faint dots were inserted promiscuously. The boys were told to fill in with pencil on small circles on sheets of paper the details of the object exhibited to them, exercising as much care as possible. The object of the experiment was not communicated to the boys. None of them had any idea of the nature of the planet's surface. The result was that boys at the greatest distance from the object, where the faint lines and dots were just beyond the limits of separate visibility, drew canals remarkably like those noted by the telescopic observers of the planet. Hence, it was supposed that the eye in some way integrated such faint stimuli as irregular scattered dots and faint wavy lines into straight lines which have no objective existence. Much has been made of this test, but it may hardly be called conclusive, for Flammarion, when repeating the experiment with French boys, was unable to secure in their sketches lines resembling canals. Moreover, photographs taken during the opposition of 1905 at Flagstaff bring out a large number of the more prominent canals as straight lines. It is possible that psychology plays an important part, and Professor Andrew Ellicott Douglas of the University of Arizona, who has had opportunities to observe the planet at several favorable oppositions, believes the subjective phenomena have much to do with Martian observations. He says, quote, One may confidently say that such realities do exist, but with the very faint canals, whose numbers reach occasionally well into the hundreds, discordance reigns supreme, and it is frequently found that different drawings by the same artist antagonize each other across the page. Considerations along these lines led me to study seriously the origin of these inconsistent faint canals by the methods of experimental psychology, and the application of these methods has resulted in a new optical illusion and new adaptations of old and well-known phenomena." End quote. The most important of these phenomena was the halo effect where secondary images are produced under unusual conditions, which images affect the minute details of the surface. Professor Douglas also found that the irregular refraction of the eye produced apparent rays as from a small spot which could be obviated in part by changing the position of the observer's head. Quote, the ray illusion, he says, is to me a very satisfactory explanation of many faint canals radiating from those small spots on Mars called lakes or oases. The only objective reality in such cases is the spot from which they start, end quote. Referring again to the halo, he reaches the conclusion that, quote, the halo with its light area and secondary images accounts for details which have no objective reality, such as bright limbs of definite width, canals paralleling the limb or dark areas, numerous light margins along dark areas and light areas in the midst of dark, abundantly exemplified in Schiaparelli's map of 1881 and 1882. Professor Lowell, it must be said, has the unique advantage, or misfortune it may be, to see canal-like markings that are not visible to other astronomers. Thus on Venus he saw bands or lines which he considered bore a superficial resemblance to the canals of Mars and were apparently permanent and not due to clouds. Again he claims to have seen lines resembling canals on the third satellite of Jupiter, which others have failed to recognize. Hence, Many astronomers believe that he is predisposed to see such phenomena. Furthermore, canal-like appearances have been noted on the surface of the moon by Professor W. H. Pickering as radiating from the central peaks of the northwestern slopes of the central mountain range of the crater of Eratosthenes. 
he observed two canals which in a small telescope appear straight, yet when seen with a large glass present considerable irregularity of structure. Other and new branches or canals were also seen. In various parts of the same crater, but especially in the southeastern and northern portions, numerous small canals and lakes present themselves. These markings are practically identical in appearance with those seen upon the planet Mars. They are too small to be well shown on photographs and seem to be of much more regular structure than the larger markings, which are also called canals. It is possible that this difference is due merely to the fact that the larger markings are better seen. There can be no free water on the moon's surface, hence any canals with flowing water are quite out of the question. Yet the appearance is vouched for as remarkably similar to that on Mars by an observer who knows the surfaces of both bodies. End of section 23